Books on Tape presents The Coldest Winter, America and the Korean War by David Halberstam Read by Scott Brick Introduction On June 25, 1950, nearly seven divisions of elite North Korean troops, many of whom had fought for the communist side in the Chinese Civil War, crossed the border into South Korea, with the intention of conquering the entire South in three weeks. Some six months earlier, Secretary of State Dean Acheson, in a colossal gaffe, had neglected to include South Korea in America's Asian defense perimeter, and the only American forces then in the country, part of a tiny advisory mission, were almost completely unprepared for the attack. In the early weeks of the invasion, the communist offensive was a stunning success. Every bit of news from the battlefield was negative. In Washington, President Harry Truman and his top advisers debated the enemy's intentions. Was this, as they greatly feared, an assault ordered up by the Russians? Were the North Koreans nothing but Moscow's pawns? Or was it a feint, the first in a series of what might be provocative communist moves around the world? They quickly decided to use United States and in time United Nations forces to draw a line against communist aggression in Korea. The Korean War would last three years, not three weeks, and it would be the most bitter kind of war in which relatively small American and United Nations forces worked to neutralize the superior numbers of their adversaries by the use of vastly superior hardware and technology. It was a war fought on strikingly harsh terrain and often in ghastly weather, most particularly a numbing winter cold that often seemed to American troops an even greater enemy than the North Koreans or Chinese. The century's nastiest little war, the military historian S. L. A. Marshall called it. The Americans and their United Nations allies faced terrible mountainous terrain, which worked against their advantage in hardware, most notably their armored vehicles, and offered caves and other forms of shelter to the enemy. If the best minds in the world had set out to find us the worst possible location to fight this damnable war politically and militarily, the unanimous choice would have been Korea. Secretary of State Acheson said years after it was over. A sour war, Acheson's friend Averill Harriman said of it. To call it an unwanted war on the part of the United States would be a vast understatement. Even the president who had ordered American troops into battle had not deigned to call it a war. From the start, Harry Truman had been careful to downplay the nature of the conflict because he was intent on limiting any sense of growing confrontation with the Soviet Union. One of the ways he tried to do that was by playing with the terminology. In the late afternoon of June 29th, four days after the North Koreans had crossed the border, and even as he was sending Americans into battle, Truman met with the White House press corps. One of the reporters asked if America was actually at war. Truman answered that it was not, even though, in fact, it was. Then another reporter asked, Would it be possible to call this a police action under the United Nations? Yes, answered Truman. That is exactly what it amounts to. The implication that U.S. soldiers in Korea were more a police force than an army was a source of considerable bitterness to many of the men who went there. A similar verbal delicacy would be employed four months later by Chinese leader Mao Zedong when he ordered hundreds of thousands of Chinese soldiers into battle, deciding, for reasons somewhat parallel to Truman's, to call them volunteers. So... Out of a question casually asked and rather casually answered, were policies and even wars defined. The terminology Truman offered that day in some ways endured. Korea would not prove a great national war of unifying singular purpose, as World War II had been, nor would it, like Vietnam a generation later, divide and thus haunt the nation. It was simply a puzzling, gray, very distant conflict, 
a war that went on and on and on, seemingly without hope or resolution, about which most Americans, save the men who fought there and their immediate families, preferred to know as little as possible. Nearly thirty years after it was over, John Prine caught this spirit exactly in the song Hello in There, where he sings eloquently of the tragic loss of a young man named Davy and how he sacrificed himself for no good reason. Over half a century later, the war still remained largely outside American political and cultural consciousness. The Forgotten War was the apt title of one of the best books on it. Korea was a war that sometimes seemed to have been orphaned by history. Many of the men who went to Korea harbored their own personal resentments over being sent there. Some had already served once during World War II, had been in the reserves, had been called away from their civilian jobs most reluctantly, and told to serve in a war overseas for the second time within ten years, when all too many of their contemporaries had been called for neither. Others who had served in World War II and had decided to stay in the army were embittered because of the pathetic state of U.S. forces when the North Koreans struck. Undermanned, poorly trained American units with faulty, often outmoded equipment and surprisingly poor high-level command leadership were an embarrassment. The drop-off between the strength of the army they had known at the height of World War II its sheer professionalism and muscularity and the shabbiness of American forces as they existed at the beginning of the Korean War was nothing less than shocking to these men. The more experienced they were, the more disheartened and appalled they also were by the conditions under which they had to fight. The worst aspect of the Korean War, wrote Lieutenant Colonel George Russell, a battalion commander with the 23rd Regiment of the 2nd Infantry Division, was Korea itself. For an army that was so dependent on its industrial production and the resulting military hardware, especially tanks, it was the worst kind of terrain. Countries like Spain and Switzerland had difficult mountain ranges, but these soon opened on to flat areas where industrially powerful nations might send their tanks. To American eyes, however, as Russell put it, in Korea, on the other side of every mountain was another mountain. If there was a color to Korea, Russell claimed, it came in all shades of brown. And if there was a campaign ribbon given out for service there, he added, all the G.I.s who fought there would have bet on the color being brown. Unlike Vietnam, the Korean War took place before television news came into its own and the United States became a communications society. In the days of Korea, television news shows were short, bland, and of marginal influence. Fifteen minutes a night. Given the state of the technology, the footage from Korea, usually making it into the network newsrooms back in New York days late, rarely moved the nation. It was still largely a print war, reported in newspapers in black and white, and it remained black and white in the nation's consciousness. In the year 2004, while working on this book, I chanced into the Key West, Florida library. On its shelves were some 88 books on Vietnam and only four on Korea, which more or less sums up the war's fate in American memory. Arden Rowley, a young engineer with the 2nd Infantry Division who had spent two and a half years as a POW in a Chinese prison camp, noted somewhat bitterly that from 2001 to 2002, each year marking a 50th anniversary of some major Korean battle, there were three major war movies made in America, Pearl Harbor, Wind Talkers, and We Were Soldiers, the first two about World War II, the third about Vietnam. And if you added Saving Private Ryan, produced in 1998, the total was four. No film was made about Korea. The best-known movie linked to Korea was 1962's The Manchurian Candidate, the story of an American POW who had been brainwashed in a Chinese prison camp and turned into a robotic assassin aimed by the communists at an American presidential candidate. To the degree that the Korean War ever had a niche in popular culture, it was through the Robert Altman anti-war movie, 
and then sitcom M.A.S.H., about a mobile surgical hospital operating during that war. Ostensibly about Korea, the film was really about Vietnam, and came out in 1970, at the high watermark of popular protest against that war. It was a time when Hollywood executives were still nervous about making an anti-Vietnam movie. As such, Korea was a cover from the start for a movie about Vietnam. Director Altman and the screenwriter, Ring Lardner Jr., were focused on Vietnam, but thought it was too sensitive a subject to be treated irreverently. Notably, the men and officers in the film wear the shaggy haircuts of the Vietnam years, not the crew cuts of the Korean era. And so the true brutality of the war never really penetrated the American cultural consciousness. An estimated 33,000 Americans died in it. Another 105,000 were wounded. The South Koreans lost 415,000 killed and had 429,000 wounded. Both the Chinese and North Koreans were exceptionally secretive about their casualties, but American officials put their losses at roughly 1.5 million men killed. The Korean War momentarily turned the Cold War hot, heightening the already considerable and mounting tensions between the United States and the Communist world and deepening the chasm between the United States and Communist forces asserting themselves in Asia. Those tensions and divisions between the two sides in the bipolar struggle grew even more serious after American miscalculations brought China into the war. When it was all over and an armed truce ensued, both sides claimed victory, though the final division of the country was no different from the one that had existed when the war began. But the United States was not the same. Its strategic vision of Asia had changed, and its domestic political equation had been greatly altered. The Americans who fought in Korea often felt cut off from their countrymen, their sacrifices unappreciated, their faraway war of little importance in the eyes of contemporaries. It had none of the glory and legitimacy of World War II, so recently concluded, in which the entire country had seemed to share in one great purpose, and every serviceman was seen to be an extension of the country's democratic spirit and the best of its values, and was so honored. Korea was a grinding, limited war. Nothing very good, the nation quickly decided, was going to come out of it. When servicemen returned from their tours, they found their neighbors generally not very interested in what they had seen and done. The subject of the war was quickly dispensed with in conversation. Events on the home front, promotions at the office, the purchase of a new house or a new car were more compelling subjects. In part, this was because the news from Korea was almost always so grim. Even when the war went well, it did not really go very well. The possibility of a larger breakthrough seldom seemed near, much less anything approaching victory, especially once the Chinese entered the war in force in late November 1950. Soon after, the sardonic phrase for a stalemate, die for a tie, became a favorite among the troops. This vast disconnect between those who fought and the people at home the sense that no matter the bravery they showed or the validity of their cause, the soldiers of Korea had been granted a kind of second-class status compared to that of the men who had fought in previous wars, led to a great deal of quiet and enduring bitterness. Part 1. A Warning at Unsan Chapter 1. It was the warning shot the American commander in the Far East, Douglas MacArthur, did not heed, the one that allowed a smaller war to become a larger war. On October 20, 1950, the men of the U.S. 1st Cavalry Division entered Pyongyang, the North Korean capital. Later, there was some controversy over who got there first, elements of the 5th Regiment of the Cav or men from the South Korean 1st Division. The truth was the men of the cab had been slowed because all the bridges in their sector going over the Taedong River had been blown, 
And so the South Korean troops, or ROCs, for Republic of Korea, beat them into the ruined city. That did not diminish their pleasure. To them, the capture of the city meant the war was almost over. Just to make sure everyone knew that of all American units in country the CAV got there first, some troopers, armed with paint and brushes, painted the CAV logo all over town. Small private celebrations were taking place throughout Pyongyang. Lieutenant Phil Peterson, forward observer with the 99th Field Artillery Battalion, and his best buddy, Lieutenant Walt Mayo, both working with the 3rd Battalion of the 8th Regiment of the CAV, had their own two-person celebration. They could not have been closer as friends, having been through so much together. Peterson thought it an unusual friendship, one only the Army could forge. Walt Mayo was a talented and sophisticated man who had gone to Boston College, where his father taught music, whereas Peterson was a product of Officer Candidate School, and his formal schooling had ended back in Morris, Minnesota, in the ninth grade, because they were paying five dollars a day for men to work in the fields. In Pyongyang, Lieutenant Mayo had managed to procure a bottle of Russian bubbly from a large store of booze liberated from the Russian embassy, and they shared it, drinking the pseudo-champagne, so raw it made you gag from the metal cups in their mess kits. Vile, but good, they decided. Sergeant First Class Bill Richardson of Love Company of the 3rd Battalion felt a wave of relief sweep over him in Pyongyang. The war was virtually over, and the CAV might be getting out of Korea. He knew this, not just because of all the rumors, but because company headquarters had called asking all men who had experience loading ships to notify their superiors. That was as sure a sign as any that they were going to ship out. Another sign that their days of hard fighting were over was that they had been told to turn in most of their ammo. All the rumors seeping out of the different headquarters must be true. In his own mind, Richardson was the old guy in his unit. Almost everyone in his platoon now seemed new. He often thought of the men he had started out with three months earlier, a period that seemed to have lasted longer than the preceding twenty-one years of his life. Some were dead, some wounded, and some missing in action. The only other soldier in Richardson's platoon who had been there from the start was his pal Staff Sergeant Jim Walsh, and Richardson sought him out. Jesus, we did it, buddy, we made it all the way through, he said, and they congratulated each other, not quite believing their good luck. That mini-celebration took place on one of the last days of October. The very next day they were reissued their ammo and ordered north to save some South Korean outfit that was getting kicked around. Still, the word was out. There was going to be a victory parade in Tokyo, and the CAV, because it had fought so well for so long in the Korean campaign, and because it was a favorite of Douglas MacArthur's, the overall commander, was going to lead it. They were supposed to have their yellow cavalry scarves back for the parade, and the word coming down was that they'd better be prepared to look parade ground sharp, not battlefield grizzled. You couldn't, after all, march down the Ginza in filthy uniforms and filthy helmets. The men of the CAV were planning to strut a bit when they passed MacArthur's headquarters in the Daiichi building. They deserved to strut a bit. The mood in general among the American troops in Pyongyang just then was a combination of optimism and sheer exhaustion, emotional as well as physical. Bedding pools were set up on when they would ship out. For some of the newest men, the replacements, who had only heard tales about how hard the fighting had been from the Pusan perimeter to Pyongyang, there was relief that the worst of it was past. A young lieutenant named Ben Boyd from Claremore, Oklahoma, who joined the CAV in Pyongyang, was given a platoon in Baker Company of the 1st Battalion. Boyd, who had graduated West Point only four years before, wanted this command badly, but he was made nervous by its recent history. Lieutenant, do you know who you are in terms of this platoon? One of the senior officers had asked. No, Boyd answered. Well, Lieutenant... 
Just so you don't get too cocky, you're the thirteenth platoon leader this unit has had since it's been in Korea. Boyd suddenly decided he didn't feel cocky at all. On one of their last days in Pyongyang, there was another positive sign. Bob Hope held the show there for the troops. Now that was really something. The famous comedian who had done show after show for the troops in World War II, telling his jokes in the North Korean capital. That night, many of the men in the cab gathered to hear Hope, and then the next morning, with their extra ammo restored, they set out for a place just north of them called Unsan to protect a rock unit under fire. Surely all they would have to do was clean up a small mess, the kind they believed South Korean soldiers were always getting into. When they headed off, they were not particularly well prepared. Yes, they had gotten some of their ammo back, but there had been the question of uniforms. Should they take the ones they would wear on parade in Tokyo or winter clothes? Somehow the choice was made for the dressier ones, even though a Korean winter, this was to be one of the coldest in a hundred years, was fast approaching. And there was their mood, a sense on the part of officers as well as troops, even as they headed for areas perilously close to the Yalu River, the border between Korea and Chinese Manchuria, that they were out of harm's way. Many of them knew a little about the big meeting just two weeks earlier on Wake Island between Harry Truman and Douglas MacArthur, and the word filtering down was that MacArthur had promised to give Washington back an entire American division then being used in Korea and ticket it for Europe. MacArthur himself had shown up in Pyongyang right after the first cab arrived there. Any celebrities here to greet me? he had asked when he stepped off his plane. Where is Kim Buck Tooth? he joked, in mocking reference to Kim Il sung, the seemingly defeated North Korean communist leader. Then he asked anyone in the cab who had been with the unit from the beginning to step forward. Of the roughly two hundred men assembled, four took that step. Each had been wounded at some point. Then MacArthur got back on his plane for the flight back to Tokyo. He did not spend the night in Korea. In fact, he did not spend the night there during the entire time he commanded. As MacArthur headed back to Tokyo, it was becoming increasingly clear to some officials in Washington that he was planning to send his troops farther and farther north. He was sure that the Chinese would not enter the war. His troops were encountering very little resistance at that point, and the North Koreans had been in full flight, so he was stretching his orders, which in this case were much fuzzier than they should have been. He obviously intended to go all the way to the Yalu, to China's border, brushing aside the step-by-step -step limits Washington thought it had imposed, but was afraid of really imposing. A prohibition issued by the Joint Chiefs themselves against sending American troops to any province bordering China seemed not to slow MacArthur down at all. There was no real surprise in that. The only orders Douglas MacArthur had ever followed, it was believed, were his own. His confidence about what the vast Chinese armies everyone knew were poised just beyond the Yalu River would or would not do was far greater than that of top officials of the Truman administration. He had told the president at Wake Island that the Chinese would not enter the war. Besides, if they did, he had already boasted of his ability to turn their appearance into one of the great military slaughters in history. To MacArthur and the men on his staff, wonderfully removed from the Alaska-like temperatures and Alaska-like topography of this desolate part of the world, these were to be the final moments of a great victory march north that had begun with the amphibious Inshan landing behind North Korean lines. That had been a great success, perhaps the greatest triumph of a storied career, all the more so because the general had pulled it off against the opposition of much of Washington. Back in Washington, most senior people, both civilian and military, were becoming more and more uneasy as MacArthur pushed north. They were not nearly as confident as the general about Chinese 
or for that matter, Russian intentions, and they were made uneasy by the extreme vulnerability of the United Nations forces. But they realized that they had very little control over MacArthur himself. They seemed to fear him almost as much as they respected him. If the balance now favored the UN, the first phase of the war, when the North Koreans had crossed the 38th parallel back in late June, had decidedly favored the communists. They had gained victory after victory over weak and ill-prepared American and South Korean forces. But then more and better American troops had arrived and MacArthur had pulled off his brilliant stroke at Incheon, landing his forces behind the North Korean lines. With that, the North Korean forces had unraveled, and once Seoul had been taken after some very hard fighting, the North Korean resistance had generally vanished. But in Washington, many of the top people, though pleased by Incheon, were quite uneasy about the extra leverage it gave MacArthur. The Chinese had warned that they were going to enter the war, and yet MacArthur, difficult to deal with under the best of circumstances, had become even more godlike because of Inshan. He had said the Chinese would not come in, and he liked to think of himself as an expert on what he called the Oriental mind. But he had been wrong before, completely wrong, on Japanese intentions and abilities right before World War II. Later, some of the senior people in Washington would look at the moment when the UN troops reached Pyongyang and before they went on to Unsan as the last chance to keep the war from escalating into something larger, a war with China. No less nervous were some of the men and officers who were leading the drive north. For experienced officers making the trek as the temperature dropped alarmingly and the terrain became more mountainous and forbidding, there was an eerie quality to the advance. Years later, General Pak Sun Yup, commander of the South Korean 1st Division and considered by the Americans the best of the Korean commanders, remembered his own uneasiness as they moved forward without resistance. There was a sense of almost total isolation as if they were two alone. At first, Pak, a veteran officer who had once fought with the Japanese army, could not pinpoint what bothered him. Then it struck him. The absolute absence of people, the overwhelming silence that surrounded his troops. In the past, there had always been lots of refugees streaming south. Now the road was empty as if something important were taking place just beyond his view and his knowledge. Besides, it was getting colder all the time. Every day the temperature seemed to drop another few degrees. Certain key intelligence officers were nervous as well. They kept getting small bits of information from a variety of sources that made them believe that the Chinese had already entered North Korean territory by late October and in strength. Colonel Percy Thompson, G-2, or Intelligence Officer for First Corps, under which the CAV operated, and considered one of the ablest intelligence officers in Korea, was very pessimistic. He was quite sure of the Chinese presence, and he tried to warn his superiors. Unfortunately, he found himself fighting a sense of euphoria that had permeated some of the upper ranks of the CAV and originated in Tokyo. Thompson had directly warned Colonel Hal Edson, commander of the 8th Regiment of the 1st Cavalry Division, that he believed there was a formidable Chinese presence in the area, but Edson and others treated his warnings, he later noted, with disbelief and indifference. In the days that followed, his daughter, Barbara Thompson Eisenhower, married to Dwight Eisenhower's son, John, remembered a dramatic change in the tone of her father's letters from Korea. It was as if he were writing to say farewell. He was absolutely sure they were going to be overrun, and he was going to be killed, she later remembered. Thompson had good reason to be uneasy. His early intelligence reads were quite accurate. The Chinese were already in country, waiting patiently in the mountains of northern Korea for the rocks and perhaps other UN units to extend their already strained logistical lines ever farther north. 
they had not intended to hit an American unit that early in the campaign. They wanted the Americans to be even farther north when they struck and they knew the difficulty of the march north made their own job easier. On to the Yalu, General Pack's soldiers had shouted in late October, On to the Yalu! But on October 25th, the Chinese struck in force. It was like suddenly hitting a brick wall, Pack later wrote. At first, the rock commanders had no idea what had happened. Pack's 15th Regiment came to a complete halt under a withering barrage of mortar fire, after which the 12th Regiment on its left was hammered, and then his 11th Regiment, the Division Reserve, was hit on its flank and attacked from the rear. The enemy was clearly fighting with great skill. Pack thought it must be the Chinese. He reacted by reflex, and thereby probably saved most of his men he immediately pulled the division back to the village of Unsan. It was, he later said, like a scene from an American western when the white folks, hit by Indians and badly outnumbered, circled the wagons. His division had walked into a giant ambush set by the Chinese. Some other rock units were neither so lucky nor so well led. That it was the Chinese Pak soon had no doubt. On the first day of battle, some troops from the 15th Regiment had brought in a prisoner. Pat did the interrogation himself. The prisoner was about 35 and wore a thick, quilted, reversible winter uniform, khaki on one side, white on the other. It was, Pat wrote, a simple but effective way to facilitate camouflage in snowy terrain. The prisoner also wore a cap thick and heavy, with earmuffs of a sort they would soon become all too familiar with, and rubber sneakers. He was low-key but surprisingly forthcoming in the interrogation. He was a regular soldier in the Chinese Communist Army from Guangdong Province. He told Pak in passing that there were tens of thousands of Chinese in the nearby mountains. The entire 1st Rock Division might be trapped. Pack immediately called his corps commander, Major General Frank Shrimp Milburn, and took the prisoner back to Milburn's headquarters. This time Milburn did the interrogating while Pack interpreted. It went, he later wrote, like this. Where are you from? I'm from South China. What's your unit? The 39th Army. What fighting have you done? I fought in the Hainan Island battle in the Chinese Civil War. Are you a Korean resident of China? No, I'm Chinese. Pak was absolutely sure that the prisoner was telling the truth. He was without pretension or evasiveness. Of the seriousness of his information, there should also have been no doubt. It had long been known that the Chinese had at least 300,000 men poised just over the Yalu, ready to come in when they wanted. The only question was whether Beijing was bluffing when it warned the world of its intention to send Chinese troops into battle. Milburn immediately reported the new intelligence to 8th Army Headquarters. From there, it was sent on to Brigadier General Charles Willoughby, Douglas MacArthur's key intelligence chief, a man dedicated to the proposition that there were no Chinese in Korea and that they were not going to come in, at least not in numbers large enough to matter. That was what his commander believed, and MacArthur's was the kind of headquarters where the G2's job was first and foremost to prove that the commander was always right. The drive north to the Yalu, involving a limited number of American, South Korean, and other UN troops spread far too thinly over a vast expanse of mountain range, was premised on the idea of Chinese abstinence. If MacArthur's headquarters suddenly started reporting contact with significant Chinese forces, Washington, which had been watching somewhat passively from the sidelines, might bestir itself and demand a major role in the war, and Tokyo headquarters could lose control of its plan and not be able to go all the way to the Yalu. That was most decidedly not what MacArthur wanted to happen, and what MacArthur wanted was what Willoughby always made come true in his intelligence estimates. 
When the first reports about Chinese forces massing north of the Yalu came in, Willoughby had been typically dismissive. Probably in the category of diplomatic blackmail, he reported. Now, with the first Chinese prisoner captured, an unusually talkative one at that, the word soon came back from Willoughby's headquarters. The prisoner was a Korean resident of China who had volunteered to fight. The conclusion was bizarre, and it was deliberately aimed at minimizing the prisoner's significance. It meant that the prisoner did not know who he was, what his nationality was, what unit he was with, or how many fellow soldiers he had arrived with. It was a judgment that would have pleased the Chinese high command. It was exactly what they wanted the Americans to think. The more cavalier the Americans were, the greater the victory the Chinese were sure they were going to reap when they finally closed the trap. In the coming weeks, American or ROC forces repeatedly took Chinese prisoners who identified their units and confirmed that they had crossed the Yalu with large numbers of their compatriots. Again and again Willoughby downplayed the field intelligence. But if Division, Corps, Army, and Far East Command were now arguing over whether Chinese prisoners were in fact really Chinese, whether they were part of a division, an army, or an army group, and what this meant for the extremely vulnerable troops of the United Nations force, little of this reached down to the troops themselves. Typical were the men of the 8th Cavalry Regiment, who had been convinced, as they moved from Pyongyang to Unsan, that they were pursuing the last ragtag remnants of the North Korean army, and would soon reach the Yalu itself, and, if at all possible, piss in it as a personal symbol of triumph. A very dangerous kind of euphoria had spread through the highest ranks of the 8th Army, and no one reflected it more than MacArthur himself. As he, the most experienced officer in the American army, was overwhelmingly confident of the road ahead, so were those in his command, including many of the senior people at corps and division. The higher you went in headquarters, especially in Tokyo, the stronger was the feeling that the war was over, and that the only job left was a certain amount of mopping up. There were many telltale signs of this overconfidence. On October 22nd, Three days before the first Chinese prisoner was captured, Lieutenant General Walton Walker, commander of the 8th Army, had requested authority from MacArthur to divert all further shipments of bulk-loaded ammunition from Korea to Japan. MacArthur approved the request and ordered six ships carrying 105 and 155 millimeter artillery shells diverted to Hawaii an army that had spent much of the previous four months starved for ammunition, now felt it had too much. In the 8th Army sector, Major General Lawrence Dutch Kaiser, commander of the famed 2nd Infantry Division, summoned all his officers for a special staff meeting on October 25th. Lieutenant Ralph Hockley, a young forward observer with the 27th Field Artillery Battalion, remembered the date and the words precisely. The second, which had been through much of the heaviest fighting in the war, was going to leave Korea, Kaiser said. He was in a wonderful mood. We're all going home, and we're going home soon. Before Christmas, he told his officers, we have our orders. One of the officers asked where they were going. Kaiser answered that he couldn't tell them, but it would be a place they would like. The speculation began. Tokyo? Hawaii, perhaps the States, or even some base in Europe. The men of the 8th Regiment of the 1st Cavalry Division reached Unsan without difficulty. Sergeant Herbert Pappy Miller took the news that they had to leave Pyongyang and head north to Unsan to steady the rocks philosophically. Miller was an assistant platoon sergeant with Love Company of the 3rd Battalion of the 8th Cav. He might have liked a few more days in Pyongyang, but these were orders, and that was the business they were in, plugging holes. He had never understood why the brass had thought the rocks could lead the way north in the first place. Miller wasn't worried about the Chinese coming in. 
What worried him was the cold, because they were still in summer weight uniforms. Back at Pyongyang, they had been told that winter clothes were on their way, already in the trucks, and supposed to arrive the next day or the one after that. They had been hearing that for several days, but no winter uniforms had arrived. Because Miller's regiment had been in so many battles for so long, the green troops of July and August had, through attrition, been replaced by the green troops of October. He and his close friend Richard Hedinger, from Joplin, Missouri, another World War II veteran, had vowed to keep an eye on each other. There was a lot of talk now about going home by Christmas, but Miller had a somewhat more jaundiced view, which was that you were home when you got home. Pappy Miller was from the small town of Pulaski, New York. He had served with the 42nd Division in World War II, gone back to Pulaski, found little in the way of decent employment, and rejoined the Army in 1947. He was part of the 7th Regiment of the 3rd Infantry Division, which had been detached and assigned to the 1st Cavalry, and he had only six months to go on a three-year enlistment when he was ordered to Korea in July 1950. In World War II, he had thought everything was always done right. And in Korea, damn near everything was done wrong. He and his company had arrived in country one morning in mid-July, had been rushed to the front lines near the village and key juncture of Taejin, and had been thrown into the line that first day. He had been through everything ever since, which was why his men called him Pappy, though he was only twenty-four years old. There had been a lot of bravado on the way up to the line near Taejin that first day, young soldiers who knew battle only through war movies bragging that they were going to kick some Korean ass. Miller had stayed silent while they boasted. Better to feel that way after the battle was over than before it began. But there was no point in telling them that. It was something you had to learn yourself. And that first battle had been terrible. They were ill-prepared, and the North Koreans were very effective, very experienced troops. By the next day, the company had been reduced from about 160 men to 39. We were damn near annihilated that very first night, Miller said. There was not much talk about kicking Korean ass after that. It was not that the kids had fought badly. They just weren't ready not right off the boat, and there were so many North Koreans. No matter how well you fought, there were always more. Always. They would slip behind you, cut off your avenue of retreat, and then they would hit you on the flanks. They were superb at that, Miller thought. The first wave or two would come at you with rifles, and right behind them were soldiers without rifles, ready to pick up the weapons of those who had fallen and keep coming. Against an army with that many men, everyone, he thought, needed an automatic weapon. And the American equipment was terrible. Their basic infantry gear was often junk. Back at Fort Devens, they had been given old training rifles in terrible shape, poorly cared for, not worth a damn, which seemed to indicate how the nation felt about its peacetime army. Once they got to Korea, there was never enough ammo. Miller remembered a bitter fight early in the war when someone had brought over an ammo box and it was all loose. They had to make their own clips. He had wondered what kind of army sent loose ammo to outnumbered infantrymen whose lives were hanging in the balance. He was amateur hour, he thought. The North Koreans were driving good tanks, Russian A-34s, and the sorry old World War II bazookas the Americans had couldn't penetrate their skins. In World War II, you always knew what your objective was and who was fighting on your left and right. In Korea, you were always fighting blind and were never sure of your flanks, because, likely as not, the rocks were there. On the day they reached Unsan, Miller took a patrol about five miles north of their base, and they came upon an old farmer, who told them that there were thousands of Chinese in the area, many of whom had arrived on horseback. There was a simplicity and a conviction to the old man that made Miller almost sure he was telling the truth. So he brought him back to his headquarters. 
but no one at battalion headquarters seemed very interested. Chinese? Thousands and thousands of Chinese? No one had seen any Chinese. On horseback? That was absurd. So nothing came of it. Well, Miller thought, they were the intelligence experts. They ought to know. Of the men in the 8th Regiment, a young corporal named Lester Urban, in Item Company, 3rd Battalion, was one of the first to sense the danger. He was a runner attached to Headquarters Company, which meant that he was around Battalion Headquarters a lot and tended to pick up what the officers were saying. The 17-year-old Urban was only 5'4", a mere 100 pounds, too small for the football team at his high school back in the tiny town of Del Barton, West Virginia. His nickname in the cav was Peanut, but he was tough and fast, and so he had been picked as runner. Given the sorry state of American wire and radio communications in Korea, the equipment rarely functioned properly, it was his job to deliver messages, oral and written, from battalion to company. It was exceptionally dangerous duty. Urban was proud of the fact that he knew how to do it and survive. If he made four or five trips to the same place in a day, he always varied his route and never got careless. Get predictable and get dead, he thought. Urban had a sense of unease, because there were no American units on either flank, which maximized your vulnerability. But they had been on such a roll, and there had been so little opposition in the last few weeks, that he wasn't particularly worried at least not until they reached Unsan. At Unsan, though, his regiment jutted out, in his words, like nothing so much as a sore thumb, and if you thought about it, then you realized that its three battalions were ill-placed and ill-spaced. The gaps between them, small on a map somewhere back at headquarters, were surprisingly wide if you had to run from one unit to another, as he did. Urban was near battalion headquarters on October 31st when Lieutenant Colonel Harold Johnny Johnson, until the previous week the battalion commander of 3rd Battalion of the 8th Regiment, the 3-8, but recently promoted to the command of his own regiment, the 5th Cav, also part of the 1st Cavalry Division, had driven up to check on his old outfit. One of the last things Johnson had done before they all left Pyongyang was hold a memorial service for the men of the 3rd Battalion who had been lost since the war began, some 400 of them. He was joined at the service by the soldiers who had been there from the start, a pitifully small remainder, as Johnson put it. Johnny Johnson was more than admired. He was loved by most of the men in his old outfit. He had been with them from the day they arrived in country, and they felt he always made the right decisions in battle. He had an unusual sense of loyalty to the men under him, the kind of thing that ordinary soldiers notice and value when they grade an officer. And they were always grading officers because their lives depended on it. They knew that Johnson had turned down a chance to be a regimental commander early in the fighting in order to stay with the battalion when it was new to combat because he felt obligated to the men he had brought over. He was a man who had already been through his own prolonged hell. Captured by the Japanese at Bataan at the start of World War II, he had managed to survive the Bataan Death March and more than three years as a prisoner. Generally, being a prisoner of war did not help an officer's career. This would be especially true in Korea, where the treatment of American prisoners by the communists was unusually cruel, and where, because of the brainwashing, some men had been damaged. But Johnson eventually ended up as chief of staff of the army. He was the best, Lester Urban said years later, someone born to lead men. I think he was always thinking about what was good for us. Nothing ever got by him. His experience on Bataan had made Johnson less trusting of conventional wisdom, and he knew more about the consequences of undue optimism than most officers. At that moment, he had the 5th Cav positioned as a reserve force just a few miles south of his old unit, but he was becoming nervous, hearing talk of a large enemy force moving through the area, one that might cut the road, severing the 8th Regiment from the rest of the division. 
On his own, Johnson had driven north to check the situation out. On the ride, the same stillness that had bothered General Pack, the fact that there was nothing moving, upset Johnson too. Something like that, he later said, made the back of your neck prickle. When he finally reached his old battalion, he did not like what he saw at all. His replacement, Robert Ormond, was brand new to his job and, to Johnson's eye, had dispersed the battalion poorly. Most of the men were positioned in the flat paddy land and not even very well dug in. Watching the two officers meet, Urban sensed Johnson's distress. Johnson was not, as Urban saw it, a man to chew another officer out, but what he said to Ormond seemed surprisingly tough. You've got to get these men out of the valley and up on the high ground. They're much too vulnerable where they are. You've got no defense if you're hit. I thought he was going to whip Ormond's butt right then and there, Urban said years later. Johnson assumed that Ormond would pick up on what he said and was appalled to discover later that his advice had been ignored. Nor was it just the 3rd Battalion that was poorly positioned. After the entire tragedy was over, many of the more senior officers would admit that the disposition of the entire 8th Regiment had been very poorly done. The men were arranged as if they had no enemies to fear. Lieutenant Hewlett Reb Rayner joined the regiment immediately after the Unsan battle, and one thing he decided to do was put together in his own mind what had happened. He was shocked at the way the regiment had been positioned. The first thing was that the battalions could not really support each other. They were not properly linked up. The second thing was that you could drive a division or maybe two divisions of Chinese soldiers through them, and the people spending the night there might not even know it. And that was the way the enemy fought. He came up and moved along the flanks, then encircled you and then squeezed you, Rayner said. I know regiment hadn't gotten the word from higher headquarters about the Chinese, but still, they were very far north. It was Indian country. Something was clearly up, and there was no point at all in being positioned as if you're back in the States on some kind of war game. To say it was careless, that was an understatement. Sergeant Bill Richardson, who had a recoilless rifle section of a heavy weapons platoon in Love Company, remembered October 31, 1950, exceptionally well. His section had drawn duty at the south end of the 3rd Battalion's position, near a place called the Camel's Head Bend, part of a unit guarding a bridge where a small road crossed the Namnyan River. The day before, they had finally received a shipment of what the supply people claimed were winter clothes— some field jackets, fresh socks, and nothing much else. Richardson had told one of his men to distribute the jackets as best he could and skip the sergeants because there just weren't enough to go around. Years later, it infuriated him when he read that the men in his company had been caught asleep in their sleeping bags. It had been bad enough the way they were hit, but they sure as hell weren't in their sleeping bags because they didn't have any. They had to create do-it-yourself sleeping bags as best they could, wrapping their blankets and shelter halves together. That day, Richardson had been on duty at the bridge when Lieutenant Colonel Johnson stopped on his way back from the battalion command post. Johnson had wanted to talk, but he was also being somewhat guarded. Look, he said, we've had reports of a few minor roadblocks in the area. We think they're remnants of the North Korean army, and they may be coming up the river bend heading towards you, going north. Richardson was not bothered by the news. He told Johnson, my famous last words, Colonel, if they come up the river bend, they've had it. Then Johnson warned him to be careful, and they shook hands. Johnson wished him good luck, and Richardson thought to himself, because Johnson was driving through the countryside virtually alone, Colonel, sir, you're the one who needs the luck. They had been together since training at Fort Devens back in Massachusetts. Richardson had served in Europe at the tail end of World War II, arriving in that war too late to see combat, only the devastation it had wrought. But in Korea he would eventually be battle-tested far beyond the norm, in combat as difficult and dangerous as any American force had ever been exposed to. 
He had grown up in Philadelphia, and his parents had been entertainers. He was a less than diligent student, and was sent in time to the local industrial school, which was the system's way of telling him to forget about college, in the unlikely event that the idea had ever entered his mind. His formal schooling ended in the ninth grade, and he joined the army and found he liked it. He had been trained by skilled professionals, men who had been through the worst of World War II and passed on the little things that were most likely to save your life. In the early spring of 1950, Richardson was on the third extension of his enlistment in a period of post-World War II downsizing, and the army had been trying to force him out. Then the North Koreans moved south, and overnight the people who ran the army decided they wanted him to stay on. So instead of mustering out at Fort Devens in late June, he became a charter member of the 3-8. Richardson remembered that immediately after the North Korean invasion, on June 26th or 27th, Johnny Johnson had assembled the whole battalion at a post-movie house, and the unit was so small that only the first two or three rows were filled. They were shown an infantry propaganda movie that ended with some soldiers being awarded silver stars and bronze stars. Johnson had told them, Men, those of you who aren't wearing one of those will be in a few weeks. Richardson had thought he was crazy at the time. Within days, men started arriving from every kind of outfit. MPs and cooks and supply men, all infantrymen now, enough to fill any movie theater. Then they shipped out. Later, after they were hit by the Chinese, Richardson believed that Johnson had been trying to warn him of his concern that the Chinese were in the area and that the approaches to the Eighth Cav were open. Perhaps it was as much of a warning as you could give at a moment when to utter the magic word Chinese to an NCO might trigger panic. If Johnson had still been their battalion commander, Richardson was sure, he would have tightened up their positions, moved them to higher ground, and made sure that their firepower was mutually supportive and much more concentrated. Ormond might become a fine officer someday, Richardson thought, but this was neither the time nor the place to make your combat debut. Major Fillmore Maccabee, the S-3, or Operations Chief of the 3rd Battalion, like Johnny Johnson, was uneasy with the way the regiment was dispersed, but he would not get a chance to discuss it with Johnson for a long time because he spent the next two and a half years in a prison camp. Maccabee an experienced combat officer from World War II, had been a company commander with the 1st Cav from the moment it arrived in country. He was considered an excellent combat leader, but at the moment the Chinese struck, he was mainly a frustrated officer. Both Ormond and his exec, Major Veal Moriarty, were new in command, and their experience, as far as Maccabee could tell, was primarily as staff men at the regimental level. They knew each other well and left Maccabee, the more combat-tested officer, feeling crowded out. I was the uneasy one, but I was the outsider, he would later say. He had tried to alert Ormond about the battalion's poor positioning to no avail. Nor did he like the mood of the unit, and he blamed that on the senior officers. Too many of the men were becoming far too careless and cocky. There was too much talk about where they were going after Korea. All they talked about was their next two stops, the Yalu and then home. Later, when Maccabee found out that some Chinese prisoners had been captured and units like his, up on point, had not been warned, he felt that the decision at headquarters to conceal, if not suppress, this information was one of the most appalling acts he had ever heard of. A complete abdication of military responsibility. After he came to learn much more about Chinese military tactics, it struck him that his regiment, spread out as it was, had presented a particularly enticing target. What none of them, including Ormond, knew was that before the Chinese hit, a debate was underway at higher headquarters. The commander of the 8th Cavalry Regiment, Colonel Hal Edson, wanted to move his troops back. His unit was too exposed, he believed, and there had been enough warnings by then to make a man pay attention. On November 1st, when he woke up, 
the skies were thick with smoke from forest fires. Edson and others suspected that the fires were set by enemy troops eager to shield their movements from American air observation. Major General Hap Gay, the 1st Cav Division commander, who took the reports of the Chinese in the area more seriously than some of his superiors, was also becoming edgier by the hour. On that first day of November, he had set up his division command post, or CP, at Yongsandong, south of Unsan. For some time, Gay had been disturbed by the way his division was being split up, with different battalions being shipped off to other divisions, based on the whims of the people at core, and not on the integrity of the division itself. He particularly did not like the way the 8th Regiment was sticking out so nakedly, open to the enemy on all sides. His aide, Lieutenant William West, believed that Gay had been smoldering all along over the way the Army had been handling the Korean War. Gay, General George Patton's chief of staff in World War II, believed that he had been taught how to do things right and how not to do things wrong, and in Korea they had been doing things wrong from the start. He had been shocked by the terrible state of the Army when the war began and bothered as well by MacArthur's initial failure to respect the ability of the enemy, his belief that he could handle the North Koreans, as he had said, with one hand tied behind my back. Gay seemed to think his superiors in Tokyo had little feel for the enemy or for the terrain, and surprisingly little curiosity about either. Those goddamn people don't have their feet on the ground. They're living in the goddamn dream world, he told West once after he left MacArthur's headquarters. Nothing angered him more, however, than the way the most talented officers, the kind of men he badly wanted as battalion commanders, always seemed to be siphoned off to staff jobs at MacArthur's headquarters. He was appalled as well by how much larger it had grown than comparable headquarters in the previous war. He would mutter about how 3rd Army headquarters back in 1945 had only a few hundred officers to deal with thousands of men in the field, but how Tokyo in this war had thousands of men at headquarters to support hundreds of men in the field. There was an officer whose main job, it seemed, was just to fly in from Tokyo to Gay's headquarters periodically to see what he needed. At one point, Gay gave him a list of officers from World War II then assigned to Tokyo whom Gay wanted to command his troops. When the officer next returned, Gay asked where his potential battalion commanders were. General MacArthur says they're too valuable to be spared, the officer replied. Jesus Christ, what in the hell is more valuable than battle-tested officers leading American troops in combat, Gay muttered. He was bothered as well by all the talk about being home by Christmas. Which Christmas? This year or next, he would say. That's stupid talk. All it does is get the troops too excited about going home and they get careless. Now, fearing the possibility that one of his regiments might soon be encircled, he was pushing hard to pull it back and consolidate the division. But his superior, 1st Corps Commander Frank Milburn, was reluctant to do it. The Army did not like to use the word retreat unless it had to. The proper phrase was retrograde movement. And Milburn did not want to make a retrograde movement, not after almost six weeks of steady advances, and above all, not with the mounting pressure coming in from MacArthur's headquarters to go all the way to the Yalu as quickly as possible. Gay, West knew, was becoming more and more fearful about losing a regiment to an enemy that Tokyo still insisted did not exist. There was a fault line in this war. On one side was the battlefield reality and the dangers facing the troops themselves, and on the other side, the world of illusion that existed in Tokyo and from which all these euphoric orders emanated. The fault line often fell between corps and division, with corps feeling the heat from the general in Tokyo and division sensing the vulnerability of a regiment of badly exposed troops. More than once, when there was still time to move the 8th Regiment back, Milburn refused to give the order. On the afternoon of November 1st, 
Hap Gay was in his CP with Brigadier General Charles Palmer, his artillery commander, when a radio report from an observer in an L-5 spotter plane caught their attention. This is the strangest sight I have ever seen. There are two large columns of enemy infantry moving southeast over the trails in the vicinity of Myeongdang Dong and Yonghundong. Our shells are landing right in their columns and they keep coming. Those were two tiny villages five or six air miles from Unsan. Palmer immediately ordered additional artillery units to start firing, and Gay nervously called First Corps, once again requesting permission to pull the entire 8th Cav several miles south of Unsan. His request was again denied. With that was lost the last real chance to save the 8th Cavalry, and especially its 3rd Battalion. In some ways, the battle that followed was over almost before it began. Two divisions of elite Chinese Communist regulars, among the most experienced men in their army, were about to strike units of an elite American division that was ill-prepared and ill-positioned for the collision, and commanded in too many instances by men who believed the Korean War was essentially over. Units of the 5th Cavalry under Johnny Johnson, which had been moving north toward Unsan on a relief mission, soon ran into a major Chinese roadblock. Not only would they not be able to help the 8th Cavalry, but it was touch and go whether they could extricate themselves from a vicious battle without being destroyed. As Roy Appleman, an exceptionally careful historian of the Korean War has pointed out, by nightfall of November 1st, the 8th Cav was encircled on three sides by the Chinese forces. Only on its east, if the 15th Rock Regiment actually stayed in place and fought, might it have any protection. Lieutenant Ben Boyd was the new platoon leader in Baker Company of the 8th Cavalry's 1st Battalion. The 1st Battalion, with its attached unit of tanks and artillery, in reality a battalion task force, was the most exposed of the regiment's three battalions, positioned about 400 yards north of the town of Unsan. Boyd's battalion commander, Jack Milliken, Jr., had been his tactical officer at West Point, and Boyd thought him a good, steady man. As far as Boyd knew, their battalion was up there alone. They had been the first of the three battalions out of Pyongyang, and he had no idea whether the rest of the regiment was following. That first afternoon, right after they arrived, they registered their mortars on some surrounding targets, and there were even brief exchanges of fire with the enemy, but the action was light, and everyone had assumed it was North Korean stragglers. That night, though, Boyd was called over by his company commander, who had just been briefed at battalion. The word Boyd got was, there are 20,000 laundrymen in the area. Boyd knew what that meant, 20,000 Chinese near them. Then they heard musical instruments, like weird Asian bagpipes. Some of the officers thought for a moment that a British brigade was arriving to help them out. But it was not bagpipes. Instead, it was an eerie, very foreign sound, perhaps bugles and flutes, a sound many of them would remember for the rest of their lives. It was the sound they would come to recognize as the Chinese about to enter battle, signaling to one another by musical instrument what they were doing and deliberately striking fear into their enemy as well. Boyd believed his men were in decent positions, though they were not a full platoon in his mind. Nearly half of them were Katusas, Korean augmentation to the U.S. Army, poorly trained Korean soldiers attached to American units who, most American officers believed, could not be relied on if there was a serious fight. They were there to beef up American units, to make the U.N. forces look larger on paper, if not in battle, than they really were. It was an experiment that no one liked. Not the company commanders, not the American troops who fought alongside the Koreans but could not communicate with them, and certainly not the Katusas themselves, who more often than not gave every sign of wanting very badly to be almost anywhere else. At roughly 10.30 p.m., the Chinese struck. It was stunning how quickly something could fall apart, Boyd thought. 
The American units were so thinly positioned that the Chinese seemed to race right through their fragile lines, almost like a track meet, some of the men later said. What had once been a well-organized battalion CP, command post, quickly disintegrated. Some of the survivors from different platoons tried to form a makeshift last-second perimeter, but they were quickly overpowered. There were wounded everywhere. Milliken was handling the growing chaos as best he could, Boyd thought, trying to put together a convoy with about ten deuce-and-a-half trucks and loading as many wounded as possible onto them. At that moment, Boyd ran into Captain Emil Capon, an army chaplain who was tending to a number of wounded. Boyd offered to assign the priests to one of the trucks, but Father Capon refused. He planned to stay with the wounded men who would not be able to get out on their own. They would have to surrender, he was sure, but he would do all he could to offer the wounded some modest protection. The battalion had two tanks, and when the convoy finally took off, it was with Milliken aboard the lead tank and the other tank bringing up the rear with Boyd on top of it. About a mile south of Unsan, the road split, one branch veering southeast, the other in a southwesterly direction, through the edge of the 3rd Battalion position and over the bridge that Bill Richardson and his weapons section were guarding. Milliken blindly headed them southeast. That any of the men made it out at all came from that choice. The Chinese had set up a formidable force on both sides of the road, waiting to ambush them. It was hard to measure distance or time in those moments when the enemy was striking with such force, but Boyd thought his convoy got about five or six hundred yards down the road before the Chinese opened up. Their firepower was overwhelming, and the convoy, with so many wounded, had almost no means of fighting back. In the confusion, the vehicles all had their lights off, the driver of Boyd's tank panicked and began to rotate his turret wildly. The dozen or so men on top were all knocked off, and Boyd promptly found himself sprawled in a ditch. Later, he would decide that he survived only by the grace of God. He could hear the Chinese approaching. His only chance was to play dead. Soon, they started beating on him with their rifle butts and kicking him. Luckily, no one used a bayonet. Finally, they rummaged through his pockets, took his watch and his ring, and left. He waited for what seemed an eternity, hours at least, and then slowly started to crawl away, totally disoriented, suffering from a concussion, among other wounds. In the distance, he could hear artillery fire, and assuming it was the Americans, he headed that way. He hobbled across a stream, probably the Nam Nyon, and discovered that his leg was in terrible pain. He realized that he had been badly burned, probably from the white phosphorus the Chinese were firing. Boyd moved cautiously in the next few days, at night, hiding as best he could during the day. He was out there at least a week, maybe ten days, trying to work his way back to American lines, in constant pain and voraciously hungry. He was helped by one Korean farmer who fed him and, using primitive hand signals, directed him toward the American positions. He was sure he would not have made it without the farmer's help. Around November 15th, after a trek of almost two weeks, Boyd reached an American unit. He was immediately sent to a series of hospitals. His burns were serious indeed. His Korean War was over. He was one of the lucky ones. He had no idea how many of his platoon had died, only that the company commander had been killed. He never saw any of them again. At the southern part of the 8th Regiment's defenses, at the moment just before the Chinese hit, Bill Richardson of Love Company was still guarding his concrete bridge, a span of about 90 feet over what was alleged to be a river but was essentially a dry creek. He and most of his section were in the flatlands on the north side of the bridge, which itself was technically the southernmost position of the regiment. The battalion headquarters was about 500 yards to the north, and the rest of Love Company about 350 yards to the west. 
When he first noticed noises coming from a hill just south of them, Richardson asked his pal Jim Walsh, the only other experienced man in the squad, You hear what I'm hearing? Richardson knew something was going on out there, but he couldn't spare even the four or five men necessary for a recon. He put in a call to company headquarters hoping to get some help. It took three tries before company even picked up. He was furious. How could the people there be so casual? Company then called battalion, and battalion finally sent one soldier over from its intelligence and recon section. He came ambling down the road with no sense of urgency at all. Richardson explained the mission, and the soldier disappeared, only to reappear a while later with a squad of four men who went up the hill making enough noise, Richardson thought, for an entire division. When the recon patrol returned, just as noisily, the lead soldier said, There's no one up there. But one of his men was carrying an entrenching tool and a pair of padded gloves that were different from any gloves Richardson had seen so far. More important, they were dry, which, given all the frost and fog, meant they had been left there recently. Well, the soldier finally admitted, there are some foxholes, but they've obviously been there a long time. Richardson was quietly furious. The importance of the dry gloves was the kind of thing you were supposed to understand instantly, even if you weren't from the S-2 or a battalion's intelligence section. Richardson insisted he take the gloves and the tool to his boss and tell him that something might be up. Obviously irritated, the soldier said, Look, if you don't like what we did, then get your own ass up there. All of this was making Richardson edgier by the minute. Sometime after ten that night, he got a call to send some men to battalion for a recon patrol. That stretched his limits. He had only about fifteen men, and five were Catoosas, none of whom could speak English. Richardson decided to keep the Catoosas and send Walsh, his best man, up there with three other Americans. When they reached battalion, Richardson found out later, they were told just to dig some prone shelters and get some rest. It was still quiet in Richardson's sector, but both the first and the second battalions were already being hammered. Then, about 1.30 in the morning of November 2nd, it all exploded. The Chinese hit the 3rd Battalion of the 8th Calf. Years later, Richardson read that they had slipped into the area wearing captured rock uniforms, but he did not believe it. There was no need for disguise. They just poured in from the east, which was completely open. One moment the battalion headquarters was a center of American military activity. The next, it had been completely overrun and was filled with Chinese. At the same time, about 350 yards away on Richardson's left, the Chinese hit Love Company and overran it. That meant that four Chinese machine guns could swing their fire back and forth across Richardson's position, tearing it to pieces. From the south, a young lieutenant named Robert Keyes, a platoon leader in Love Company of the 3rd Battalion, new to the unit, and Richardson's friend, Pappy Miller, the assistant platoon sergeant who had picked up warnings about the Chinese the moment he arrived in Unsan, were pulling back from a position two or three hills to the southeast of Richardson, a place called Hill 904. Richardson barely knew Keyes. The cav went through platoon leaders very quickly, but Keyes arrived eager to use Richardson's landline phone to try to find out what was going on. Because of the pathetic state of their communications, Keyes and his men were completely cut off. By then, Richardson's landline phone was out. The Chinese, Keyes decided, had already cut the wires. Keyes decided to take his men up the road to battalion. Miller shook Richardson's hand and wished him good luck. The next time I saw him was fifty-two years later at a CAV reunion, Miller said. By that time, Richardson couldn't even communicate with his own company. He had sent one of his men across the 350-yard gap to Love Company, but the soldier had been hit and had not been able to make it through. He had crawled back toward Richardson, apologizing repeatedly as he got near. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I can't make it. 
When Richardson reached him and opened his jacket, it was completely soaked with blood. The man died in his arms. At that moment, the worst thing Richardson would recall was that he could not even remember the soldier's name. The bridge they were guarding was now open to the Chinese. Richardson took two or three of his remaining men and started north toward battalion. He was in a ditch alongside the road when he ran into two soldiers coming the other way part of the team he had sent off with Walsh earlier. The rest of the squad is all dead. Walsh is dead, one of the men said. By chance, the soldier added, he himself had gone to take a leak just when the Chinese broke in and shot the others while they were just waiting there. Otherwise, he would be dead too. Just a few days earlier, Richardson and Walsh, his oldest friend in the unit, had reached Pyongyang and congratulated each other on making it through that far. Now Walsh was dead, and their regiment was being destroyed. For Major Fillmore Maccabee, the 3rd Battalion S3, the worst thing was the chaos and confusion. They had no idea who had hit them or with what size force. Was it ten thousand, or was it a hundred, or a thousand? Were they Chinese, or were they Korean, he said years later. Soon, there were two other paramount questions. Who was in charge of the American units, and what were their orders? Ormond, the battalion commander, had tried to go north to the village of Unsan to check out their positions, had been severely wounded, and was already dying or dead. Maccabee never saw him again. Ville Moriarty, the exec officer, went off reconnoitering, and Maccabee never saw him again either. He remained bitter about Moriarty's disappearance for years afterward. The exec had made it out, but Maccabee believed it was his job to stay and help hold the battalion together. Maccabee headed south to find out what was happening. Along the way, he was overtaken by three Chinese soldiers— he guessed who they were instantly by their padded, quilted jackets and the ear flaps on their hats. They seemed as puzzled to stumble upon him as he was them. They raised their rifles and pointed them at him. Communication was impossible, so he just pointed up the road, and remarkably enough, they headed off in that direction without shooting him. Only then did his luck begin to run out. He was hit twice, apparently by Chinese soldiers positioned some distance from the road, whom he never saw. The first bullet struck the side of his head. Then another bullet shattered his shoulder blade, and he sensed that it was over. He was bleeding heavily from the head wound and growing weaker by the minute. He knew the terrible cold worked against him, and he was sure he was going to die there when an American soldier found him and somehow guided him back to battalion headquarters. Lieutenant Keyes, who had been cut off since he left Richardson at the bridge, was moving his platoon toward battalion headquarters when the Chinese opened up with machine guns and mortars. He tried to get his platoon to a ditch that ran along the side of the road, but they were caught between the Chinese and the American forces and losing a lot of men. Lieutenant, I think we've got gooks all around us, Sergeant Luther Wise, one of his squad leaders, said. Just then a mortar round came in and killed Wise and wounded Keyes. The lieutenant found that he could not lift one of his arms, but he kept moving what remained of his platoon toward the battalion command post. In the chaos he almost stumbled into a Chinese officer, but saw him first and quickly moved his men back and eventually brought them to what was the new CP, which was in effect a battalion aid station. There was a Chinese machine gun that had fairly good coverage of their path back to the battalion, but Keyes had checked the way the Chinese gunner fired. A pause and a burst, a pause and a burst, exact increments of firing each time, and it was like breaking a code. He timed each burst and moved his men across in small groups during the pauses. Keyes thought they might have gotten some protection from the Chinese machine gun because the Chinese bodies were beginning to pile up, limiting the gunner's vision. By the time they reached the aid station, Keyes estimated that they had only about twelve of the original twenty-eight men in his platoon left. 
They had been under strength from the start because of the shortage of replacements. Now they were more like a squad. He was trying to help Dr. Clarence Anderson, the battalion surgeon, when a grenade landed near his feet and he was wounded again, what turned out to be four breaks in one leg and some wounds in the other. Even as the grenade landed, a mortar round came in and killed five of the men left in Keyes' platoon who could still fight. Keyes was absolutely sure that not many more men were going to get out. Certainly not him, because he couldn't move either leg. The battalion command post was a disaster. Men dazed, wounded, completely numbed by what had happened were straggling in from different positions. When Bill Richardson finally reached it, he was shocked by the sheer chaos he found. Americans were mixed in with Chinese, who seemed unable to comprehend their victory, as if they had succeeded beyond their expectations. Now, having taken the CP, it was as if they had no idea what to do next. You could pass a Chinese soldier right in front of the CP at that moment, and he would do nothing. A medic told Richardson they had created a small position nearby where they were protecting about forty wounded men. Dr. Anderson was there along with Father Capon. But there was a serious question of who was in charge. Ormond and Maccabee were both seriously wounded, and no one knew where Moriarty was. New leadership would have to rise to the surface on its own, Richardson thought. He decided he would go back to Love Company and see if there were any other men he could help bring back. He started retracing his steps, shouting out his name so his own men wouldn't shoot him. He found Lieutenant Paul Bromser, the commander of Love Company, badly shot up, but the exec, Lieutenant Frederick Giroux, though wounded, was still functioning. It had been awful, Giroux said. The Chinese had swept right through them. Perhaps only twenty-five of the company's one hundred eighty men were left. Can you get them out? Giroux asked, and Richardson replied, Yes, but not over the bridge. He would have to make his own return route, zigzagging back and forth. On the way, he ran into two Chinese soldiers with bags of grenades and shot one. A grenade went off, and then a Chinese machine gun opened up, panicking some of Richardson's men. As they neared the makeshift battalion perimeter, they spotted two American tanks and, instinctively, some of the men climbed on. Americans always moved to their vehicles, Richardson thought, as if the vehicles could save them. He was sure the Chinese would go after the tanks first, so he and Giroux talked most of the men off. The perimeter they were creating, about two hundred yards in diameter, abutted the old battalion CP. They dug quickly into the soft loam the river had left behind, with the three tanks inside giving them a little more firepower and some fragile radio links to other units. Only the tank radios were working by then. They took fire all the rest of that first night, but miraculously the Chinese, who seemed to have it in their power to overrun them at any point, never made another all-out attack. Probably, Richardson thought, the Chinese were as confused as the Americans on that first night, but their confusion, he remembered, did not last into the second day. When the dawn broke, the Americans relaxed slightly. They had outlasted the first attack. The enemy in this war rarely struck during the day, and even if this was their first battle with the Chinese, they doubted that they would be very different from the Koreans. There was still some vestige of hope. One of the last radio messages they had received was that help was on its way. At one point, Chaplain Capon, a man remembered for his remarkable bravery and selflessness, and who would be awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for his heroism, asked Richardson how he was doing. Do you know what day it is? the chaplain wondered. Richardson said he had no idea. It's All Souls Day. Father, Richardson answered, someone better be looking out for our souls because we really need it now. Well, he is. He is, the chaplain replied. First Lieutenant Phil Peterson, who had shared that bottle of communist bubbly with Walt Mayo in Pyongyang, 
was an artillery forward observer with sea battery of the 99th Field Artillery Battalion, which supported the 3rd Battalion of the 8th Regiment and had been attached to King Company of the 3rd, which was set up near the battalion CP. Fifty years later, he believed he could still quote almost to the word how the people at battalion had explained the reports of Chinese being in the area in those hours before the enemy struck. It is assumed that these Chinese are here to protect the North Korean electrical generators up along the Yalu, and you are not to fire on them unless they fire on you. No forward observer is to call in any fire on any electrical installation. It was only after the Chinese hit that Peterson realized how disingenuous the higher headquarters had been in letting them know how dangerous their situation was. What they gave us, he said angrily many years after, was a cover story. That night, about 9 p.m., just before the heavy firing began, some men from one of King Company's outposts brought in a prisoner, complete with quilted jacket. The Korean soldiers attached to King Company could not talk to him. Peterson was sure he had encountered his first Chinese soldier. They were ordered off their hilltop position and told to head toward battalion. It was a confusing maneuver at night, and the company was split up into groups of a dozen or so men each. Then the firing began. Peterson's group was caught in a ditch alongside a rice paddy, with Chinese machine guns hammering away from both ends of the ditch. He hunkered down with a young sergeant who got hit right in the ass and seemed almost amused by it. He told Peterson, the humor was dark because no one expected to make it out of there alive, Look, Lieutenant, I got my million-dollar wound, the one that would send him home. Home at that moment had never seemed farther away. While Peterson was trapped in that ditch, others in the company were trying to move the battery's six 105-millimeter howitzers out. The window on saving their pieces from the enemy was closing fast. By the time they decided on an escape route and got together their little convoy, about sixteen vehicles, trucks carrying the howitzers and jeeps carrying some of the men and some food supplies, it was very late. Unbeknownst to them, the Chinese had already cut the road to the south and were waiting on both sides. Many of them were armed with Thompson submachine guns, a weapon no longer favored by the U.S. Army, but captured or bought by the thousands from their Chinese nationalist enemies in the recently concluded civil war, and a valuable weapon at this moment. The fire on the blocked road was withering. Lieutenant Hank Pettacone, one of the best officers in the unit, a man who had won the Silver Star in World War II, was in the convoy that night, one of the few who lived through it. He later told Peterson they hadn't had a chance, that it was a terrible thing to watch an entire company being wiped out. Much earlier that evening, Pettacone had pleaded with his superiors to start moving out, but they had told him they needed to wait on orders. We can't get any orders, Pettacone had said, because we don't have any communications. We have to act on our own. A few men, like the battery commander, Captain Jack Bolt, riding in the lead in a jeep, managed to make it out because the Chinese held their fire probably waiting to disable a rig carrying a howitzer, not only because it was a bigger prize, but because it might block the road. But of about 180 men in the company, only a handful survived. It was the last convoy that tried to flee the Unsan area. In the meantime, Peterson and his group had retreated slowly toward battalion headquarters, waiting for morning to come. At dawn, they made it to a flat spot about 200 yards from the battalion CP and then, in small groups, raced inside the perimeter. On the night of November 1st, Pappy Miller, his buddy Richard Hedinger, and their platoon were about a mile from battalion headquarters when they got the call telling them to come back. The battalion, indeed the entire regiment, had been told to pull back, though for them the news came a bit late. 
They had just passed an outpost near a bridge when they heard the first automatic weapons fire, and then the enemy was all around them, so Miller hustled the platoon under the bridge and across the river. It was nothing but a dry creek by then. Already tracers were lighting up the area. Most of the men were on the other bank when some grenade fragments hit Miller in the hand. What he remembered was how completely disorganized everything was. Chinese everywhere, seemingly coming from all directions, no clear lines for the Americans to fall back to. He had a sense that the enemy troops were close by, and then, suddenly, they were there, right on top of him and his men. By then, his men had reached a ditch alongside the road, and they took cover in it. Almost all of them, Miller remembered, were new men, replacements just arrived, and none of them had ever seen fighting like this. They mistook the ditch for cover, which it was not, and thought they were safe there when they were not. Nothing was going to be truly safe, not even the higher ground, not even at the battalion CP, but Miller knew that the least safe place of all was that ditch, which now held about thirty-five men, some from his platoon, some from others. So he yelled to his friend, Heck, let's get going before we get killed, and they started forcing everyone out. This was about 3 a.m. on November 2nd, he thought. He was just about to clear the ditch when a Chinese grenade tore his leg apart, shredding muscle and breaking the bones in his foot. He could no longer move. So he lay there, waiting for daylight, waiting to die. He knew there would be no one to carry him. His only chance was to crawl to a battalion aid station that he thought might be nearby, but even a battalion aid station might be overrun by then. It was so cold his breath was condensing, and he feared that the Chinese, searching the bodies as they were sure to, would be able to tell he was alive from his breath. He tried to cover himself with dead enemy bodies. About 2 p.m. on the afternoon of November 2nd, five or six Chinese soldiers, moving through the battlefield, methodically checking American and Chinese bodies, found him. One pointed a rifle at his head. Oh, he thought, I've finally bought the big one. Just then, Father Capon rushed up, pushed the Chinese soldier aside, and saved his life. Miller waited for the Chinese soldier to shoot both Capon and himself, but the chaplain had been so audacious that the soldier seemed in awe of him. Ignoring the enemy soldier, Capon pulled Miller up and hoisted him on his back. Perhaps they would both be prisoners, but he was going to carry Miller as long as he could. The assault of the Chinese had come as a complete surprise to the men in the 8th Regiment's 1st Battalion. In fact, they had already fought the Chinese in a brief skirmish without knowing they were Chinese. For Ray Davis, a 19-year-old corporal with Dog Company in the 1st Battalion, a heavy weapons company, it was a random firefight, the kind that took place all the time. They had arrived in Unsan on October 31st, and he had been part of a company-sized force moving through a rice paddy when they started taking fire from some nearby hills. Davis remembered that he and his men had been rather casual when the firing began. Most of them hadn't even been wearing their helmets. Then both sides had backed off. The real hit came a day and a half later. Davis was part of a heavy machine-gun team, posted on reasonably high ground, on a hill on the south side of a road that wound in an east-west direction. The road was narrow, just wide enough for one ox-cart at a time, and it was by then bumper to bumper with the vehicles of the 8th Cav, a reflection of an army that did all its movement on wheels and so would prove unusually vulnerable to this new enemy. The Chinese, who moved by foot, invariably had easier access to the high ground, while the Americans were fatefully linked by their vehicles to the roads, which were almost always in the valleys. A little after midnight, the Chinese struck with full force. For almost four months, Davis had been in battles where the enemy always had vastly superior numbers, and where the great problem for those in his squad— like so many other machine gunners, had been the way their machine guns tended to wear out from the heavy use. Davis knew this all too well. 
As he had moved from being just an ammo bearer when he first arrived in country to second and then first gunner on the two-man weapon, he had already gone through three or four machine guns. They always needed more firepower because of the sheer numbers of the attacking enemy. The basic infantry weapons they had started out with, the M1 rifle, the carbine, even the machine guns, had not been designed for the force levels they were encountering. Lieutenant Colonel Bob Kane, his battalion commander, once told Davis that the key to this war was that you had to get 100 of the enemy before you could go home. Once you got your 100, that was that. How you proved that you had your 100, Kane never quite explained. Davis had never seen anything quite like this. When the Americans sent up flares, Davis, who had grown up on a farm in upstate New York, saw so many enemy soldiers that he was reminded of nothing so much as wheat waving in a field back home. It was a terrifying sight, all those men. Thousands and thousands, it seemed to him at that moment, coming right at him. If you got one, another would come. If you got one hundred, another one hundred would be right behind them. It put a bitter edge on Kane's joke. Then Davis spotted the men on horseback who seemed to be directing the others. They had bugles, and when the bugles blew, the enemy soldiers would sometimes change the direction of their attack. Davis knew that the handful of men around him had a limited amount of ammo and thus a limited amount of time left. The Americans fired and fired, often at point-blank range, they had, Davis later figured, an hour, at best two, before they ran out of ammo or the machine guns overheated. About 2 a.m., his platoon sergeant came to get him. Davis destroyed his machine gun with his last thermite grenade, and the two of them managed to make it back to a point where their mortars, firing air bursts against the Chinese, offered them some protection. The first thing was to make it through the night. Then, when dawn came, they tried to regroup, somewhat surprised to still be alive. They were completely surrounded. At the hastily created perimeter near the battalion CP, Lieutenant Giroux had emerged as the de facto leader of the encircled men, even though he was seriously wounded. He was a World War II veteran, an experienced infantry officer, and he seemed to have a sense of how limited their possibilities were and how to act as best they could on them while there was still time and still any degree of choice. Working with him were Lieutenant Peterson and his friend Walt Mayo, along with Bill Richardson, who was not an officer but had become in the long trek north from the earliest days of the war a very experienced NCO. From the first hit, they had all understood that it was the Chinese, and that their entire regiment had become the point unit in what was becoming an entirely new war. The men thrown together inside the perimeter had managed to make it through the first night, but it looked very bleak. If help was on the way, as higher headquarters kept saying, there was no sign of it yet. That day a helicopter tried to land to take out some of the wounded, but the fire from Chinese positions was so lethal that it had to fly away after dropping off some medical supplies, mostly small compresses. The desperate men inside the perimeter now faced a double dilemma. How to get out and how to deal with all their wounded. They were also in danger of running out of ammo. In addition, they did not have enough weapons, but a cold, hard estimate told them that that was probably the least of their problems. Enough men were going to be killed that there would soon be weapons for all. Their tiny defensive perimeter was about 70 yards, 70 very flat, very open yards, away from the battalion CP, where most of the wounded had been moved. On midday of November 3rd, Peterson, Mayo, Richardson, and Giroux went over to the CP for a final doomsday kind of meeting. Because he was not an officer, Richardson did not attend the meeting, but he knew what it was about. All the officers, many of them wounded themselves, were talking about a forbidden subject. What to do with the wounded in the terrible final moment that everyone knew was coming. 
The wounded officers were going to have to decide whether to leave themselves behind to the mercies, such as they were, of the enemy. Bromser and Mayo went over to Lieutenant Keyes and said they were going to try to get out. They asked if he could make it, and Keyes answered no. They had to forget about him. He couldn't walk, and he wasn't going to slow the others down. What heartbreaking decisions for young men to make, Richardson had thought at the time and still pondered half a century later. He volunteered to take some men, stay behind, and protect the bunker with the wounded for as long as he could, but the offer was turned down by the wounded officers. No one who was mobile, who might be able to lead, was to be wasted, if that was the word, defending the wounded and the dying. They all knew time was short, that the next hit would be even harder. They could hear the Chinese digging a trench from the riverbed directly into their perimeter, which would allow them to come up right on top of the Americans before they became targets. With Richardson was a particularly tough non-commissioned officer whose name Richardson never learned. Richardson went around collecting grenades from everyone, gave them to the sergeant, and told him that his job was to stop the Chinese dig. The sergeant crawled out there. It was one hell of a brave performance, Richardson thought, the kind of act you're more likely to see in movies than in real life, and personally slowed down the creation of the trench. But the noose was tightening, and talk of relief missions was dying down. They had gotten an airstrike that day, Australians flying B-26s, but time was working against them. There had been one resupply attempt. A small spotter plane had dropped a couple duffel bags about 150 yards beyond the perimeter. Richardson had crawled out and gotten them, but there wasn't much inside, and not what they needed. Lots of ammo, and lots of morphine. Relief was not going to come. Hap Gay, the division commander, who had been arguing for a regimental pullback for days, had sent additional forces north to relieve his men, but they had been hammered by the Chinese, who had picked near-perfect ambush positions to intercept the inevitable relief forces. It was a basic part of the Chinese M.O., to wait for and destroy relief forces. The relief forces were short on both artillery and air power, the two instruments that might give them an advantage when they assaulted the Chinese positions. One of the units sent to try to break through was Lieutenant Colonel Johnny Johnson's 5th Regiment of the Cav, and one of his battalions took 250 casualties. On November 3rd, knowing it was hopeless, Gay, under orders from Milburn at Corps to pull his division back, made what he later called the hardest decision of his career. He ended all relief operations and left the men out there alone. Later in the day, another spotter plane dropped a message telling the besieged men to try to get out as best they could. It was not exactly a comforting message, but Richardson and most of the other men had already assumed they were on their own. When night finally fell, the Chinese again attacked in full force. The besieged Americans fired their bazookas at some of their own stranded vehicles along the road to the south and southwest, setting them afire. It was like creating your own long-lasting flares, and it helped the defense immensely. Once a vehicle was lit up, it burned for a long time. The number of able-bodied men holding the perimeter continued to drop throughout the night, however. They had started with no more than a hundred men, and there were fewer men by the hour and little ammo. By November 4th, Richardson estimated that a quarter of the Americans still fighting were using Chinese burp guns scrounged off dead bodies. The second full night had been another horror. That night, the last tank had departed. Some of the men said it had been ordered out, but others believed it had just taken off, and with it, all radio contact with anyone outside the perimeter ended. That in itself was terrifying. Somehow it symbolized the fact that they had been abandoned. One thing that Peterson remembered vividly from that day was how American bodies piled up around their last machine gun as the Chinese concentrated their fire on it. Early on the morning of the 4th, 
Richardson, Peterson, Mayo, and another soldier were chosen to lead a patrol to see if they could find a way out. Rank did not matter very much. Mayo and Peterson were officers, but they were artillerymen, forward observers, and Richardson had been reminded by Giroux that, though he was an NCO, he probably had the most experience in infantry tactics and to trust his instincts. Peterson remembered a terrible moment before they left. As he crawled past his radio operator, who was lying there badly wounded, the man had said, Lieutenant Peterson, where are you going? Peterson answered that they were looking for a way out so they could get help. Lieutenant Peterson, the man began to plead, please don't leave me. Please don't leave me. You can't leave me here to them. A glance at the man and Peterson knew it was only a matter of hours before he would be dead. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, but we have to go and get help, he said, and crawled off to join the search party. Richardson was sure that there was a way out to the east because the Chinese assaults were all coming from the other three directions, and moving very slowly, they eventually found a riverbed littered with wounded Chinese, and knowing how close so many of their own men, especially the wounded, were to becoming prisoners, Richardson told the men with him, Don't even look like you're thinking of pointing a weapon at them, let alone shooting one. Don't think about it. Those are the truest orders you'll ever get. They stopped at one house where American supplies had briefly been stored. Now it was crowded with wounded Chinese. The wounded Chinese in the house kept whispering something eerie that sounded like shui, shui. The word was shui, Richardson was later told, their word for water. They finally reached a riverbed, only to find even more Chinese, perhaps four to five hundred bombing victims, most of them dead, but some alive or barely alive, holding out cups and begging for water. The Americans were now convinced that they could get through by heading east, and they slipped back to join the other men at the perimeter. For Bill Richardson, the decisions they made after he returned to the perimeter proved the most painful he ever experienced. Nothing that happened in the next few days, or for that matter, in the rest of his life, measured up to it. There were perhaps 150 wounded men there by then, and there was no way any of them could take the dangerous trip out at night under enemy fire in mountainous terrain, at least not without compromising the able-bodied men. All of the wounded in the perimeter knew what was up. None of them wanted to be left behind for the Chinese. Soon after his return, some of them who were still partially ambulatory started coming up to Richardson crying, telling him not to leave them. Please, dear God, not to leave them. Not for the Chinese. Please, dear God, take them. Don't leave them there to die. Was it possible, he wondered, to do your duty? to follow the orders of your superiors, orders you agreed with in the end, and get as many men out as best you could, and yet feel worse about yourself as a human being? Do you ever forgive yourself for some of the things you do in life? It was a question he would still be asking himself a half-century later. He was abandoning so many men he knew, who had fought so well, Giroux had been very good in those first few days, helping create some kind of order, taking care of the more seriously wounded, but he would die in a prison camp. Keyes had waited with the other wounded for the Chinese to arrive, sure that it was all over. When the Chinese finally showed up and one of their men ordered him to stand up, he had tried and fallen over. His legs were useless. He had already cut off his combat boots because his feet were swelling up so badly. He remembered that the Chinese separated the prisoners, putting men like Dr. Anderson and Father Capon, who were ambulatory, in one group, and the others, men like him who could not walk and needed to be carried. He estimated that there were about thirty such men in the group to be borne on litters. Five of the men in his group died from their wounds the first night. Over the next few weeks they kept moving the group from house to house, there was almost nothing to eat, and they had to scrounge to get water. One of the men could crawl, and he brought back a little foul-tasting water in a helmet. 
They got no medical care, not even a Band-Aid or iodine, Keyes remembered, for sixteen days, and even then it was the most primitive kind of care. They moved slowly and at night. His memory was of the Chinese taking them north for about two weeks, and he believed after about two weeks he heard the sound of a river, and he was sure it was the Yalu. Then one night, to his surprise, they turned south and headed toward the American lines. Perhaps they were tired of carrying American prisoners, he later thought. They left their prisoners in a house a few miles north of American positions in late November, and one of Keyes's group, a newcomer who could walk, managed to go farther south to connect with the Americans, who finally sent vehicles to pick them up. All told, Keyes had been a prisoner for just under a month. He was one of the lucky ones, he knew. The men who were ambulatory spent the rest of their time in Korea, more than two years in brutal captivity, and many of them died. He thought that his original group of thirty men had shrunk to about eight before they were rescued. His left leg was broken in four places, and he had fifty-two wounds from a mortar round below his waist. You look like shit, one of the men who rescued him said. But he went through army hospitals, got most of his health back, and eventually spent two years as an advisor in Vietnam. Back at the small American perimeter, those who were going to try to break out made their move a little before 5 p.m. There were about 60 of them, and they made it to the riverbed before cutting south, but it was hard moving. They were behind the Chinese lines now, and the very size of their group made it more likely that they might be spotted. When they reached the main road, known as the MSR, or Main Supply Route, they had to cross it quickly, and Richardson managed to string them out so that they could all do so at once. At one point when they took a break, a sergeant from the intelligence section slipped over and whispered to Richardson that if the two of them took off and just slipped away, they would almost surely make it back to the American lines because they were pros, and they would not be slowed down by all these others, some of whom were clearly amateurs. He was right, and probably one of the officers should have made them do just that, but Richardson knew that it was too late for that now, that he could not desert these men, not at this point, even if it cost him his life. On the morning of November 5th, they stumbled into a Chinese outpost, and there was an exchange of fire. Now that the Chinese knew where they were, they finally broke up. Richardson was the only soldier in his small group with a weapon, a burp gun. He told the others to take off, and just when he thought he had successfully slipped away himself, the Chinese found him and took him prisoner. He was not, as Tokyo had promised, going to be going home for Christmas. He would spend the next two and a half years instead in a series of brutal prison camps, as would Phil Peterson, who got picked up in a similar fashion. Of the eighth cav when it was all over, there were some eight hundred casualties among the estimated twenty-four hundred men in the regiment. Of the ill-fated men of the 3rd Battalion, 800 strong when the battle began, only an estimated 200 made it out. It was the worst defeat of the Korean War thus far, doubly painful because it had taken place after four months of battle, when it seemed the tide had finally turned, when victory was in sight, and it had been inflicted on a much-admired American unit. Suddenly, as if out of nowhere, the Chinese communists had appeared in force and shattered an elite regiment from an elite division. The 8th Cav had lost half its authorized strength at Unsan and a good deal of its equipment, including 12 105mm howitzers, 9 tanks, 125 trucks, and a dozen recoilless rifles. A spokesman for the CAV who talked to reporters two days after the Chinese attack was clearly shaken. We don't know whether they represent the Chinese communist government, he said, but it was a massacre Indian style, like the one that hit Custer at the Little Bighorn. It was a comparison that would occur to others. Pappy Miller, wounded, captured, and then carried by the chaplain, was in a small group of prisoners being moved farther north each night. 
During their trek to a prison camp, they arrived at a place the Chinese were using as a temporary base, and there he saw thousands and thousands of Chinese soldiers, perhaps twenty or thirty thousand. It was like seeing a secret city in North Korea filled with nothing but Chinese soldiers. Privy to a spectacular view of the enemy, he knew how completely the war had changed, but there was no one who mattered whom he could tell. He was on his way to more than two bitter years in a prisoner of war camp in which he would be beaten regularly, denied elemental medical care, and given the barest of rations. The UN forces, whether they liked retrograde movements or not, quickly moved back to positions on the other side of the Chongchun River. There they prepared for another hit by the Chinese forces. But the Chinese had vanished as mysteriously as they had appeared. No one knew where they had gone. They had quietly departed the battlefield and become invisible once again. But they had not, as some people in Tokyo wanted to believe, left the country. They had simply moved into positions hidden away, farther north. There they would wait patiently for the Americans to walk into an even bigger trap, one even farther from their main bases. What had happened at Unsan was just the beginning. The real hit would come farther north in even colder weather in about three weeks. Unsan was a warning, but it was not heeded. In Washington, the president and his principal advisers, who had been anxious for weeks about Chinese intentions, became more nervous than ever. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, responding to President Harry Truman's nervousness, cabled MacArthur on November 3rd, asking him to respond to what appears to be overt intervention in Korea by Chinese Communist forces. What followed in the next few days reflected the growing schism between what MacArthur wanted to do, which was to drive to the Yalu and unify all of Korea, and what Washington wanted to do, which was to avoid a major war with China. For the question of what the Chinese were up to had become the central issue before Washington, and once again MacArthur decided to control the decision-making by controlling the intelligence. Here again, Brigadier General Charles Willoughby was the key player. He deliberately minimized both the number and the intentions of the Chinese troops. On November 3rd, he placed the number of Chinese in country at a minimum of 16,500 and a maximum of 34,500. Some 20,000 men, or roughly two divisions, had hit the Americans at Unsan alone, and at virtually the same time a comparable number of Chinese had hit a marine battalion on the east side of the peninsula, causing quite heavy casualties. In truth, there were some 300,000 men, or 30 divisions, already in country. MacArthur, momentarily shaken by the assault, tried to downplay it, and his response to the JCS cable reflected the Willoughby line. The Chinese, he cabled, were there to help the North Koreans keep a nominal foothold in North Korea and allowed them to salvage something from the wreckage. If he had been somewhat shaken initially by the Chinese attack, now, as they seemed to have vanished, MacArthur became more confident again. General Walton Walker, the commander of the U.S. 8th Army, whose troops had been hit at Unsan, had cabled back to Tokyo after the attack, an ambush and surprise attack by fresh, well-organized and well-trained units, some of which were Chinese Communist forces. Blunter than that, you could not get. The candor of Walker's message did not please MacArthur's headquarters. The general wanted Walker to minimize the danger of the contact with the Chinese and to continue to push north. Business as usual. MacArthur soon came down even harder on Walker, who was increasingly nervous about moving north and who, like the chiefs back in Washington, had wanted to settle for a line at the narrow neck of the peninsula. Why? MacArthur asked Walker, who already feared he was going to be relieved, had the 8th Army broken off contact with the enemy after Unsan and retreated behind the Chongchun River, pushed, as he said, by a few Chinese volunteers. 
Clearly, Walker was to drive forward and continue north, the pressure on him to go ever faster, mounting as the Chinese hid and waited. On November 6th, MacArthur issued a communique in Tokyo saying that the Korean War had been brought to a practical end by the way he had closed the trap north of Pyongyang. Not everyone else was that confident. Many of the senior officers in the Eighth Army, aware of what had happened at Unsan, sensed that it had only been a brief flashing of China's potential. Now more than ever, there was plenty of reason for the people back in Washington to be nervous. As Lieutenant General Matthew B. Ridgway noted later, when the Chinese had first struck, MacArthur had seen it as a calamity and had sent a message to Washington protesting any limitations on bombing the bridges over the Yalu. The ability of the Chinese to cross those bridges, he said, threatens the ultimate destruction of the forces under my command. When the JCS responded to that message by pointing out that the Chinese intervention seemed, in Ridgway's words, to be an accomplished fact, which would surely mean a painful re-evaluation of all UN movements north, MacArthur sent another message, which seemed in stark contrast to his previous one, and in effect told Washington not to worry that the Air Force could protect his men and his forces would be able to destroy any enemy in their way. The drive north would continue. It was the ultimate, fateful moment of the Korean War. Torn between his great dream of conquering all of Korea and the danger to his troops from a formidable new enemy, MacArthur chose to pursue his dream and to put his army at risk. In Washington, the senior players remained frozen. Control of the war... Dean Acheson, the Secretary of State later wrote, had passed first to the Chinese, then to MacArthur, and it now appeared that Washington had no influence at all on the former and marginal influence on the latter. And what was General MacArthur up to in the amazing military maneuver that was unfolding before our eyes, Acheson later wrote. That moment was critical. Extremely able troops from a brand new enemy had shown up on the battlefield, fought well, and then had seemingly vanished from the earth. The most elementary caution, he added, would seem to warn that they might, indeed, probably would, reappear as suddenly and harmfully as they had before. At Sudong, on the other side of the peninsula, the Marines who were part of 10th Corps had been hit very hard in a parallel battle on November 2nd to 4th, and had lost 44 men killed and 162 wounded. They decided that the attack against them had been carefully calculated, as if the Chinese were baiting a trap for them and could not wait for them to push farther north and thus step ever deeper into it. The evidence of Sudong made the developments at Unsan all the more serious and less isolated. This was the last chance to break off the drive north, move back, and avoid a larger war with the Chinese. But Washington did nothing. We sat around, Acheson noted in his memoir, like paralyzed rabbits while MacArthur carried out this nightmare. Part 2. Bleak Days. The Inmingun Drives South. Chapter 2. Less than five months earlier, around June 15, 1950, some six North Korean divisions had moved very quietly into place just above the border with South Korea, joining several units already stationed there. Their training was intensified, but a blackout was placed on all radio transmissions. Quietly and covertly, engineers were put to work reinforcing a number of simple bridges on the main arteries heading south, strengthening them just enough so that they could support the heavy Russian-made T-34 tanks. At the same time, communist workers were feverishly fixing train tracks, which the North Koreans themselves had disassembled when the country was divided at the end of World War II, on lines that ran on a north-south axis. On the evening of the 24th, 
the rains began and continued into the early morning, as some ninety thousand men, more than seven infantry divisions, and one armored brigade of the North Korean People's Army, or In Mingun, as it was known, crossed the 38th parallel and headed south. It was an extremely well-planned, multi-pronged attack. The North Koreans used the main highways, such as they were, and the rail systems to expedite their drive, and in many instances they moved so quickly and successfully that they looped around, stunned rock units before anyone realized what had happened. After the first day, one of their Soviet advisors had offered them the ultimate compliment. They had moved even faster than Russian troops. From the time he was first installed in Pyongyang by the Soviets in 1945, Kim Il-sung, the North Korean leader, had been obsessed with the need to attack the South and unite Korea. He was single-minded on the subject, constantly bringing it up with the one man who could give him permission, the Russian dictator Joseph Stalin. He wanted, he told Stalin in a meeting in late 1949, to touch the South with the point of a bayonet. The pressure on Stalin from Kim had increased dramatically as Mao Zedong came closer to unifying all of China under his revolutionary banner. Mao's successes seemed to heighten Kim's frustrations. Here was Mao about to become a formidable new player on the world stage, and yet Kim was frozen in place in Pyongyang, unable to send his troops south without Soviet permission. He was the incomplete dictator, the man who ruled only half a country. So he pushed and pushed with Stalin. What he was selling was simple and seemingly easy. A communist assault against the South and an easy victory. Kim believed that if he struck with a blitzkrieg-like armored assault, the people of the South would rise up to welcome his troops and the war would effectively be over in a few days. In the past, Stalin had always been cautious in response to Kim's entreaties. The Americans were still in the South, even if only in an advisory capacity, and Stalin remained wary of directly challenging them. Still, Kim, who believed his own propaganda and was contemptuous of Syngman Rhee's American-supported government in the South, proved relentless. He was the most dangerous kind of man, a true believer, absolutely convinced of his own truths. If the Soviets just got out of the way and let him head south, he could conquer the region in virtually no time, he believed, just as Syngman Rhee was convinced that if only the Americans, with their own odious restraints, would get out of his way, he could easily conquer the North. Stalin was not unhappy with a certain level of simmering military tension between the two Koreas, nothing too large, but enough to keep each other off balance. On occasion, he had encouraged Kim to continue hitting Rhee's regime. How is it going, Comrade Kim? he asked at one meeting in the spring of 1949. The Southerners, Kim complained, were making things difficult. There were lots of clashes along the border. What are you talking about? Stalin asked him. Are you short of arms? You must strike the Southerners in the teeth. He pondered that for a moment before adding, Strike them. Strike them. But permission for an invasion was another matter entirely. The Soviet leader was in no rush for an open conflict there. Then a number of exterior developments changed Stalin's attitude, not the least of them the speech Secretary of State Dean Acheson gave on January 12th at the National Press Club in Washington, which seemed to signal that Korea was not part of America's Asian defense perimeter, and which in Moscow was read as implying that the Americans might stay out of any conflict in Korea. The speech was a miscalculation of considerable importance on the part of one of the most tough-minded foreign policy figures of the era, because it so critically affected judgments on the communist side. With China having fallen to the communists, Acheson was trying to explain what American policy in Asia was, and he had ended up giving a very dangerous signal to the communist world. I'm afraid Dean really blew it on that one his old friend Averill Harriman said years later. 
In late 1949 and early 1950, Kim apparently made a number of secret trips to Moscow to push for permission, all the while building up his army. The Russians were in those months taking their own cool look at the stakes involved if Kim went south, and they would finally decide that the Americans would not come in. Mao, meeting with Kim at Stalin's request on the question of what the Americans might do, also agreed that the Americans were unlikely to enter the war to save such a small territory. Therefore, there appeared to be little need for Chinese help. But if the Japanese, still much feared regionally, were ever to enter the war, Mao promised men and material. Events in China also influenced Stalin in his Korean decision. After all, the Americans had not intervened militarily to save their great ally, the Chinese nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek, to whom they had seemed so heavily committed when all of mainland China had seemed at stake. If Mao's war, which had gained so much from peasant support, had been so successful, wouldn't the South Korean peasants support Kim in much the same manner? Wasn't there a precedent here? So gradually, Kim's plan began to gain support in Moscow. When Mao met with Stalin for the first time in Moscow in late 1949, they had discussed Kim's war plan. Stalin suggested transferring some 14,000 soldiers of Korean nationality, then serving in the Chinese Communist Army, back to the North Koreans, and Mao agreed. The request, wrote the historians Sergei Goncharov, John Lewis, and Li Tai Shao, in their groundbreaking study *Uncertain Partners: Stalin, Mao, and the Korean War*. Showed that Stalin was thereby backing the Korean enterprise, but distancing himself from any direct involvement. Stalin was playing a delicate game, flashing a half green, half amber light on the invasion. But since it was still uncertain that everything would go as well as Kim prophesied, he wanted no part of the consequences of a more difficult, costly adventure. Nor did he want his fingerprints directly on it. Mao's final victory in the civil war in October 1949 only intensified Kim's hunger. Now he felt it was his turn. In January 1950, at a luncheon held for a new North Korean ambassador on his way to an assignment in Beijing, Kim again made his pitch to several senior political figures from the Soviet embassy. Now that China was finishing its liberation, he told them. It is the turn of the liberation of the Korean people in the south. He could not sleep at night. He added, so fiercely was he struggling to solve the question of how to unify his country. Then Kim pulled aside General Terenty Shtukov, the de facto Russian ruler of North Korea, and asked him to arrange another meeting with Stalin and afterward with Mao. On January thirtieth, nineteen fifty, eighteen days after the Atchison speech, Stalin cabled Shtukov to tell Kim, "I am ready to help in this matter." Shtukov, in turn, passed the news to Kim, who said he was absolutely delighted. In April nineteen fifty, Kim visited Moscow, determined to end Stalin's remaining doubts. He was accompanied by Pak Hon Yong. A southern communist leader who promised the Soviet dictator that the southerners would rise up en masse at the first signal from the north. Eventually, Pak paid dearly for his optimism and for an uprising that never took place. Some three years after the end of the war, he was quietly taken out and executed. Over a fifteen-day period, from April tenth to April twenty-fifth, Kim and Pak met three times with Stalin. Kim was completely confident of victory. He was, after all, surrounded by people who told him how popular he was and how unpopular he was, and how the people of the South longed for him to invade, just as he was surrounded by people who assured him the reverse was true. But both regimes had been in power for five years, and the Southerners, no matter what their grievances against Ri, also knew a good deal about the oppressiveness of the Pyongyang regime. That was something Kim did not think about, for he was a true believer as a communist and did not think of his regime as oppressive. 
He was convinced that the new Korea rising up in the north was a just, truly democratic country. Nor would the United States intervene, he assured Stalin, because the Americans would not want to risk a major war with Russia and China. As for Mao, the Chinese leader had always supported the liberation of all Korea and had even offered Chinese troops, though Kim was sure he would not need them. At that point, Stalin said he was on Kim's side but would not be able to help him very much because he had other priorities, especially in Europe. If the Americans came in, Kim should not expect the Russians to send troops. If you should get kicked in the teeth, I shall not lift a finger. You have to ask Mao for all the help. It was Kim's job, Stalin said, to turn to Mao, who had a good understanding of Oriental matters for more tangible backing. It was a classic Stalin move. He had withdrawn his opposition, minimized his own contribution, and passed the buck to a new communist government, one that had barely taken power but was beholden to him. He knew he had considerable leverage over Mao, who wanted to make his own country whole but was blocked by the Americans on Taiwan, and thus would need Soviet help if he was to move against the last nationalist redoubt. In fact, Mao had already been busy negotiating with the Soviets on his need for the requisite air and sea power. Kim met Mao in a secret session in Beijing on May 13, 1950. His audacity, indeed what the Chinese saw as his brashness, surprised the Chinese leader somewhat. The next day, Mao received a cable from Stalin confirming his limited support for Kim's invasion. With that... Mao pledged his own support and asked whether Kim wanted the Chinese to send troops to the Korean border just in case the Americans came in. Kim insisted that there was no need for that. Indeed, he had answered arrogantly, Mao later told Shi Tzu, his interpreter. The Chinese were more than a little irritated with him and, above all, his manner. They had thought that he would come to them more modestly, a Korean a representative of a lesser country dealing with the rulers of mighty China, men who had just won their own great war, and they would be the senior partner dealing generously with a junior partner. Instead, he had treated them, they believed, with disrespect, as if he were merely going through a formality as promised to Stalin. He clearly wanted as little in the way of Chinese fingerprints on his great adventure as possible. Kim was confident that it would be over so quickly, in under a month, that the Americans would be unable to deploy their troops, even if they wanted to. Mao suggested that because the Americans were already propping up the Ri regime, and Japan was critical to American policy in Northern Asia, an American entrance should not be entirely ruled out. But Kim had been unmoved by the suggestion. As for aid... He was going to get enough from the Soviets. That appeared to be true. Russian heavy weaponry was already passing through the supply pipeline to Pyongyang. On the eve of battle, Kim's forces would be far better equipped not only than those of Ri, but than most units in the Chinese Communist Army, still using older weapons captured from the Japanese and the Chinese nationalists. Mao had suggested that Kim fight what the writer Shen Zhihua called a quick, decisive war, outflanking the cities, not letting his forces be caught up in urban warfare, striking instead against Ri's military strongpoints. Speed was of the essence. If the Americans entered the war, Mao pledged fatefully, the Chinese would send troops. But the Koreans did not think they would need them. When the meeting with Mao was over, Kim told the Soviet ambassador to China, N. V. Roshchin, in Mao's presence, that Kim and Mao were in complete agreement on his forthcoming offensive. That was not exactly true, and Mao was not pleased that this overconfident younger man, with his limited record of military success, was treating him in such a high-handed manner and professed to speak for him. In those early days, Korea remained very much a Soviet satellite, with the Russians making a deliberate effort to minimize the influence of the Chinese. 
Kim's top advisers, as D-Day approached, were all Russian generals, and they gradually took over the war planning. They considered Kim's early plans for the invasion amateurish, and the plans were redrawn to their specifications. The pro-Chinese members of the Korean Politburo and military were carefully excluded from the more sensitive planning sessions. Some of the heavier weaponry then being moved into the country was sent by sea rather than rail so that it would not have to go through Chinese territory. It was obvious that both the Koreans and the Russians wanted to minimize the Chinese role. Kim had suggested that the invasion begin sometime in mid to late June, before the rainy season hit in full force. Stalin eventually agreed to a date in late June. The last massive shipment of Soviet military gear arrived earlier that month. The closer the North Koreans came to the day of the offensive, the more the Russian hand showed. Kim did not even bother to inform the Chinese authorities that an invasion had begun until June 27th, two days after his troops crossed the 38th parallel. Until then, the Chinese were dependent for news on radio reports. When Kim finally spoke with the Chinese ambassador, he insisted that the South Koreans had attacked first, which the Chinese knew to be a considerable lie. What was interesting about all the positioning in the weeks before the start of the invasion was that even as the forecast was for an easy victory, the tensions and the rivalries between the three nations were very serious, with deep historical roots, and the levels of mutual trust were surprisingly thin. To the Americans and others in the West, this was not a civil war, but a border crossing, a case of one country invading another, and thus a reminder of how the West had failed to halt Hitler's aggression in the days leading up to World War II. To the Chinese, the Russians, and the North Koreans, that was a surprising point of view. They had chosen at that point not to think of the 38th parallel, selected by the Americans and the Russians back in 1945 as the dividing line between the two Koreas as a border at all. That would change a few months later when the American and UN forces crossed the parallel heading north. What they had done on June 25th was, in their view, just one more act in a long-term struggle on the part of the Korean people part of an unfinished civil war like the one underway in Indochina and the one just ended in China. There had been signs of a build-up in the weeks before the assault, but when the American intelligence reports were checked out daily, the signs had somehow slipped through the cracks, buried among the background noise of countless daily charges and countercharges of incidents and counter-incidents produced by a contested border separating two aggressive, very angry antagonists. Still, had they paid closer attention, the American authorities might have recognized that something quite ominous was beginning to take place. A young American intelligence officer named Jack Singlob, who served in China with the Office of Strategic Services, OSS, which had now become the CIA, had been training a number of Korean agents to look for indicators that Pyongyang was up to something more than their normal hit-and-run guerrilla raids. Then he had sent his men north as early border crossers. They were new at the game, and their training was hardly of the highest order, so they had been told to look for the simplest of things. First and most important, any uprooting or displacement of Korean families in the border area, a sign that preparations were underway for which the communist authorities wanted few witnesses. Second, the strengthening or widening of smaller bridges. Third, any work that might indicate a reopening of the north-south rail lines. Singlob's agents were young, but he thought a number of them were surprisingly good. Late that spring, he received a number of very valuable reports that the North Koreans were moving additional elite units up to the border and civilians away from it. In addition, he was being told that there was a good deal of work taking place on the bridges and that some railroad lines near the border were being repaired, often at night. Singlob was sure that buried among all the other bits of intelligence he was getting about endless border incidents, 
something important was taking place. Singlob was working under considerable professional limitations. He could not even operate openly in Korea because he was a former OSS, now CIA agent, and Douglas MacArthur, as well as his chief of intelligence, Brigadier General Charles Willoughby, had hated the OSS. They had kept it out of their theater of operations during World War II. Now they were intent on doing the same with the CIA. Some of that hatred came from MacArthur's well-known Anglophobia, his dislike of the Eastern establishment types who had been so influential in the OSS and effectively dominated it. But some of it was a good deal more practical. If his G2 controlled the intelligence coming out of his theater of operation, then he was more likely to control any decision-making about the theater. He and Willoughby preferred that the Pentagon and the Truman administration be completely dependent upon them for any information about what was going on in their area of Asia, with no countervailing intelligence to limit his hand. Control intelligence, and you control decision-making. That the Tokyo Command was not tuned to what was happening did not surprise George Kennan, who had come away from an earlier trip to Tokyo, deeply suspicious of the quality and competence of MacArthur's staff, especially the intelligence people whom he thought pompous, far too ideological, and dangerously overconfident. When he had mentioned to one senior Air Force officer the geopolitical vulnerability of Korea if American regular ground forces were pulled out, the officer had said there would be no need for ground troops because strategic bombing from Okinawa would take care of any potential enemy. Kennan, who had followed how the Chinese fought in their own civil war, seemingly impervious to enemy air power, was not so sure. Then, in May and June of 1950, some of his people at the State Department's policy planning began picking up soundings that something very big was happening in the communist world and that a large force was going into action soon. At that point, the varying American intelligence agencies placed the entire communist world under intense scrutiny and came away convinced that it was not the Russians nor any of their Eastern European satellites. Perhaps, Kennan thought, it might be Korea. Back from the military came the word that a communist attack there was practically out of the question. The South Korean forces were so well armed and trained that they were clearly superior to those of the North. So when the reports of Singlob's agents were finally integrated into the larger intelligence yield, they came back from Willoughby's shop with an F6 label. Agents not considered trustworthy and reports unlikely to be true, the lowest possible rating. And thus, when the Inmin Gun advanced the morning of June 25th, they caught the South Korean troops and their American advisors completely unaware. It was not close to a fair fight. The North Korean troops were very good and very well equipped. In many instances, their weapons had been newly manufactured in Russia and shipped to them specifically for use in this offensive. The soldiers were well trained, and they outnumbered the South Korean troops almost two to one. Close to half of them were combat tested, some 45,000 Korean nationals who had fought in China having been gradually transferred from the Chinese Communist Army to Inmin Gun units with Mao's approval. These were men who in many cases had been fighting for more than a decade and had survived a war where the other side always had superior weaponry. The Inmin Gun was an exceptionally accurate reflection of the authoritarian society just then taking root in the North. A controlled, disciplined, extremely hierarchical, highly indoctrinated army fighting for a highly controlled, disciplined, hierarchical government. The soldiers were mainly of peasant background, and their grievances were very real. They were embittered against their poverty, against the Japanese who had ruled them so cruelly, against the upper-class Koreans who had collaborated with the Japanese. And now they were indoctrinated against the Americans, who in their minds had replaced the Japanese in the South. They were nothing if not hardened. The dogmas they believed had been repeatedly validated by the cruelty of their own and their families' lives. 
In Seoul, the Americans who were part of the small political and military advisory presence were somewhat slow to react, slow to understand that it was the real thing and that as many as 100,000 North Korean soldiers were in play. The North Korean assault had begun at 4 a.m. on Sunday in Korea or 3 p.m. Saturday in Washington. John Muccio, the American ambassador to South Korea, considered an unusually able State Department official, heard of it four hours after it started when he got a call from one of his top aides. Brace yourself for a shock, Everett Drumright, the American chargé d'affaires in Seoul, told Muccio. The communists are hitting all along the front. Singman Rhee heard of it at 6.30 a.m., which means that for at least an hour and a half he did not alert the Americans. After Muccio spoke to Drumright, they decided to meet at the embassy. On the way over there, he ran into Jack James, a United Press reporter who had intended to do some work and then go on a picnic that day. Muccio told James that he was checking out a report that the North Koreans had attacked all along the border. Just as James entered the embassy, he ran into a friend who worked in military intelligence. What do you hear from the border? the officer asked James. Not very much yet, James replied. What do you hear? Hell, they're supposed to have crossed everywhere except in the 8th Division area, the officer answered. With that, James went to a phone and started making calls frantically, trying to piece it all together. A little later, around 8.45 a.m. Seoul time, one of the Marine Guards, Sergeant Paul Dupris, asked him what was going on. The North Koreans have crossed the border, he answered. That's nothing. That's a common occurrence, Dupris said. Yeah, but this time they've got tanks, James answered. James kept getting more and more details, and at 9.50 a.m. he sent out his first bulletin. He had been moving around the city, and when he returned to the embassy and one of his friends in military intelligence said something about letting Washington know about it, he decided that if it was good enough for them to go with, then it was good enough for him as well. He was careful, he said later, not to hype it, because it was a question of war and there was no need to make more of it than there was, because surely there would be plenty of details in the hours and days that followed. Though U.P. was notoriously cheap, he took it on himself to send the bulletin at urgent rates. Because he moved so quickly, his story was the only one to arrive back in America and make the Sunday morning papers. It began in typical wire service fashion. Urgent. Unpress. New York 25095. James. Fragmentary reports X-38th parallel indicated North Koreans launched Sunday morning attacks generally along entire border, para. Reports at 0930 local time indicated Kaesong, 40 miles northwest Seoul and headquarters of Korean Army's 1st Division, fell 9 a.m. Stop. Enemy forces reported 3 to 4 kilometers south of border on Onjin Peninsula. Stop. Tanks supposed brought into use Chunshun, 50 miles northwest Seoul. In Washington, there were more and more fragmentary reports coming in from the embassy. But it was James's United Press bulletins that alerted the city. As others in the United Press Bureau and soon other newspaper bureaus began calling high public officials to get some kind of confirmation, the top people in government were alerted to the fact that a new and very unwanted war had begun on the Korean Peninsula. When the North Koreans attacked, Douglas MacArthur was surprisingly slow to respond. He seemed almost indifferent to the early news of the invasion, so much so that he worried some of the men around him. Nor were these witnesses committed liberals, the kind of sworn enemies he believed were always out to undermine him for domestic political reasons. They included one of the most conservative men connected to the U.S. national security apparatus, John Foster Dulles, the shadow Republican Secretary of State, then serving as an advisor to the State Department, and John Allison, one of the more hard-line members of the State Department, who was serving as Dulles's aide on a trip to Seoul and Tokyo. By chance, both Dulles and Allison had arrived in Tokyo to discuss a future peace treaty that would formally end the American occupation of Japan when the North Koreans struck. 
Just a few days before the attack, both men had visited a South Korean bunker near the 38th parallel. There, they were photographed huddled with rock troops. Dulles, wearing his signature Homburg, looked like he was on his way to a meeting of top Wall Street bankers. Foster up in a bunker with a Homburg on. It was a very amusing picture, said Secretary of State Dean Acheson, who had no fondness for the man who wanted to take his job and had been sure he was going to get it a mere 18 months earlier when Tom Dewey had run for the presidency. The next day, Dulles, a man possessed of no small amount of grandiosity, blended as it was with a streak of great personal and religious righteousness, had spoken before the South Korean National Assembly. You are not alone, he told the assembly. You will never be alone so long as you continue to play worthily your part in the great design of human freedom. Those words had been specifically written for Dulles and that occasion back in Washington by men who would, in different ways, emerge in the coming months as leading hardliners. Dean Rusk, the new Assistant Secretary of State for the Far East, and Paul Nitze, the head of policy planning. Still, for all the intensity of Dulles's rhetoric, there was no real reason to feel that South Korea was in any great danger. Just a few days earlier, both Dulles and Allison had been briefed by General Willoughby and the subject of a potential North Korean attack had never come up. When the North Koreans struck, Dulles and Allison had an unusually intimate view of MacArthur's headquarters in action, the view of men ideologically sympathetic, but who were not members of MacArthur's inner team. From the start, the news coming in was very bad, yet MacArthur and his staff seemed curiously casual about it. There was a briefing that first Sunday night, June 25th, at which MacArthur seemed far too relaxed. The early reports, he told Dulles and Allison, were inconclusive. This is probably only a reconnaissance in force. If Washington only will not hobble me, I can handle it with one arm tied behind my back, he said. Then he added that President Rhee had asked for some fighter planes and though he thought the Koreans could not use them properly, he intended to send a few along, just for morale purposes. Dulles, Allison thought, seemed momentarily relieved by MacArthur's aura of confidence, but he still wanted to send a cable to Acheson and Rusk, urging immediate help for the South Koreans. But the more Allison and Dulles talked to men outside MacArthur's coterie, the more uneasy they became. That very first night, Allison had gone to dinner with an old friend, Brigadier General Crump Garvin, commander of the port of Yokohama. Garvin startled him by confiding that there had been serious reports coming through 8th Army Intelligence for the past two or three weeks, indicating that civilians near the North Korean side of the parallel were being moved away, and that the North Koreans were concentrating large numbers of troops just above the border. Anyone who read the reports could see something was going to happen, and soon. I don't know what G2 in Tokyo has been doing, Garvin told Allison. On Monday, the gap between reality in the field and that in MacArthur's headquarters seemed to grow wider. Ambassador Muccio, the senior American State Department representative in Korea, had ordered the immediate evacuation of American women and children from the country. MacArthur still on automatic pilot, suggested that it was a premature move. There was, he insisted, no reason to panic in Korea. Yet the news coming in was uniformly bad. That night, the two high-ranking visitors separated, Allison to have dinner with some senior officials in Tokyo, Dulles to attend a private dinner with MacArthur. Allison's dinner party was interrupted by the constant comings and goings of senior journalists and diplomats, all of them checking with their sources during the evening, all coming back with increasingly somber reports. The South Koreans were being routed. At the end of the evening, Allison decided to check in with Dulles, certain that he would know far more from his dinner. I suppose you've heard the bad news from Korea, he began. Dulles had heard nothing. But didn't you have dinner with the general? Yes, Dulles answered, just the two couples. But after dinner they had watched a movie, 
the general's favorite form of entertainment. No one had interrupted their evening. Dulles thereupon called MacArthur to report on what he had heard about the South Korean collapse. The general said he would look into it. This may have been one of the few times in American history when representatives of the State Department have had to tell a high American military commander about what was happening in his own backyard, Allison later wrote. The next day brought yet more signs that a disaster was unfolding in front of them. Ambassador Muccio reported that Seoul was being evacuated, that he and Rhee were about to head south of Taejeon, below the Han River. That day, Dulles and Allison were scheduled to fly back to the United States. While they were waiting at Haneda Airport, a transformed MacArthur joined them. Allison was shocked by the change in the man. The jaunty, confident figure who only two days earlier had spoken of a recon in force in Korea was gone. Now he was completely despondent, as if shrouded in his own darkness. Others in the past had noted the general's tendency toward major mood swings, but Dulles and Allison were nonetheless stunned by the change in his appearance. All Korea is lost, MacArthur proclaimed. The only thing we can do is get our people safely out of the country. I have never seen such a dejected, completely forlorn man as General MacArthur was that Tuesday morning, June 27, 1950, Allison later wrote. Even more disturbing was MacArthur's behavior when their plane was delayed for mechanical reasons. The farewell ceremony seemed to drag on and on, even when a message arrived that the Secretary of the Army wanted a telecom meeting with the General at 1 p.m. Tokyo time. In those days of more primitive communications, a telecom meeting was like a phone conversation done through talking typewriters that conversed with each other. Both Dulles and Allison sensed that the request was an exceptionally important one, Washington desperately needing to talk to its commander in the field to find out what he thought ought to be done in a major crisis. In order to participate, MacArthur needed to leave Haneda immediately. But to their surprise, the general rather airily told his aides that he was busy seeing Dulles off and Washington could talk to his chief of staff. Dulles was appalled and he used a ploy to get MacArthur back to work. He had his party paged and told to board the plane. Only then did MacArthur leave for headquarters. Thereupon, Dulles and his party returned to the VIP room to wait a few hours more. It would be during that teleconference, Allison later learned, that the Truman administration decided to commit U.S. air and sea power to Korea. It was not a comforting beginning. To some, it recalled a comparable lack of preparation in Douglas MacArthur's command before the start of the war with Japan, when he had systematically underestimated the ability of the Japanese to strike at American possessions in the Pacific, and then, because his own command structure was so poorly prepared, had allowed the bombers under his command at Wake Island to be destroyed by Japanese bombers while they sat on the ground nine long hours after the Pearl Harbor attack. Few commanders of any nationality could have borne so large a responsibility for the United States military debacle in the Philippines in 1941-42, yet escaped any share of it, wrote the British historian Max Hastings. Fewer still could have abandoned his doomed command on Bataan and escaped to safety with his own court, complete even unto personal servants, and made good the claim that his own value to his country surpassed that of a symbolic sacrifice alongside his men. The rules that governed other men never really applied to Douglas MacArthur. Chapter 3 when the North Koreans crossed the 38th parallel in full force, General of the Army Douglas MacArthur's attention was then focused almost exclusively on political developments in Japan, where he was doing an exceptional job trying to shape a defeated country into a more egalitarian, democratic society. Right up to the beginning of World War II, Japan had reflected an odd combination of economic and military modernity blended with social and political feudalism. 
MacArthur was trying, with considerable success, to create balancing forces, to bring land reform, labor unions, and rights for women into play. He had been perfectly cast for the occasion. Japan, after the defeat in the Pacific, was like a nation whose god had failed and now sought a new, more secular one. MacArthur, if nothing else, had always wanted to be idolized, and now he had found an entire nation ready to see him as a kind of deity. His touch, for so instinctively autocratic and self-absorbed a man, had been surprisingly nimble in dealing with the defeated nation. He had been shrewd enough to work through the emperor, thus reinforcing the authority of both of them. Though his own instincts were more conservative than liberal, and he was aligned with deeply conservative political elements in America, he had been a surprisingly liberal modern American deity in Japan. Though he had been and would continue to be a serious domestic critic of the New Deal, in Japan he had turned enthusiastically to a group of young liberal New Dealers and given them surprising freedom in shaping post-war Japan. They had had that freedom, their leader Charles Cadiz believed, in no small part because it was the right thing to do and created a better society, but also in part because the more they changed Japan from the old nation to the new, the greater MacArthur's role in the creation would be, the more it would be his Japan. The changes in Japan and the coming of a Japanese peace treaty absorbed almost all of the general's working day. He was paying very little attention to the American troops under his command, the Occupation Army, by then a military force that bore only a passing resemblance to the formidable army that had defeated the Japanese in the Pacific. That his troops were under strength, poorly equipped, and increasingly poorly trained did not seem to bother MacArthur. He paid even less attention to South Korea, the southern half of the former Japanese colony, liberated and divided by American and Russian troops in 1945, the Americans taking their sphere of influence in the south, the Russians theirs in the north. South Korea interested him so little that he had visited it but once, and then briefly, since it had been created. He had ignored the repeated pleas of General John Hodge, the American commander in South Korea, who wanted the Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers, or SCAP, as MacArthur was officially known, far more involved there. Instead, MacArthur ordered the general to use his own best judgment. I am not sufficiently familiar with the local situation to advise you intelligently, but I will support whatever decision you make in this matter he said in reply to one of these requests. It became clear that MacArthur wanted no part of Korea in the period from 1945 to 1950. There were countless cables coming across his desk from Hodge, pleading for his help or his advice. I urgently request your active participation in my difficult position. Fabian Bowers, who was a principal MacArthur aide in those days because of his ability to speak Japanese, remembered Hodge deciding on his own to come to see MacArthur, and being kept waiting for hours, hoping to see the general, only to be told that he was to take care of Korea himself. I wouldn't put my foot in Korea. It belongs to the State Department, MacArthur told Bowers later as he was driven home. They wanted it and got it. They have jurisdiction. I don't. I wouldn't touch it with a ten-foot barge pole. The damn diplomats make the wars and we win them. Why should I save their skin? I won't help Hodge. Let them help themselves. His single visit there had been for the inauguration of the newly installed South Korean president, Syngman Rhee, at which time he had told Rhee rather casually, if grandly, for he had checked with no one in Washington about this pledge, that the United States would defend South Korea if it was attacked, as we would California. His admirers and his staff were unanimous in describing his vigor and energy, rare for a man of seventy. Yet among those who were not part of his inner group, there were serious concerns about his age and health. Even as Japan's defeat became apparent in 1945, some senior military men had already begun to worry about him. 
General Joseph Stilwell, watching MacArthur accept the Japanese surrender aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay that September, had been struck by how badly his hands shook. At first, Stilwell thought it was nerves, but General Walter Kruger, one of MacArthur's senior officers, had assured him it was Parkinson's. Still, thought Stilwell, it looked like hell. There were other signs that his health might be failing. His attention span seemed limited, and sometimes there were significant lapses in it, and he was slow to understand the seriousness of a new challenge. His hearing was known to have slipped badly, and knowledgeable staff aides believed that the Supreme Commander did not readily hold staff meetings for just that reason. Others believed it was the reason that when visitors were granted audiences with him, he tended toward monologues, because he could not hear what others were saying and could not easily engage in two-sided conversations. But older or not, able to work at the level demanded of a combat commander or not, he remained an icon, one with a vast store of political capital. There were all kinds of glitches in his long and often distinguished career, moments when he had been far less than a brilliant commander, and his lesser, more vainglorious self had shown too readily, and others had paid a price for his failings. But he was, in 1950, still a formidable figure, someone who had been a famous and daring commander as far back as World War I had conducted his campaign against the Japanese in the Pacific during World War II with shrewd, careful use of his limited forces, and was, on the occasion of the outbreak of the Korean War, doing an admirable job of modernizing Japan. If MacArthur had little interest in Korea, his attitude toward that unfortunate country was all too typical of his fellow countrymen. Korea was connected neither to the American political process nor to the American psyche. China had long fascinated Americans, many of whom felt a deep, if curious, paternalism toward the poor, struggling Chinese. Japan was alternately admired and feared. Korea, on the other hand, did not fascinate or even interest Americans. A missionary named Homer Hulbert wrote in 1906 that the Koreans have been frequently maligned and seldom appreciated. They are overshadowed by China on the one hand in respect to numbers, and Japan on the other hand in respect to wit. They are neither good merchants like the one, nor good fighters like the other. And yet they are by far the pleasantest people in the East to live amongst. Their failings are such as flow in the wake of ignorance everywhere, and the bettering of their opportunities would bring swift betterment to their condition. In the ensuing four decades, American interest in Korea had not increased greatly. The Russians had entered the Pacific War belatedly, and when the war ended abruptly with the use of the atomic bombs, Korea had been divided at the 38th parallel, almost as an afterthought, the division done in the most casual way at the last minute at the Pentagon. The first American commanders to arrive there, utterly unaware of how much the Koreans loathed their Japanese masters and how cruel the Japanese occupation had been, had at first been willing to use the Japanese police forces to keep the Koreans in line. General Hodge, the first American general who commanded there after the war, a blunt, raw, direct man, had liked neither Korea nor the Koreans, whom he described as being the same breed of cat as the Japanese. The American presence in Korea might have begun in the most casual, indeed careless way, but it brought a powerful new player into the orbit of a country whose geography, rather than its natural wealth, had made it for years the target of powerful, aggressive neighbors. What was new in an old equation, as the historian Bruce Cummings has pointed out, was the arrival of a fresh new power, the United States. It was there in no small part in the years after 1945, because the Russians were also there and then, soon enough, because Korea's security was directly tied to Japan's security. The marriage of Korea, or more accurately, of South Korea, to the Americans, which started in 1945 and was more or less a shotgun affair, 
a product of the Cold War, was therefore not an easy one. It brought an angry client state, still bitter about its recently ended colonial period and embittered about being severed in half, under the hegemony of an awkward new superpower that was not at all sure it wanted to be in the business of empire. To the Koreans, the end of World War II and Japanese colonialism had not brought, as so many had hoped, a great new breath of freedom and a chance to reconstruct their country to their own political contours. That where there had been only one Korea, there were now two, was a grievous injustice by itself in their eyes. Rather than being able to shape their own destiny on their own terms, they had fallen once again under the control of others. The first thing that the people in the South realized was that their country, or more accurately, their half-country, was controlled by people who lived thousands of miles away across a vast ocean, and had almost no interest or knowledge of the country whose future they would now determine. It was in the beginning a relationship filled with tensions and misunderstandings. Only as the Cold War intensified did the relationship become one of genuine mutual value and interest. Without the threat of global communism, America cared nothing about Korea. With that threat, Americans were willing to fight and die for it. Korea was a small, proud country that had the misfortune to lie in the path of three infinitely larger, stronger, more ambitious powers, China, Japan, and Russia. Each of them wanted to use it either as an offensive base from which to assault one of the others, or as a defensive shield to negate the possible aggressive designs of the other two. Long before June 1950, Korea's formidable neighbors had all at some moment favored the right to invade Korea in what they thought of as a defensive move, a precautionary step against one of their rivals. As the unfortunate geography of Poland placed it between Germany and Russia, so Korea's geography was to no small degree its fate. Syngman Rhee, the eventual president of South Korea, liked to cite an old Korean proverb that went, a shrimp is crushed in the Battle of the Whales. For much of its history, the influence of China had fallen over Korea more heavily than that of other hostile countries, but the Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95 to signaled the temporary end of Chinese influence there, as Japan, an ascending power, a nation that was industrializing quickly and was traditionally militaristic, began what was to become a formidable bid for regional domination, in effect, the creation of a new Japanese empire. In 1896, Russia, its sheer size concealing a deep social, political, and economic rot, made a compact with an ever more aggressive Japan, dividing their influence over Korea at, ironically, the 38th parallel. If Russia was a nation that seemed more powerful than it actually was, Japan seemed less powerful than it was. Their agreement would prove the most temporary of solutions. In February of 1904, the Japanese struck against the Russian fleet, eventually destroying it at the Battle of the Tsushima Straits. That battle took place after the Japanese had inflicted comparable defeats on the Russian army in the Pacific and in parts of Russian-occupied Manchuria. The Japanese later justified their assault on Russia's forces in the Far East by pointing to the danger a Russified Korea held out for them. Rikitaro Fujisawa, a prominent Japanese political figure, quoted a friend as saying that the Japanese had to strike against the Russians, because Korea lies like a dagger, ever pointed towards the heart of Japan. Words that could have easily been spoken nearly half a century later by the most senior American national security officials. Then he added in his own words, Korea in the possession of Russia, or even a weak and corrupt Korea which might fall any time an easy prey to the Russian eagle, would place Japan's destiny in the hands of the unscrupulous Colossus of the North. Japan could not accept such a fate. 
that the Russo-Japanese war was not only a defensive war for Japan, but Japan's struggle for her very existence as an independent nation is too obvious to require either elucidation or explanation. It was a great way to justify an offensive war. The Koreans, not the devil, made them do it. It seemed to be part of Korea's national destiny to have little say about its own future. The peacemaker in the Russo-Japanese War was not a Korean, but the President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, who went on to win a Nobel Prize for his efforts, efforts that had very little to do with any concept of greater good for the Koreans. Roosevelt represented a new, ever more muscular America just beginning to manifest itself in a kind of subconscious imperialist impulse. He had been an enthusiastic advocate of the Spanish-American War in 1898, which had brought the United States, the Philippines, as a colony. Roosevelt was very much a man of his time. He believed in and, in fact, popularized the concept of the white man's burden, that is, the obligation of strong, dependable, worthy, Christian, Caucasian powers to rule the less reliable, less worthy, non-white world, and he believed in the parallel duty of the non-white world to let itself be ruled. The one country he exempted from his view of Asian nations and peoples as essentially inferior was Japan. The Japs interest me, and I like them, he wrote a friend at the time. After all, they were, except in skin color, size, and shape of eyes, perilously like Anglo-Saxons, hard-working, disciplined, organized, muscular in their own way, and imperially aggressive. Roosevelt was impressed with the Japanese as being the kind of can-do nation he could admire, entitled to stand on an absolute equality with all the other peoples of the civilized world. All of this put Korea, in the words of Robert Myers, a writer and former intelligence officer with considerable expertise in Korean affairs, in a position not unlike that of a newborn calf, defenseless before the Japanese imperial wolf. The only country that might have made a difference, given Korea's unfortunate geography, was the very distant United States. In fact, back in 1882, the Kingdom of Korea had made a treaty with the United States, and some European nations as well, that called for them to come to Korea's defense if it was attacked. That aid was to remain altogether theoretical. Korea was too far away. The American Navy at the time of the Russo-Japanese War was pitifully small, and in any case, Teddy Roosevelt had his own priorities for Asia, and Korea was not one of them. The United States was not interested in helping Korea, but in securing its own brand-new colonial domain in the Philippines. So, with covert American agreement, the Japanese were allowed to control Korea ever more tightly, as a protectorate after the Russo-Japanese War, and then in 1910 by open, brazen annexation, as a full-fledged Japanese colony. Because he spoke such good English, the young Syngman Rhee had been chosen by some of his countrymen to visit Theodore Roosevelt in the summer of 1905, just as the president was about to negotiate the Russian-Japanese peace treaty. Rhee wanted Roosevelt's help in stopping Japan's colonization of his country. In the words of the journalist historian Joseph Golden, Roosevelt offered Rhee a dose of polite and totally misleading double-talk. He knew that the pro-Japanese elements who ran the Korean embassy in Washington would give Rhee no help, and he did not mention that, even as they were talking, Secretary of State William Howard Taft was on his way to Tokyo to work out a secret treaty giving the Japanese control of Manchuria and Korea, with the Japanese in return pledging the United States a free hand in the Philippines. No wonder that Rhee eventually became, in the eyes of his American associates, so neurotic and distrustful. America betrayed him more than once and lied to him systematically. Eventually, the Japanese, who renamed Korea Chosen, initiated a brutal colonial reign that lasted almost forty years. 
the United States, Roosevelt later wrote in his memoirs, could not do for the Koreans what they were utterly unable to do for themselves. The Japanese colonization of Korea would be an unusually cruel one, but it attracted little attention outside Korea's borders. Ri himself stayed on in America, received a remarkable education for a Korean of his generation, and became a one-man Korean truth squad, with just enough connections to a few well-placed Americans, many of them church-connected, to reach other, more politically influential figures. If those associations gave him a good deal of access and allowed him to press the case for his country's freedom, he always fell short of genuine influence. He had attended graduate school at Princeton as a doctoral candidate in political science, becoming a favorite of its then-president, Woodrow Wilson. Ree was a regular at the informal social gatherings the Wilsons held in their home, where students came together around the Wilson family piano and sang. Ree did not sing, but he liked to share in the warmth of an informal American evening, and Wilson seemed both to like and admire him, introducing him to strangers on occasion as the future redeemer of Korean independence. But the Wilson who presided at Princeton and the Wilson who presided over the United States a little later, and who eventually brought America into World War I, proved to be two very different men. The post-war Paris Peace Conference, which was where Wilson hoped to create a new world order, was among other things supposed to grant colonized countries the right of self-determination. No one was more excited about this prospect than Wilson's old friend and protege, Ree. At this most august gathering, the freedom of his country was going to be raised by his old mentor, who had once seemed to anoint him as the leader of a new independent Korea. To Re, this was the moment he had been waiting for. He hoped to leave America for Paris, to lobby on behalf of his countrymen to his great friend, to loosen the Japanese fist. But Wilson wanted no part of him in Paris. The president, as it happened, needed Japan as a player in Asia, and besides, Japan had chosen sides well during the war, and so was one of the victorious allies, ready to inherit German rights in China. Re thus learned the first rule of global warfare. Nations that ended up on the winning side got to keep their colonies. Those on the losing side had to surrender them. The State Department was told not to give Re a passport. In June 1950, then, there was no small degree of irony in the fact that Americans were now ready to fight and die for Korea. The United States valued Korea, not for its own sake, but because of U.S. fears of what would happen to a neighboring country, Korea's longtime oppressor, Japan, if America did not intervene and answer a communist challenge. In the whimsical, mischievous way that history moves along, Japan was becoming a new ally, just as China had been a seemingly valiant ally, but now was in the process of becoming an enemy. But the prolonged period of Japanese colonialism had exacted a heavy price from the Koreans. It had destroyed any possibility of normal political evolution and modernization there not just the sheer cruelty and oppression of the Japanese presence, but the fact that so many talented politicians had been arrested or murdered, while others, like Ri and his future opponent Kim Il-sung, were driven into exile. Some in the South were contaminated as collaborationists by their connections to the Japanese, during World War II, as Robert Myers has pointed out, the people of the occupied nations of Europe always had the hope that help was coming, that the Allies, who were mighty, were gathering and would end German domination on the continent. Koreans held on to no such hopes. Ten years, twenty years, twenty-five years passed, and there was no gathering force of nations determined to rescue the poor, subjugated Korean people and remove the Japanese from their land. 
Only in December 1941, when Japan overreached and attacked American, British, and Dutch possessions in South and Southeast Asia, were there the first stirrings of hope, and those were slight, given that most of the early victories in the Pacific War belonged to the Japanese. And when the tide began to turn, little news of it filtered down to the Korean people. The Western Allies were coming, if not for the Koreans. Than for their own reasons, and in time their success would spell Japan's doom. But by 1945, the cynicism produced by the occupation had done its work. Many people in the upper and middle classes had, in differing degrees, made their accommodations with the colonizers, accepting Japanese rule and becoming powerless, badly compromised parts of the Japanese power structure. Some Koreans had even begun to admire the Japanese, however cynically, for they were whatever else the first Asians to defeat the white rulers of much of the rest of Asia. In 1945, Korea was virtually a country without political institutions and without indigenous leadership. In the north, when the Red Army swept in, institutions were imposed instantly from the top down by the Russians, as was a new leader, Kim Il Sung. In the south, Ri, who had spent most of his life in exile, would be the American horse, like it or not. He was then seventy years old, intense, egocentric, volatile, fiercely nationalistic, patriotic, virulently anti-communist. And no less authoritarian, he was very much a democrat so long as he had complete control of all the country's democratic institutions, and no one else was allowed to challenge his will. He was what the Japanese and the Americans had made him—a lifetime of betrayal, prison sentences, political exile, and broken promises had changed and hardened him. He was one example of what his country's harsh modern history had done to an ambitious young political figure, as Kim Il Sung, in a very different way, was another example of the same tragic result. Ri had been a political prisoner as a young man and had barely missed being executed. He would eventually get a Harvard degree and the Princeton Ph.D., but his lifetime was filled with hardships and disappointments that, in many ways, resembled the hardships and disappointments of his country. His essentially powerless status as an exile paralleled his country's powerless status as an orphaned nation in the eyes of the great powers. After gaining his doctorate, he had returned briefly to Korea before spending the next thirty-five years in the United States. He became a professional supplicant, not the most healthy of conditions. He had lobbied constantly for a Korea free of colonial bondage, with himself at its head. If he was the most passionate kind of nationalist, he was an equally relentless self-promoter. When he finally took power. His success tended to confirm his monomania. When the war in the Pacific ended in 1945, Ri had one great ace to play, and he had by then waited over three decades to play it: the support of the United States. Since the few Americans who were going to deal with post-war Korea had given almost no thought to the question of its post-war status. Re, with his long-time residency in the United States and his long years of lobbying, turned out to be the only Korean candidate with an American constituency. In addition, he had nurtured a long-standing connection to the Chinese nationalists, who were exceptionally well connected in Washington. In Korea, as in China, the same people seemed to be searching for a leader who was both nationalist and a Christian. Their nationalism had to meet Western religious and political standards. Chiang Kai-shek's backing was the equivalent of a passport to influence in Washington. In fact, Ri became known, for better or worse, both to admirers of Chiang and those who despised him, as Little Chiang. Unlike Chiang, he was a very serious Christian. Ri had, after all, become a Christian in a land that was not Christian, and he had suffered for his faith on many occasions. To some of the Americans who backed him in those early years, his religious beliefs and those of Chiang were of great comfort. 
Though Asian, these were men who were very much like them. When, in the years just before the Korean War, an American diplomat had made a critical comment about Jang and Ri to the influential John Foster Dulles, later to be Dwight D. Eisenhower's Secretary of State, he had answered revealingly, Well, I'll tell you this. No matter what you say about them, these two gentlemen are modern-day equivalents of the founders of the Church. They are Christian gentlemen who have suffered for their faith. It was Jang, among others, who had recommended Ri to Douglas MacArthur, and when Ri finally returned to Korea to take up the country's presidency, he arrived in MacArthur's plane, in itself a defining political statement. The Americans, it seemed, had their man. Or perhaps more accurately, their man had them. Roger Makins, a senior British diplomat friendly to the United States, believed that the Americans in that period, reflecting an isolationist nation being pulled ever so reluctantly into a new role as a world power, always showed a propensity to go for an individual, someone they felt comfortable with. Choosing Re, Makins believed, reflected the fact that Americans have always liked the idea of dealing with a foreign leader who can be identified and perceived as their man. They are much less comfortable with movements. Those most comfortable with Re did not, however, include the Americans in Korea who actually had to deal with him on a daily basis, many of whom came to loathe him. General John Hodge, the unusually rough and undiplomatic commander of American troops in South Korea, despised Re. He considered him, as Clay Blair, the military historian, wrote, devious, emotionally unstable, brutal, corrupt, and wildly unpredictable. Chapter 4 In the North... Kim Il-sung had been installed with a good deal more foresight by his sponsors from the Soviet Union, who had had their eye on Korea for a much longer time. He arrived at the end of World War II through the dictate of Joseph Stalin and through the sheer muscle of the occupying Red Army. Because of that, from the start he employed the brutal model of the Soviet system and was surrounded by Soviet advisors and sponsors. By the spring of 1950, Kim had been in power for almost five years, and for at least two of them he had been pushing with ever greater aggressiveness for his right to invade the South. That invasion was sure to be supported, so Kim promised the Russians, by a spontaneous national uprising all over the South. Two hundred thousand Southern communists and patriots would take up arms as one against Syngman Rhee, who was, in a favorite phrase of the communist vernacular of that era, the running dog of the American imperialists. There was, however, only one person who could give the green light for such an invasion, Stalin himself. Of the three critical players on the communist side of the Korean War, Kim Il-sung had the least legitimacy. Stalin, if he had not been the principal architect of the Russian Revolution, had at least been there from the beginning, a harsh, cruel enforcer who had systematically gathered ever greater power from those around him and, by the post-war years, had guided Soviet totalitarianism for almost a quarter of a century. He had gained immense stature from the victory of Russia's armies over Hitler's Germany, despite his own catastrophic miscalculations about Hitler's intentions, and perhaps even worse, his almost suicidal destruction of the Red Army, purging its high command and destroying its officer corps in the months before Hitler launched his invasion. Whatever his miscalculations, Stalin had become the symbolic leader of the Great Patriotic War, as the Russians called it. Those mistakes, which had allowed the Germans to come so close to defeating Russia, had, ironically enough, made him more of a hero to the Russian people, thereby strengthening his personal hold on his nation and melding its spiritual myths with his own myth of leadership. He came to embody not so much Russia's early defeats, but its very survival at Stalingrad, and then the final triumph of the Red Army in Berlin. 
That victory alone seemed to seal his greatness for ordinary Russians, making him nothing less than a modern incarnation of the legendary czars, and so, for better but mostly for worse, the principal figure of 20th century Russia. Mao Zedong, in 1950 the leader of the revolutionary Chinese government that had come to power after years of oppression, strife, and civil war, might have been, if anything, an even grander figure on the historical landscape. He was the principal architect of the Chinese Revolution and led it through long, difficult days, often against fearsome odds, saving it from the combined forces of Chiang Kai-shek and various warlords. He was both political and military strategist in the Chinese Civil War and the creator of a new kind of warfare where politics and war were constantly linked and blended and where the military side was always an instrument of the political side. His adaptations of Marxist beliefs to a peasant society and his theory of revolution would have a far greater resonance internationally in the second half of the 20th century than anything Stalin had ever done. By the 1960s, Stalin, his crimes against his own people and against those in Eastern Europe now public would seem something of an embarrassment to bright, idealistic young leftists in the West and in the underdeveloped world a leader they preferred to avoid talking about, who represented little but brute power. By contrast, Mao, for a long time, until the darker side of his personality and the terror he had let loose on his own people became better known, was a far more romantic figure, more like the personification of revolution. In those years, he, far more than Stalin, was seen as the leader of the world of the have-nots, against the world of the haves. Kim Il-sung was something of a contradiction, a fierce nationalist who was the creation of an imperial power, the Soviet Union. He was a man who had seethed with the nationalist fervor produced by Japanese colonization and had become, because of that colonial era, a dedicated communist and resilient guerrilla fighter, Yet he was also, from the very beginning, almost completely an instrument, and a quite dutiful one at that, of Soviet policy. Others looked at him and saw little but the Soviet hand on his shoulder. He looked at himself and saw the purest embodiment of Korean nationalism. Certainly, the era in which he had come of age helped shape him. To Kim, there was no contradiction between being a Korean patriot, a dedicated communist, and an instrument of the Russians. All of Korea had been fertile terrain for rebellion because of the Japanese. As their occupation stretched on, a certain fatalism settled in among much of the educated middle class, and many members of the privileged classes reluctantly made their peace with the Japanese and prospered as collaborators. A large number of them would emerge after the war as influential players in what became South Korea, both in business and the military. By contrast, many Koreans whose roots were in the peasantry, who hated the Japanese and had no economic reason to make accommodations, were pulled toward a deeply alienated left. There was, after all, much to feel alienated about, for the Japanese colonization of Korea had been unusually harsh. The Koreans were regarded by the Japanese as a lower species of humanity, all the more inferior for having been so readily conquered. The Japanese, sure of their imperial mission and their superiority as a race, had set out to destroy almost all vestiges of Korean independence. What they wanted was nothing less than to obliterate Korean culture, starting with the language. The official language of Korea was proclaimed to be Japanese. In schools, lessons were to be taught in Japanese. The Japanese language textbook was called the Mother Tongue Reader. Koreans were to take Japanese names. The Korean language was to become a regional dialect, nothing more. What the Japanese, like so many would-be colonialists, were to learn, of course, was that if you want to make something valuable to a conquered people, you need but suppress it. Only then did such ordinary things—history, 
language, local religions, things so easy to take for granted, gain real meaning. The divisions caused by the Japanese colonization went much deeper into the society than most foreigners realized. The country was not merely split at the 38th parallel, but in some ways the separation ran through the entire population. In effect, it had to do with which side any Korean had been on in those heartbreaking times. It helped create all kinds of great internal divisions, ones that would collide during the Korean War. It was not only a border-crossing war, the North invading the South, but something more as well, for there were ghosts from the recent colonized past there, and so long-standing political struggles that had simmered for decades were at stake too. Both sides were out to settle arguments that had, in different ways and under different labels, been on the table for nearly half a century. The unusual harshness of the Japanese rule had also ensured that the nationalists could barely exist on native soil. In a way, much of the story of contemporary Korea flowed from that fact. Those patriots who stayed would generally be tainted in some way or another by association with the Japanese, while those who went into exile were also tainted, or at the very least profoundly affected, by association with the foreign powers, Russian, Chinese, or American, who housed them. As that hopelessly poor, occupied, and colonized Korea had sent Syngman Rhee into his mendicant's exile in America, so on a very different track it had produced Kim Il-sung, whose own family had suffered because of the economic imbalance of the earlier order. Kim had been politicized in his childhood, gone into exile as a boy, and spent much of what should have been his youth struggling against the Japanese. He represented in his own way the rage and bitterness of the country's recent history. He was born Kim Songju in the village of Namri on April 15, 1912, just two years after the Japanese began their colonial era in Korea. If one imagines some child of modern Europe growing up in Holland or France under a Nazi occupation that lasted for the first 33 years of his life, Kim's anger and his rigidity can be better understood. His paternal grandparents lived in a village named Mangyondai, which eventually became known as his family home. In time, he claimed that his great-grandfather had been one of the leaders of an assault on an armed American merchant ship, the General Sherman, that had made the mistake of straying too far up the Daedong River in 1866, and then the even bigger mistake of allowing itself to become grounded, whereupon local Koreans stormed the beached boat and hacked the foreigners to pieces. Whether or not Kim's relative was actually involved is another question, for Kim was always exceptionally creative in upgrading his autobiography, a task he took very seriously. His father, Kim hyong jik came from the peasant class, attending, though not finishing, middle school. At the age of fifteen, the senior Kim married the daughter of the local schoolmaster, then worked as an elementary school teacher, an herbal doctor, and, on occasion, a gravekeeper. His wife, Kang Pan Sok, was seventeen, two years older than her husband. Hers were educated people. There were school teachers and Christian ministers in her lineage. Her people were thought to be less than enthusiastic about the wedding because Kim's station was lower and he had only two acres of land to his name. When Kim Il-sung was born, his father was only seventeen and still lived in his own parents' home. There were Christian missionary connections on both sides of Kim's family, though in the cleansing of his curriculum vitae, he later claimed that his family members were non-believers and that his father went to church only because the Presbyterians offered a missionary school. Believe in a Korean God if you believe in one, he later quoted his father as saying. While the truth of this is unknowable, it was true that in many underdeveloped places in the world, part of the allure of missionaries was the chance they offered for a better education and in time a certain economic advantage. Of the fact that Kim's family was political, there was no doubt. 
His father and two of his uncles were put in jail at different times for independence activities. In 1919, when he was seven, the family, like thousands of highly nationalistic Koreans, became part of a great migration moving across the country's northern border into Manchuria, trying to escape Japanese rule. They settled in the town of Jiangno, where there was a large Korean community, and the young Kim attended Chinese schools, learning the language. When he was eleven, his father sent him back to Korea, so he could have a better sense of his own country and language, even if it was never to be spoken publicly. There he lived for a time with his maternal grandparents, before returning to Manchuria, where he attended a military academy founded by Korean nationalists. Later, he would claim that he was too radical for the school and left after only six months. In any case, he soon moved on to Jilin, a town with a large number of Korean emigres, and a great many Japanese agents as well. These were fertile times for revolutionaries. He and his friends would argue, Kim later said, about which should come first, the revolution to end the economic cruelty or the revolution to end the Japanese occupation. They also discussed whether the revolution could come first in Korea or whether the Koreans would have to wait until Japan itself was taken over by communist forces. Like so many Koreans of his generation, he became more radical as time passed and the hardships inflicted by the Japanese seemed more permanent. His father died in these years and his mother began to work as a seamstress. Kim himself attended a Chinese middle school, where he encountered Sheng Yue, a communist teacher and party member who took an interest in him, opening his own library to the young man. Sheng was soon fired because of his radical views, and eventually became one of the leading historians of communist China. Kim moved steadily to the left, becoming a junior founding member of a communist youth group. In the fall of 1929, at the age of 17, he was arrested by the local Manchurian authorities and imprisoned. He was quite lucky, notes biographer Bradley Martin, that he was not turned over to the Japanese. Six months later, he was released, and the next year he joined the Communist Party, the Chinese Communist Party. Somewhere in that period, it was believed, he took the nom de guerre Kim Il-sung, his critics claimed he stole the name from another noted Korean patriot famed for fighting as a guerrilla, and so enjoyed a ready-made reputation as something of a Korean Robin Hood. Because of this alleged switch in identities, some detractors were convinced that Kim's entire service as a guerrilla fighting in Manchuria was a lie. That was not the case. As in all other things, once he came to power, he exaggerated his role as a guerrilla leader, but he had been a serious opponent of the Japanese starting around 1931, and during those years he had lived a difficult, dangerous life as a guerrilla leader, just barely staying ahead of Japanese troops who were intent on hunting him down. That meant that by the time he was twenty, he had taken up arms against the Japanese, and by the spring of 1932, he had his own guerrilla band. Kim and others like him were part of what was known as the Kapsan Group, named after Manchuria's Kapsan Mountains, where he and other Korean communists had relocated after fleeing their country. The Japanese their hunger for domination in East Asia growing with each success, were extending their colonial mandate into Manchuria, giving it the new name, as it was Japanized, of Manchukuo. Kim's was one of many groups fighting the Japanese, some of them Korean and some of them Chinese. The guerrilla struggle against the Japanese went on for much of a decade, a war with few victories for the guerrillas. The Japanese had many more troops, far better weapons, and, so it seemed to the beleaguered Koreans, unlimited supplies of ammunition. They also had the ability to offer the local peasants a painful choice. Handsome rewards for information on the guerrillas, who were sometimes their friends and countrymen, or, if they failed to cooperate, death. From roughly 1934 to 1940, the Japanese brought ever larger forces into the area and used increasingly brutal methods of persuasion on the local population. 
they finally ground the guerrillas down and drove them into the eastern part of the Soviet Union. During this period, Kim's band joined what was called the Northeast Anti-Japanese United Army, commanded by a Chinese general, Yang Jinyu. The job of the guerrillas was not so much to gain victories as to harass the Japanese and make each of their moves into China a little more difficult. Kim's men were almost all Korean, but in any real sense he was at first operating under the auspices of the Chinese communists. Of the importance of his leadership in that period there was no doubt. His title became grander, battalion and finally division commander, though it is believed that he never led more than three hundred men into battle. But Kim was gaining notoriety. On the communist side there was growing respect for him as a durable, dependable, and valuable guerrilla leader. From the Japanese perspective, he was one of the most wanted Korean guerrilla leaders of the era. By 1935, the Japanese had put a price on his head, and yet he continued to elude them. He was regarded as tough, pragmatic, and from the viewpoint of his superiors, first the Chinese and later the Russians, ideologically trustworthy. The importance of the last quality could not be underestimated, given the fact that though there were powerful ideological bonds between him and his superiors, there were serious national differences, and thus inevitable suspicions. When General Yang was finally captured and killed by the Japanese in 1940, Kim became for a brief time the most wanted guerrilla in the region, with the highest price on his head, 200,000 yen. But with the Japanese forces becoming stronger and stronger, it was also time for retreat. Sometime in this period, probably around 1940, he finally came under Soviet command and tutelage. By 1942, he had been inducted into the Soviet army and sent to a training camp near the village of Voroshilov in the eastern part of the Soviet Union. He soon became a member of a secret battalion of the Soviet army, the 88th Special Independent Sniper Brigade, its job essentially reconnaissance of those Japanese forces that had moved onto Soviet territory though the Soviet Union and Japan were not formally in a state of war. He was a captain at the start and later a battalion commander in the brigade. Given how authoritarian their army was, he was in all ways a Soviet soldier and a de facto Soviet citizen. There were about 200 men in his unit, ethnic Koreans, though some of them had grown up completely under the Russian hand. All of them were very heavily politicized, the process of indoctrination being as important to the Russians as any lessons in military tactics. Political truth always preceded military ability. Sometime during World War II, Kim apparently visited Moscow. The Soviets saw his battalion as one not to fight the Japanese head-on, but to be used for various other roles as the war neared its end, and their forces moved eastward. Kim, like any Korean of his generation, knew that the liberation from the Japanese could not be done without outside help. To him, and he now wore the uniform of a Soviet officer, the Russians were a greatly preferred sponsor to the Chinese, for the Chinese had played a larger unwanted role in Korea's history than the Russians, and Moscow was farther away than Beijing. Besides, by 1944, the Russians looked like sure winners and to be major post-war players, while Mao Zedong's revolutionary movement was still largely confined to an impoverished region of northwest China. In addition, the Soviet model seemed especially attractive to would-be communist leaders from the underdeveloped world because the Russians had actually done it had completed their revolution, defeated their enemies, and in addition had seemingly managed to modernize an archaic state. So Kim became something brand new, a modern Korean patriot and, at the same time, a dedicated, doctrinaire Soviet loyalist. Others might sense a major contradiction there between nationalism and Soviet authoritarianism, but he did not. He was a man who did not doubt the great communist cause, or, more accurately, causes. Theirs and his as well. 
in the beginning the two were the same for him. What was good for the Soviets was good for him and for his career. The quick end to the war caught almost everyone by surprise, the Russians as much as the Americans. Korea was instantly and tentatively divided at the 38th parallel. In came the Red Army, not led by the 88th Sniper Brigade, for Russian troops, not Koreans, were to get the credit for the liberation. The Korean wing of the Red Army would be allowed in only a few weeks later. In the beginning, Kim was the ultimate dependent. He had no other ticket to leadership than the Russians, and that was the way Stalin preferred it in the communist world, all too aware as he was that men with real political constituencies could become difficult and begin to think that they actually were men of true independence. Better to take someone who fit your needs, announce that he was a hero, create a mythic if partially inauthentic history for him, and then install him in power. That was what they did with Kim Il-sung. He did not need to be charismatic, and he most assuredly was not. The party did not need charismatic figures in its satellite states. Yugoslavia's communist ruler, Josip Broz Tito, and Mao Zedong, both of whom Stalin was always dubious about because of their considerable achievements, would eventually prove how dangerous it was to back men of exceptional accomplishment who were powerful national figures. There were no ideological problems with Kim. They had been molding him for years. He had passed all kinds of secret tests, and he was a true believer. What the Russians said about the West, about capitalism, and about Korea dovetailed with what Kim knew from personal experience. Years later, long after Stalin's death, after schism upon schism had torn at the communist world, Kim remained the last great Stalinist in power. Rigid, doctrinaire, inflexible, a man who believed all the old truths even as so many of them had turned out to be false. They were not lies, at least not in Korea, because he could, with the hand and the power of the dictator, make them truths. In the end, he managed to create one of the most tightly controlled, durable, and draconian societies, one of the most truly Stalinist societies in the world. If Joseph Stalin had been born in Korea and had come to power there in the same era, he would have ruled almost exactly like Kim Il-sung and survived just as Kim did till death did him part. North Korea inevitably became a hagiographer's paradise, and Kim Il-sung its one modern legend. There would be no flattery too shameless to be used in describing his wartime heroics, no obstacle that he had not overcome almost single-handedly, no Japanese battalion he had not destroyed all by himself, no other guerrilla fighter whose deeds were worthy of recounting, no sun that had ever risen over his country without his own personal assistance. In North Korea there was a revolution, but it had been imposed on the people. The power that had deeded the country over to the communists was not, as in China, and soon in Indochina, the power of revolutionary ideas executed brilliantly and harshly against a colonial or neo-colonial order during a prolonged and exhausting struggle that had demanded the support of the population. It was instead the raw power of the Red Army, and the decisions were all made back in Moscow, where Kim fitted his sponsor's needs. He was young, he was brave, he had been well indoctrinated. He had no other sponsors. In blunt terms, he owed them big time. In his favor was his lack of a political past. There was nothing to undo and no power base of his own. He could, in a sense, be created from scratch, made into anything the Soviets wanted him to be. What he became in the end was something almost unique in the world, reflecting the cruelty of a Korean childhood, the colonialism of the Japanese, and the isolation and paranoia that afflicted many of his generation in Korea. 
a serious, if embittered, Korean patriot, but a patriot who was also a truly xenophobic, narrow-gauge Korean nationalist, and who, by the time of his death, was cut off from almost all other world leaders, including those in the communist world. Those who might have seemed more likely candidates to lead North Korea, at least to outsiders unfamiliar with how Stalin operated, were in many cases automatically eliminated for their very independence. Some Koreans who had fought alongside Mao's troops for too long a time, no matter how remarkable their wartime activities, were considered tainted by their very closeness to the Chinese. Others were perceived as having ideas and dreams too different from those of the men in the Kremlin. Hyun Chun Hyok, a prominent member of the Korean Communist Party, was soon judged to be too independent and was mysteriously assassinated in late September 1945. He was seated in a truck beside Cho Man Shik, also a popular figure, when the assassin fired. Clearly one Korean politician was being removed from play, and another was being put on warning. It was at virtually the same time as Hyun's assassination that Kim Il-sung was first sighted in Pyongyang, wearing the uniform of a Red Army Major. Kim might be their man, but he was quite an unfinished politician, and he cut a disappointing figure to those Koreans who hungered for someone with more obvious credentials to lead them, and did not want any foreign power, no matter how welcome initially for replacing the Japanese, to bestow a leader on them. The Russians apparently chose to unveil Kim Il-sung first at a small dinner party held at a Pyongyang restaurant in early October 1945. Kim was, one Russian general told the assemblage, a great Korean patriot who had fought valiantly against the Japanese. Among others attending was the far better known Cho Man-shik, a non-violent nationalist known as the Gandhi of Korea. Aware of just how vulnerable he was, Cho was moving as deftly as he could in a political situation that, once again, the Koreans themselves did not control. He appeared at the dinner as a show of accommodation to the Russians. Part of his job was to welcome Kim. Though he was a figure with a far larger constituency, Cho arrived in Russian eyes, with too much baggage from the past, and was not ideologically trustworthy to the newest occupiers of Korea. Bourgeois nationalist was the category the Russians put him into, and it was not an enviable pigeonhole. A bourgeois nationalist was someone who did not understand that all the important decisions were going to be made in Moscow. Perhaps if he had played it right and been genuinely subservient, Cho might have had some brief value to them as a figurehead at the top, carefully isolated from the real levers of power. But as an independent politician, Cho had no chance. General Terenti Stukov, Stalin's man on location, the Tsar of Korea, as he was then known in Pyongyang, thought Cho too anti-Soviet and anti-Stalin and reported as much to Moscow. The dinner in early October was hardly a success. The other Korean politicians present were underwhelmed by Kim's youth and lack of grace. The more crucial introduction, the public one, came in mid-October, at a mass rally in the northern capital, and the day proved something of a disappointment to a large crowd eager for the introduction of an important Korean nationalist. The people had apparently expected to see and hear a venerable leader who had served their cause for many years and who would reflect their own passion for a country now officially free from foreign domination. But it was a Russian show. Kim spoke flatly, in a monotone, in words written by the Russians, and what the crowd heard was a young, rather inarticulate politician with a plain, duck-like voice. One witness thought his suit too small and his haircut too much like that of a Chinese waiter. But what really bothered many in the crowd was his adulation of Stalin and the Soviet Union. All praise went to the mighty and wondrous Red Army. Here they were, 
hoping for distinctly Korean words of freedom, and his words were reflecting a new kind of political obedience. Korean words bent to Russian needs. Too much of the monotonous repetitions which had already worn the people out. There are two very different photos, each of which tells its own truth about that occasion. In the first, Kim, looking young and anxious, is flanked by at least three senior Soviet generals. In the second, doctored version, produced later as Kim was recreating his own mythic story, one of greater personal independence, he is on the same podium. The angle is slightly different, and the three Russian generals have magically disappeared. Choman Shik's days were already numbered. By early 1946, he had disagreed with the Russians on a number of things important to a Korean nationalist, and had thus become, in their eyes, even more of a reactionary. General Stukov had sought and gotten Stalin's permission to purge him. Soon after, he was put under what was ever so gently called protective custody in a hotel in Pyongyang. No one was allowed to see him. In fact, no one ever saw him again. Kim Il-sung finally held power over half a nation, but he was hardly that great or commanding a figure on the world stage, or even, for that matter, the communist one. He lacked the far greater legitimacy of Mao Zedong, who had come to power on his own with little Soviet help, or of Ho Chi Minh, the communist leader in Indochina then mounting a military attack against the French colonialists, the man who became the very embodiment of indigenous Vietnamese nationalism. Instead, for almost a decade after the liberation of Korea, Kim, as Bradley Martin has noted, was to play for his Russian mentors the role of consummate company man, flattering them and carrying out their instructions as they rewarded him by granting him more and more power and autonomy. Kim came quickly to understand and to use the instruments of the modern totalitarian state, police power and fear. Like Stalin, he knew how to divide and conquer and how to remove his enemies, and he knew Stalin's great truth that no one, no matter how seemingly loyal, could ever really be considered trustworthy. Kim quickly grasped, as Stalin and Mao before him had, the need for a national cult of personality, almost one of worship, and in the future he would rival both men in that department. Already a biography, published in 1948, elevated him above all other Korean guerrilla leaders who fought the Japanese. He was our nation's greatest patriotic hero and the son of our people's hopes. The Japanese imperialists, the biography added, hated General Kim Il-sung the most among 30 million Koreans. Less than a year after he had first returned to Korea, a poem, a song of General Kim Il-sung, was published that signaled what was to come. The snowy winds of Manchuria, the long, long nights of the forest, who is the timeless partisan, the peerless patriot, the beneficent liberator of the worthy masses, great son of democratic New Korea. By early 1950, he had systematically taken control of all of the levers of power. The great problem in his mind was that he ruled only half a country. Above all else, he longed to unleash his increasingly powerful, Soviet-trained, Soviet-equipped, well-disciplined army to invade and, to his mind, liberate the South, where hundreds of thousands awaited his strike. He would turn two Koreas into just one. When the North Koreans finally moved on June 25th, their early successes seemed to validate his predictions. Because they were doing so well in the beginning, Kim Il-sung and his top officials continued to treat the representatives of communist China with striking disdain, bordering on contempt. On July 5th, Stalin had suggested that the Chinese send nine divisions to the Chinese side of the Yalu River just in case. The Chinese were already thinking the same way. They were not nearly as confident as Kim of what the Americans would do. In fact, 
A few days earlier, Zhou Enlai had assigned one of his most trusted men, Zhai Junwu, to Pyongyang to strengthen China's ties with the North Koreans. Zhai arrived on July 10th and met immediately with Kim, who told him, If you need anything else, just look for me at any time. Kim in turn deputized one of his top people to give Zhai daily briefings, and with that the North Koreans cut Zhai out of the loop. The briefings turned out to be virtually useless about what you could get from the local foreign news services. A request on the part of the Chinese leadership to send a group of senior Chinese officers to study the battlefield was rejected. Kim was sure there would be no need for their help. Things were going that well. Chapter 5 The South Korean troops were not nearly as well trained or as well prepared. South Korea might well one day be a much stronger, far more dynamic society, but in those first few years it was a less organized, more chaotic one, and the army reflected the government. The officer ranks at the top were riddled with corruption. The rock soldiers lacked motivation and were armed largely with leftover, worn-out World War II weapons. They had little in the way of artillery, almost no armored vehicles, and next to nothing in the way of fighter bombers, because Washington had feared that if it gave Syngman Rhee his weapons wish list, he would order his army to head north the next day. All this reflected the immense uneasiness that existed between Rhee the most irascible, contentious, and independent of totally dependent clients, and the men who thought of themselves as his sponsors. Almost pathologically anti-communist, Rhee wanted more than anything to go to war against the North, or perhaps better still, to bait the richer, more powerful Americans into going to war for him. His goal was the mirror reverse of Kim's to create by any means a unified, independent, non-communist Korea that he would rule. It was another version of the difficult and repetitive lessons the United States was to learn in Asia and had learned first with Zhang. With an Asian leader the Americans had helped install in this new post-colonial era, the more he was in all ways dependent on the United States, the more difficult the relationship was likely to be, because as he was dependent, he would ache to make moves that would prove his independence and would resent what might be considered control on the Americans' part. As the hierarchical and authoritarian In Mingun reflected the North Korea of 1950, so the rocks reflected the troubled nation they represented a subjugated, semi-feudal society still struggling with the burdens of a colonial, feudal past, emerging awkwardly, slowly, and seemingly incompetently from that past, under a volatile, authoritarian leader who believed himself the ultimate democrat. The process of modernization in Korea would come, but it would come more slowly at first in the South than the North, where it came quickly, but where it was a hollow, soulless kind of modernization, one that was inflicted on the population from the top down, a Sovietization of the nation's political, economic, and security apparatus. In the South, it was an infinitely more difficult, more complicated process. In fact, it took the invasion to help South Korea find both form and purpose, Fifty years later, the South would be an admirable, industrially vibrant, ever more democratic society, while the North remained an arid, authoritarian, Sovietized state, surprisingly like the one that existed when the war started. In June 1950, what existed in the South was the most marginal kind of army fighting to defend the most marginal kind of country, a nation that did not yet really exist. The South Korean soldiers were mainly raw, illiterate kids, pulled more often than not unwillingly off streets and farms and told they were soldiers. Most went into battle almost completely untrained. The level of desertion during that first year of the war was staggering. A battle would begin, and vast numbers of rocks would simply disappear, presumably killed or missing in action only to show up weeks or months later, usually without their weapons. 
The officer corps had some remarkably brave young men, but it also became, as Clay Blair noted, a haven for too many venal opportunists who used their newly acquired power for personal gain. Among this element, theft, bribery, blackmail, and kickbacks were commonplace. As a modern army, the rocks, like South Korea itself, had a long way to go on that June day. But in June 1950, no one responsible for the Rock Army was talking about what poor shape it was in. Quite the contrary. The level of self-deception about the quality of this army was surprisingly high among the American advisors and senior people in the Korean Military Advisory Group. This advisory group had as its formal acronym KMAG, which soon, among American combat troops who fought alongside the rocks, would be sardonically and inevitably retranslated as Kiss My Ass Goodbye. The same self-deceptions would, a decade later, be repeated in shockingly similar ways in Vietnam, as all too many senior American officers, men who knew better, publicly described the indigenous army as the best in Asia. In both Korea and Vietnam, Americans feared in all too many instances that if they told the truth, that they were advisors to a badly trained army whose fighting abilities were at best dubious, they would not get their own promotions. General William Lynn Roberts, who had finished his tour as the head of KMAG in the weeks just before the war started, was a rare exception, writing a 2,300-word letter to his superior, Lieutenant General Charles Bolte, on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, in March 1949, on exactly what dismal shape the rocks were in. But because the United States was pulling its own combat units out of Korea for budgetary reasons, the public line would be very different. The Korean army had turned the corner, and its men were better equipped than the Inmingun. That was how Bolte testified to a congressional committee in June 1949. Things had, he added, progressed to a point where American units could be safely withdrawn. Almost no one involved in training the rocks believed that. In the weeks before he left for home in June 1950, Roberts himself bowed to the new Pentagon position and started a publicity campaign designed to sell the excellence of the South Korean forces. Most of his subordinates in the KMAG knew it was, sadly, not true. A KMAG report sent to the Pentagon on June 15, 1950, ten days before the invasion, pointed out that the rocks existed on a bare subsistence level. Much of their gear and many of their weapons were useless. They could defend themselves against attack for at most 15 days. Korea is threatened with the same disaster that befell China, the report concluded. How bad the situation was, hardly a secret throughout the army because of back-channel information networks, caused Major General Frank Keating, ticketed by the Pentagon to replace General Roberts, to retire rather than take the assigned slot. General Roberts had been especially worried about the North Korean Air Force of more than 100 Russian planes. But surprisingly, as a former tank commander, he had not worried nearly as much about their armored units, having concluded that tanks were not very important in a country so self-evidently ill-suited to tank warfare. He was right. It was poor tank country, and American superiority in tank production and tank warfare would not, later in the war, be as decisive as it might have been elsewhere. But in the immediate term he was wrong, for the North Korean tanks, much more than air power, proved to be the decisive weapon in those first few weeks, especially against a tankless force armed with impotent outmoded bazookas. For ordinary infantrymen, no matter how well trained, there was nothing more terrifying than fighting against tanks without tanks of your own or adequate anti-tank weapons. In that sense, it was not the tanks themselves, but simply word that they were coming that spread panic among the South Korean troops in those early critical days. 
For an experienced tanker like Roberts, who knew firsthand the terror the German panzers had evoked among some tankless infantry in the Battle of the Bulge, his apparent indifference to the NKPA, North Korean People's Army, armored forces, was simply inexplicable, Clay Blair wrote. The T-34 was no longer the most modern tank in the Russian arsenal, having been replaced by the Joseph Stalin III, but it was nonetheless an awesome piece of machinery, and the North Koreans had 150 of them. The T-34s had the capacity to dominate any battle in which they appeared in those first few weeks. Some ten years before, the T-34 had played a critical role in the defense of Moscow against the Nazis. General Heinz Guderian, who had commanded the German panzer divisions that had swept so easily across Poland in 1939, had called it the best tank in the world. When it had first appeared on the battlefields of Russia in 1942, the Russians finally began to gain parity with the Germans. It had a low, sloping silhouette, which often had the effect of deflecting enemy shells. It was durable, and it was fast, with a top speed of 32 miles per hour. The T-34 also had an unusually wide tread that kept it from getting stalled in mud and ice, and it possessed an unusually large fuel tank of 100 gallons that allowed it to go up to 150 miles without refueling. It weighed 32 tons, had an 85-millimeter cannon, two 7.62-millimeter machine guns, and very heavy armor plate. Opposing the T-34s, the South Koreans and their American advisors had only old 2.36-inch rocket launchers that had not been particularly good even in World War II. Brigadier General Jim Gavin, who had done a study after the war that cast doubt on their efficiency, thought the basic German rocket launcher infinitely better during that war. Now, five years later, it turned out that the 2.36 bazooka shells not only bounced off the skins of the North Korean tanks, but sometimes did not even explode. No wonder that in those early days, the T-34 broke the back of any rock resistance. By chance, the Americans had just finished work on a new, much-improved 3.5-inch bazooka. The ammunition for it had gone into production on June 10, 1950. On July 12, the first of the new bazookas and instructors assigned to teach the troops how to use them arrived in Korea. When that happened, the immense advantage the In Min Gun enjoyed began to disappear. The In Min Gun had struck against the weakest point in the greater defense perimeter of a would-be superpower, one still undecided on what its real national security responsibilities were going to be. Not surprisingly, the Rocks managed to hold few positions against the furious communist onslaught. It all fell apart very quickly. The In Min Gun took the South Korean capital, Seoul, some 60 miles south of the 38th parallel on June 27th, just two days into their offensive, and the retreating South Korean troops barely had time to blow the bridges over the Han River to give themselves a moment's breathing space. Part 3. Washington Goes to War Chapter 6 When word of the North Korean invasion reached Washington, it was late Saturday evening and the American government, which did not then operate 18 hours a day, seven days a week, was scattered. The president, a man with a great fondness for train travel, had dedicated a new airport, Baltimore Friendship, on Saturday and then flown home to Independence, Missouri. Dean Acheson, the Secretary of State, was on his farm in Maryland, and the other key figures in the government were doing the most banal of weekend things. Acheson had been notified of the North Korean assault by subordinates, and after checking carefully, he alerted Truman. Mr. President, I have very serious news. The North Koreans have invaded South Korea. Truman wanted to return to Washington immediately, but Acheson held him off. The information so far was scant. Besides, 
a late-night flight to Washington, with its special sense of urgency, could create a sense of alarm in other countries, Acheson believed. Still, Acheson emphasized that this one had the feel of the real thing. For the next 36 hours, news from Korea would reach Washington only in spurts. Perhaps the most important early signal of how serious things were came from John Foster Dulles and John Allison, who cabled Truman and Acheson on Sunday morning from Tokyo to say that if the South Koreans could not hold, then the United States should intervene. To sit by while Korea is overrun by unprovoked armed attack would start a disastrous chain of events leading most probably to world war. Coming as it did under Dulles's name, the cable was also a reminder that there were always political considerations to these issues, not that Truman needed any political pressure on this one. His responses were instinctive, almost primal, and politics seemed not to matter to him at first. The moment Truman heard about the invasion, he began to prepare for his return to Washington. Still, he was careful not to vary his schedule. That Sunday morning he visited his brother Vivian's farm as originally planned. Then, in mid-afternoon, he flew back for the first of a series of marathon meetings with his top military and civilian advisors. The first decision to use American air and sea power in Korea to protect American dependents, would, as the North Koreans continued south at an accelerating pace and as South Korean forces crumbled, culminate in a fateful decision by week's end to send in American ground troops. The Harry Truman who flew back to Washington on the afternoon of June 25, 1950, was a man of considerable confidence. He was no longer in Franklin Roosevelt's shadow, and he had already tested himself before the American people in the grandest competition of them all, a presidential election, and triumphed in a great upset. He was increasingly confident of his ability to make decisions, and he liked most of the men around him. George Catlett Marshall, Dean Acheson, Omar Bradley, and Averill Harriman, who had been running errands for him in Europe, but was soon to be a troubleshooter with a wider mandate a man of exceptional value. He was growing ever closer to Acheson, his Secretary of State, and they were soon to forge a relationship virtually unique in modern political annals. He did not doubt that he was up to the job. There was no burden from the past, no inner voice that wondered what Franklin Roosevelt might have done. Harry Truman, whatever else, did not look back. In a way, the critical decisions on Korea had been made before his plane even landed. Almost all of his top advisors knew which way they were going to come down, as did Truman. To a man, the top people in the National Security Council regarded the North Korean crossing as a flagrant violation of the United Nations Charter. One country had invaded another, and if the communist leaders on the other side of the world thought it would be viewed in Washington the way the Civil War in China had been, they were badly mistaken. Instead, the reaction was purely generational among these men whose view of national security had been molded by World War II. The North Korean action stirred memories of another moment at the beginning of another war when the democracies had permitted the crossing of a border and failed to act. Of the many miscalculations made by both sides during the Korean War, perhaps the most egregious on the communist side was the misunderstanding of how the Western democracies, principally the United States, would respond to a North Korean invasion of the South that it would be viewed through the prism of Munich. Truman's thoughts while flying back to Washington were, as he recalled, of how the democracies had failed the last time to stop Mussolini in Ethiopia and the Japanese in Manchuria, and of how easily the French and British might have blocked Hitler's moves into Austria and Czechoslovakia. In his mind, the Soviets had pushed perhaps even ordered the North Koreans to cross the parallel, and he believed that the only language the Russians understood was force. We had to meet them on that basis, he later wrote. It was not so much Korea they thought was important, but how America responded to a communist provocation. 
America's prestige had been instantly placed at stake when the invasion took place, and prestige, Atchison said, when he heard that the North Koreans had crossed the border, is the shadow cast by power, which is of great deterrent importance. Truman was already a hardliner. The five years since the end of World War II had been difficult ones, as two formidable and excessively anxious nations had faced off, each uncomfortable in its new role as a great power, each in its own way essentially isolationist, each governed by an economic system that saw the others as its sworn enemy, each with an apocalyptic vision of the other as a relentless predator sworn to its destruction, both of them fearful and anxious in their new roles in a terrifying new atomic age. Each had its own anxieties, indeed paranoia. A surprisingly cocky, almost ebullient Truman had partially mismeasured Stalin in their first meeting at Potsdam in Germany in late July 1945, after the Allied victory in Europe, and had underestimated his darker side. He had understood some of Stalin's sense of political power. Stalin is as near like Tom Pendergast as any man I know, he had said right after the meeting, referring to the Kansas City political boss who had given him his start in politics, but had to be disabused of his ideas of being able to deal with Stalin. And I liked the little son of a bitch, he said later. But at Potsdam he had hoped a certain kind of Midwestern straightness, a kind of let's-get-everyone's-cards-on-the-table attitude could lead to some kind of acceptable and measured accommodation for the post-war period, perhaps even a modest, if edgy, continuation of the wartime relationship. Those first moves had not worked with Stalin, a man who never put any of his cards on the table, most certainly not with the president of the most powerful capitalist nation in the world. Truman's candor was, of course, not quite as great as he imagined. It was while he was at Potsdam that the first nuclear test took place successfully, something he did not deign to mention, but about which Stalin, because of Soviet spies, knew a great deal. Stalin was a new kind of czar, a people's czar, driven as much by an age-old paranoia, in his case both national and personal, in dealing with the West, a man with little interest or belief in the possibilities of a post-war alliance. By 1950, the Harry Truman who had made that first rather sympathetic run at Stalin was long gone. He had been replaced by a blunt, considerably more suspicious president who felt that the earlier Truman, the one who had ventured to Potsdam, had been an innocent idealist. Stalin, for his part, had gotten Truman as wrong as Truman had gotten him. After they met at Potsdam, Stalin, like various conservative American politicians, had significantly, perhaps dangerously, underestimated the new American president, telling Nikita Khrushchev, then a rising star in the Soviet bureaucracy, that Truman was worthless. A great power chess game had followed the end of the war, inevitably so, given the power vacuum in the world with the collapse of Britain, France, Germany, and Japan, and the disintegration of their empires. By the time of the North Korean invasion, the Cold War had reached its most intense level, save for the nuclear abyss the two powers faced during the Cuban Missile Crisis a dozen years later. For the June 25th invasion came four years after Churchill gave his Iron Curtain speech and two years after the Russian blockade of Berlin and the American airlift to resupply that city. By 1950, the Western Allies were well on their way to the completion of the Marshall Plan and soon the creation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO which the United States saw as a way of strengthening the still war-ravaged and shaky nations of Europe, but which the Communists viewed as part of an attempt to create a great wall of hostile nations ringing them, armed with nuclear weapons. When the Truman administration's top officials convened on June 25th to try to figure out what the invasion meant, other than one half of Korea attacking the other half, they were essentially peering into the dark. These were days when everything the Soviet Union did was clouded in the utmost secrecy, when even the Moscow phone book was a classified document. 
The immediate belief of the people then gathering around the president in Washington was that the invasion was a direct Moscow move, ordered by Stalin and obeyed by his proxies in North Korea. That would turn out not to be true. Years later, it became clear from the opening of archives in Moscow that the driving force for the invasion was the young and overconfident Kim Il-sung, and that the ever-cautious Stalin had somewhat reluctantly gone along with it. At that moment, the administration's Soviet experts considered North Korea simply a Soviet satellite, totally under the Kremlin's thumb, which it largely was, but in this case Stalin was more the accommodator than the instigator. The primary question that concerned Washington at first was, could the invasion be only a feint, the first move in a larger Russian plan of aggression? And if so, what would Stalin's next move be? Was Stalin secretly eyeing Europe or a target in the Middle East? Acheson thought the invasion was a feint to be followed up by a Soviet-supported Chinese strike at Jiang on Taiwan, or, perhaps equally dangerous, a communist counterstrike after a provocation by Jiang. Truman, by contrast, thought the next move might come in Iran. So did Douglas MacArthur, with whom he rarely agreed on anything. On June 26th, Truman, in the company of a few close staffers, walked over to a globe, spun it to the Middle East, and pointed to Iran. Here is where they will start trouble if we aren't careful. Korea is the Greece of the Far East. If we are tough enough now, if we stand up to them like we did in Greece three years ago, they won't take any next steps. But if we just stand by, they'll move into Iran and they'll take over the whole Middle East. There's no telling what they'll do if we don't put up a fight now. When the president had arrived back in Washington in the early evening of the 25th, he was met at the airport by Acheson, Secretary of Defense Lewis Johnson, and Under Secretary of State James Webb. From the moment the three men joined Truman inside his limo, there was no doubt which way the play would go. By God, I'm going to let them have it, Truman said. Johnson quickly responded that he was with Truman. Webb said simply that Truman should look at some of the things the people at State had put together for him. They had multiple recommendations as early responses to the still fragmentary reports from Korea, all of which were bad. They wanted the President to authorize General MacArthur to give the South Koreans such arms as they needed, to use American air and sea power to cover evacuation procedures and to hold Korea's ports, lest they fall to the north in the midst of an evacuation. At the same time, based on the President's future decisions, they wanted the Joint Chiefs to come up with what was militarily necessary to stop the North Koreans. They wanted the Seventh Fleet to move into the Straits of Formosa to block any communist Chinese assault on Taiwan, and also to stop Chang from doing anything to provoke the new government on the mainland. In addition, they believed the United States should initiate military aid programs to support the French in Indochina and offer military aid to Burma and Thailand. When the limo reached Blair House, where the president was then staying, Webb, in a moment alone with Truman, made one other suggestion that they consider separating the Taiwan and Korea decisions, especially since Washington intended to take the case of the North Korean invasion to the UN. If a line was not being crossed on that day, it was most surely being blurred, and it was not necessarily only in Korea. In the years immediately after World War II, there were probably two main issues confronting the policymakers in Washington as they sought to deal with the destruction of the old order and other havoc created by the war. The first and most obvious and most immediate was the need to draw a line against Soviet expansionism in Europe. That was done with great skill and vision, but unfortunately, partially at the expense of the other great issue of the era, one seemingly less immediate and more peripheral in terms of sheer power, how to respond to the end of a colonial age, which found the nation's greatest allies being challenged politically and sometimes militarily by their former colonial possessions. 
On the question of understanding the power of nationalism in the underdeveloped world, cloaked as it sometimes was in a covering of communism, Washington's record was significantly spottier. There were, in fact, two very different kinds of communism posing very different kinds of threats. Hard Soviet communism, driven in Europe by the Red Army, and communism as it was manifested in the Third World, where it became a convenient instrument of anti-colonial forces, who often turned to Moscow, as in Indochina, for help after being rejected by Washington. Whatever else can be said about the North Korean attack, it was an old-fashioned border crossing. But in Indochina, which the United States now began to tie to both Korea and the larger confrontation in Europe, it was a pure colonial war. That night, all the top military and civilian people dined at Blair House. After dinner, they took up the subject of the invasion. Some things were already becoming clear. No one knew how deep the North Korean penetration was, but this was clearly a major invasion and the South Korean forces were not fighting well. They would not be able to hold on their own. After dinner, General Omar Bradley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who had favored pulling American combat troops back from Korea a year earlier because it would be such a terrible place to fight and because it was deemed of so little strategic value, was the first to speak. A line had to be drawn against the communists, he said, and Korea was as good a place to do so as any. Its value had changed overnight. Truman interrupted to say that he agreed completely. In that moment, the die was cast. Bradley added that, given the size of the attack, the Soviets had to be behind it. Then Admiral Forrest Sherman, the Chief of Naval Operations, and General Hoyt Vandenberg, Air Force Chief of Staff, spoke. Each reflected the optimism and dependence Americans felt about their air and naval superiority, as well as each man's belief in the unique powers of his own service. Neither had very much respect for the fighting abilities of the North Korean Army. Each was confident that air and sea power could turn back the North Koreans. But Joe Collins, the Army Chief of Staff, said that based on the reports he was getting, it was likely American ground forces would also be necessary. The commitment of ground troops was a very different, much graver step. Bradley, Collins, and Frank Pace, the Secretary of the Army, all insisted that was not a decision the United States ought to rush into. Bradley would soon note, however, that he had underestimated the force and the ability of the North Koreans. No one believed that the North Koreans were as strong as they turned out to be, he later testified. Slowly, a consensus was building. Air power was needed immediately to slow down the North Korean advance, and the issue should be taken to the UN for its support, though, if need be, the United States would be willing to take unilateral action to stop the invasion. Near the end of the meeting, Webb asked Truman to discuss the political aspects of the situation. We're not going to talk about politics, Truman responded sharply. I'll handle the political affairs. Truman then issued orders for air power to be used to protect the evacuation of American dependents and to contest the North Koreans in the skies above the South. He asked Pace to have MacArthur send a survey team to Korea to find out what was needed militarily, and then, fatefully, he ordered Sherman to send the 7th Fleet from the Philippines into the Formosa Straits between Taiwan and the mainland of China, now in the hands of communists but he said he wanted no announcement made until the fleet was actually in position. The decision on ground troops remained like a dark storm cloud overhead. None of the president's advisors had any faith in the ability of the South Koreans to hold the line. The next day, Truman wrote his wife Bess, still in independence, that it had been a grand trip back once he was in the air. The meeting they had held at Blair House was most successful, but the issue of Korea was a tough one. Haven't been so upset since Greece and Turkey fell into our lap. Let's hope for the best. The idea that Stalin had acquiesced to and not driven the invasion was alien. 
Not that it would have made very much difference. Either way, it was viewed as the same thing. Russians are said to be invading. Red tank units push on Seoul, was the headline in the influential New York Herald Tribune. To some of the top people in the national security world, like Acheson, the news, however unnerving, was, if not a godsend, then something perilously close, because they had badly wanted a massive increase in the defense budget, and prospects had not been promising. They had, in effect, been waiting for something like this to happen, fearful of it, but also sure it would come, and that when it came it might help wake up the country to the new challenges it faced. George Kennan, the nation's leading expert on the Soviets, had not, to his immense frustration, made the cut at the Blair House meetings. The dinner had the effect of defining, by social invitation, so to speak, the group that would be responsibly engaged in the handling of the department's decision in the ensuing days, he later wrote. He was, in his own words, on the sidelines. He had already left behind the job of Director of State's Policy Planning Staff and was essentially on leave, headed for Princeton, to ponder the past instead of the present and the future. Still, fearing that Korea might be a mere feint, Acheson questioned Kennan closely in the next few days about what the Russians were up to. Kennan did not think that this attack represented anything larger. He wrote Acheson that the Soviets were not looking for a larger war with the United States, but they would be delighted to see the United States either bogged down in a profitless and discreditable war, or standing on the sidelines doing nothing, and thus be discredited in the region as the North Koreans conquered the peninsula. The great danger for the United States as it plotted its response, he commented, was not in Europe, but in Asia. There, the Russians might try to get the Chinese involved as their proxies. This meant that Kennan did not see a larger war and felt we should be very careful to set limits on it. This turned out to be sobering and largely prophetic advice from the nation's leading Kremlinologist. When the principals met again at Blair House on the second day, Acheson, already the most important player on Korea except for the president, announced that the Seventh Fleet was now in place and therefore it was time to issue the order for it to protect Taiwan. At the same time, Jang, he noted, was to be told very bluntly to cease all operations against the mainland. The Seventh Fleet officers were to make sure that he complied. Then Acheson began to outline his recommendations, not just for Korea, but for all of Asia. The United States would step up aid to the government in the Philippines, now embroiled in a guerrilla war with the communist-led Huck guerrillas, and do the same for the French, who were fighting the communist-nationalist Viet Minh in a colonial war in Indochina. In Indochina, that was a critical escalation. The United States had originally opposed the idea of the French resuming their colonial rule there, had gone along with it reluctantly under pressure from Paris, and now, four years into that war, just as the French public was beginning to show signs of tiring, the United States was prepared to take on a major share of the financing. Soon the Americans would become the principal backers and financiers of the French. Sending a major military mission to Indochina meant the American toe was being dipped into new waters, those of a bitter colonial war, without anyone imagining, or for that matter, very much caring about the full consequences. Nor was time wasted in doing it. On June 29th, four days after the North Korean crossing, eight C-47 cargo planes flew across the Pacific carrying materiel for the French, the beginning of massive military aid and of what would one day become an ever deeper, ever more melancholy adventure for America. At the Monday night meeting, the Washington policymakers also discussed the possibility of using Jang's troops in Korea. The Generalissimo had already volunteered some of his best soldiers. Truman was intrigued by the offer and at first leaned toward accepting it. Acheson advised strongly against it. He had been thinking about what he considered the Jang problem from the moment the Korean crisis began and was not surprised when Jang's offer came in. He understood that what Jang wanted, 
a widening war that would in some way bring in the Chinese communists, and what the United States wanted, a limited war that China stayed out of, were in no way parallel. The two countries might still be allies, but they wanted very different things. Atchison was absolutely sure he was right on this one. In any case, he had seen quite enough of how Jiang's troops had fought on the mainland to know that he did not want to depend on them in this war, especially against the talented forces who had just defeated them. There were a number of people on the right, including MacArthur, who were fascinated by the idea of using Jiang's troops. Unleashing them was the phrase, but Atchison was not among them, nor in the end were most of the joint chiefs, who had their own purely military wariness. But the administration's political opponents wanted to use them and saw the beginning of the Korean War as a way of striking against the president and his secretary of state, and of tying Korea to an issue on which they were already attacking Truman, the loss of China. Their response was immediate and visceral. On the 26th, Senator Stiles Bridges, an extremely well-connected figure in what was called the China Lobby, rose on the Senate floor to ask, Will we continue appeasement? Will we wait for the dust to settle? A play on an earlier Atchison phrase of waiting for the dust to settle in China in hope that there might eventually be a chance of separating Russia and China. Now is the time to draw the line. Bill Noland of California, so close to the China lobby that he was known as the senator from Formosa, Taiwan, added, If this nation is allowed to succumb to an overt invasion of this kind, there is little chance of stopping communism anywhere on the continent of Asia. And finally, Senator George Molly Malone of Nevada tied the situation to the Hiss case, in which a figure in the State Department, Alger Hiss, had just been convicted of perjury on charges of spying for the Soviets. What had happened in China and was happening now in Korea, Malone said, had been brought on by left-wing advisors to the State Department. While Truman's own response to what had happened when the North Koreans invaded was automatic and almost completely apolitical, it was also true that there were politics at play from the very first. There were, in fact, some divisions within his own administration over the issue of Jiang and whether or not to defend him and the island of Taiwan. Not only was continued support of Jiang becoming a major issue employed by the most hostile of the administration's enemies, but even in the administration's most private meetings it festered. Atchison thought Jiang literally a lost cause, and supporting him a dubious policy, one that would work against the United States in the long run given the changing mood and political face of Asia. But his opposite number at defense, Lewis Johnson, who hoped to succeed Truman as the Democratic candidate for the presidency, was openly pro-Jang. In the minds of some members of the inner Truman group, he was considered a member of the hostile China lobby, someone who had promised Jang's people at the Nationalist Embassy in Washington that he was not only going to neutralize Atchison, but drive him out of government. Not only was his top aide, Paul Griffith, in constant touch with Wellington Ku, the nationalist ambassador and the key figure in the China lobby, but unbeknownst to the rest of the administration, some nine months earlier, Ku had arranged a dinner in Riverdale, New York, for Madame Jiang and Johnson. Johnson's connection to the nationalists was a fact of the administration, and it meant that the criticism of the administration's China policy, heard constantly from the Republicans, was also voiced in-house, and that everything said at the top-level meeting was immediately passed on to the nationalists. That made for an unpleasant in-house struggle, one that hovered over the administration in the early days of the Korean War as the issue of China itself hovered over every decision. It was not a fight that Johnson could win. In political terms, Truman was much closer to Atchison. The president both admired and trusted him and his political judgment and was eventually wary of anything that might expand the war. 
But he also owed Johnson, who almost alone among men with major financial connections had stood with him in the worst days after the 1948 political convention, when no one thought Truman could win the presidency on his own. Johnson had been Truman's principal fundraiser when the Democratic Party coffers were empty, and as a reward, he had gotten defense. From the moment that Truman gathered his team together at Blair House, there had been sharp and unwanted disagreement between Acheson and Johnson over Taiwan, a subject that Johnson had raised. Everyone else at the meeting wanted to concentrate on Korea, but Johnson, who had been trying against the wishes of the President and Acheson to include Taiwan in the American defense perimeter in Asia, now seized on the issue again. American security, he said, was more affected by Taiwan than Korea. Acheson tried to move the subject back to Korea. Finally, Truman broke it off and said they would have dinner. After dinner, Johnson tried again to raise the question of Taiwan, and again Truman cut him off. At the Blair House talks, Zhang's troops were then quickly left behind for a more serious consideration of the situation on the ground. Joe Collins pointed out that the rocks were collapsing. The rock chief of staff had, in Collins's phrase, no fight left in him. They all knew what that meant. There would be a need for American combat troops. But even in World War II, it had been American policy to avoid putting combat troops on the mainland of Asia. Omar Bradley suggested that the president wait a few days before making so fateful a decision. Truman then asked the Joint Chiefs to ponder the question. At one point, reflecting the gravity of the moment, Truman looked at the others with great solemnity and said, I don't want to go to war. But he was also aware that he was coming closer and closer to making that ultimate decision. On the morning of June 27th, he and Acheson met with congressional leaders and went over his decisions so far. The congressional response was generally very favorable. At one point, Alexander Smith, a Republican senator from New Jersey, asked whether Truman was going to request that Congress pass a joint resolution on military action in Korea. It was a good question, and one that, remarkably enough, in two solid days of meetings, no one in the administration had really considered. Politics, they believed, had been put aside, or at least put aside by them. They would take it under advisement, Truman told Smith. Later that day, Truman spoke about it with both Acheson and Averill Harriman, who would become a high-level special aide in the hours immediately after the invasion. Though unlike Acheson, he came from a background of unparalleled wealth, Harriman was always shrewder about American politics. He strongly advised Truman to go for a congressional resolution. Acheson opposed a resolution. The events, he said, demanded speed. Truman a man produced by Congress who surely would have been angered had a president gone over his head on an issue of war and peace, tended to agree with Acheson. He did not want to slow down the process, and his constant struggles with the Congress over the issue of China and Jiang made him wary of dealing with his enemies in the Senate. Three days later, on the morning of June 30th, Truman met again with congressional leaders. This time, Senator Kenneth Wary of Nebraska, hardly the administration's favorite senator, asked bluntly about congressional approval. At an earlier hearing, Acheson had tried to punch him in the nose, and it had to be restrained by one of his own aides. Truman himself liked to call Wary the blockheaded undertaker from Nebraska. Truman tried to put him off. If there is any need for congressional action, I will come to you but I hope we can get those bandits in Korea suppressed without one. That was the ideal time to get some kind of resolution, but soon the moment passed, and the political unanimity that had existed at the hour of the invasion evaporated. As the war became more difficult than originally imagined, the politics of it became more difficult as well, and the support began to fragment. Because Truman had not tried for congressional support, the opposition was off the hook in terms of accepting any responsibility for America's response. 
When Secretary of the Army Frank Pace suggested they go for the resolution, Truman had answered, Frank, it's not necessary. They're all with me. Yes, Mr. President, Pace answered, but we can't be sure they'll be with you over a period of time. For the moment, everyone seemed to be aboard. When the word reached the House that the President had decided to send arms to South Korea, virtually the entire House stood to cheer. Joseph Harsh of the Christian Science Monitor, one of Washington's best and most experienced reporters, wrote, Never before have I felt such a sense of relief and unity pass through the city. The President's advisors all knew that week that they were moving closer and closer to using ground troops on the Asian mainland, the last thing anyone, civilian or military, wanted to do, and it weighed more heavily on them each day. American air and sea power was not going to get it done. MacArthur had been ordered, if he could ever be said to be ordered, to go to Korea and report back on what was needed to hold the line there. Now, very early in the morning of June 30th, the word from Tokyo was about to come in, and they already knew that it was not going to be good. At about 1.30 a.m. Washington time, John Muccio notified Atchison that MacArthur was going to ask for greater force. Things were desperate on the peninsula, Muccio said. That set the stage for MacArthur's cable asking for troops. An hour and a half later, MacArthur, who had just returned from his tour of Korea, reported to the Joint Chiefs that the United States needed drastically increased forces there. These were his fateful words. The only assurance for the holding of the present line and the ability to regain the lost ground is through the introduction of U.S. ground forces into the Korean battle area. To continue to utilize the forces of our air and navy without an effective ground element cannot be decisive. He wanted, MacArthur said, to introduce a regimental combat team immediately to fight in some already contested areas, and then, as quickly as possible, to arrange for up to two divisions from his forces in Japan to undertake a counteroffensive. Unless they did this, he said, our mission will at best be needlessly costly in life, money, and prestige. At worse, sick, it might even be doomed to failure. In Washington, Dean Rusk, the Assistant Secretary of State for the Far East, and Joe Collins, the Army Chief of Staff, were working their end of the teleconference between roughly 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. But because they were, relatively speaking, lower-level officials and the hour was early, it turned out to be a slow and clumsy process. Higher authorization was always needed. These were not minor issues posed by Tokyo. They were about nothing less than war and peace. Answers did not come quickly. There were delays on a number of points, and this did not please MacArthur. This is an outrage. When I was chief of staff, I could get Herbert Hoover off the can to talk to me. But here... Not just the Chief of Staff of the Army delays, but the Secretary of the Army and the Secretary of Defense. They've got so much lead in there that it's inexcusable. At about 4.30 a.m. Washington time, MacArthur confirmed his request for ground troops to Collins, and Collins called Pace, who in turn called Truman. Truman was always an early riser. His internal farm boy clock had never left him. He was shaved by the time he got Pace's call. Just before 5 a.m. on the morning of June 30, 1950, he approved the use of American ground troops in Korea. With that, the deed was done. In the very beginning, MacArthur had said that he could easily handle the invasion if only Washington would leave him alone. Now he said he needed two divisions to do it. He was, it would turn out, still underrating the enemy and overrating the forces who would serve under his own command, including American troops. Truman still wondered if there were a plus sign to the offer of Jang's troops. He then called in Atchison, Harriman, Johnson, and the Joint Chiefs to talk one last time about using them. With the South Korean army falling apart, Jang's offer still made some sense to the President as a stopgap measure. 
Acheson was sure it would bring the Chinese communists into the war, and the Joint Chiefs wanted no part of it either. Amid the gloom, there was one upbeat note. U.S. troops would fight under a United Nations flag. Before Truman approved the use of American ground troops, he had already gotten U.N. authorization, easier then than it would be in any decade to come. The U.N. of 1950 was still very much a reflection of American and Western European interests, the only significant dissent coming from the Soviets and their satellites. It was in some ways very much a last vestige of a white man's world. On the Security Council vote to authorize the use of force in Korea, the only two abstentions were by non-white countries, India and Egypt. Beginning in the late 1950s and accelerating into the 1960s, the coming of the end of the colonial era and the arrival of newly independent African and Asian and Middle Eastern nations would change the UN's makeup dramatically, greatly diminishing Western influence and turning it into an organization that conservative political factions in the United States and Western Europe absolutely scorned. The Russians had foolishly boycotted the Security Council meetings on Korea, ironically because they were protesting the fact that the Chinese nationalists were still on the council. And with their veto gone, the Americans got the resolution they wanted on Tuesday, June 27th, eventually giving the predominantly American force a UN flag under which to fight. Chapter 7 the United States was going to go to war in Korea, and Harry Truman was quite reluctantly going to have to be the commander-in-chief, dealing with a war he did not want, in a part of the world his national security people had not thought important, and relying from the start on a commander in the field whom he did not like, and who in turn did not respect him. The stars were not properly aligned from the start. Three days after the Korean War broke out, Dwight Eisenhower, then the president of Columbia University, dropped by the Pentagon to talk about the Korean command with Lieutenant General Matt Ridgway, then deputy chief of staff for administration, but the most respected of the new generation of senior officers, and thus the man a number of senior officers thought the ideal candidate to be the battlefield commander in Korea under MacArthur. Few men knew better than Eisenhower how MacArthur operated. He had been MacArthur's aide in both Washington and Manila, and was intimately aware of just how shrewdly MacArthur rationed the truth when he reported back to the civilian and military world in Washington. Eisenhower told Ridgway that they badly needed a younger general out there, rather than, as he put it, an untouchable, whose actions you cannot predict and who will himself decide what information he wants Washington to have and what he will withhold. There was, Eisenhower later wrote, a clear line between military and political affairs, which almost all senior officers scrupulously observed, but if General MacArthur recognized the existence of that line, he usually chose to ignore it. MacArthur had acted throughout his life, as Max Hastings once wrote, on the assumption that the rules made for lesser men had no relevance to himself. MacArthur's unsettling performance in those first few days, what Dulles and Allison had witnessed when the North Koreans first struck, was never seen by ordinary Americans. Instead, MacArthur's public mystique remained largely unblemished among the senior media people, especially publishers and editors, the men at the top whom he had courted for so long. Four days after the invasion began, the New York Times typically ran a glowing editorial on the nation's good fortune in having MacArthur on the spot. Fate could not have chosen a man better qualified to command the unreserved confidence of the people of this country. Here is a superb strategist and an inspired leader, a man of infinite patience and quiet stability under adverse pressures, a man equally capable of bold and decisive action. He was seventy years old, the senior officer in the American Army. Only God, it was said, was senior to MacArthur, the aging wunderkind of West Point. 
As a young man, he had begun his career with scores that were among the highest ever posted there. 98.14 for the four years, and he had more than lived up to the promise of those grades. He had always been the youngest officer to attain whatever position he attained. Not just the youngest division commander in France in World War I, but also the youngest superintendent of West Point, and a modern liberalizing force there, youngest army chief of staff, youngest major general, and youngest man ever to be a full general. His good press did not come through happenstance. It was not just the extraordinary career and the sheer length of it. It was the immense amount of energy he had always put into making sure that his image was the proper one, that he got the maximum amount of credit for any victory, while his subordinates received as little credit as possible. He was the most theatrical of men, busy at all times, not merely being a general, but doing it in the most dramatic way possible. The great MacArthur, who played in nothing less than the theater of history, as if life were always a stage and the world his audience. The Times center liberal in its editorial page, enthusiastic as its homage to MacArthur seemed, was not nearly as fulsome in its praise of the general as Time magazine. Given the passion of its founder and editor, Henry Luce, for China and Chiang Kai-shek, Time was already closely connected to what was coming to be known as the China lobby, those Americans who saw China and Chiang Kai-shek as one and the same, and believed the administration was sending inadequate amounts of aid to Chiang. Time, at the height of its political and social influence in the late 1940s and 1950s, was far more Asia-first in its vision of the world than most other American periodicals of that era, in no small part because Luce himself was a mishkid. That is, the son of a missionary who had proselytized in China. Zhang, perhaps other than Winston Churchill, was Luce's favorite world leader, while Douglas MacArthur was probably his favorite general, because of their shared belief in the primacy of Asia and their parallel feeling that other internationalists paid too little attention to it. When time put MacArthur on the cover on July 10, 1950, right after the North Koreans struck, and appearing on its cover was extremely important in those years, it was his seventh time, placing him in a dead heat with Jang himself. The copy for the piece, even for a much-favored general, set a new standard in journalistic hagiography. Inside the Daiichi building, once the heart of a Japanese insurance empire, bleary-eyed staff officers looked up from stacks of paper, whispered proudly, God, the man is great. General Almond, his chief of staff, said straight out, He's the greatest man alive. And Reverend Air Force General George Straitmeyer put it as strongly as it could be put, He's the greatest man in history. Not everyone agreed, of course. If he was successful in his courtship of publishers and editors, Working reporters were often put off by MacArthur's grandiosity and vainglory, and many of them came to despise the sycophantic ambiance of his staff. A meeting with him was not just a briefing. It was likely to be a performance as well, the energy and care put into it geared to the importance of the visitor. The problem with MacArthur, General Joseph Stilwell told Frank Dorn, one of his top aides, was that he had been a general too long. Stilwell was speaking in 1944, before MacArthur became the American-approved emperor of an occupied Japan. He got his first star in 1918, and that means he's had almost 30 years as a general, Stilwell said. 30 years of people playing to him and kissing his ass and doing what he wants. That's not good for anyone. By 1950, MacArthur was so grand a figure that everyone had to play by his rules. In effect, he had created not only his own little army within a larger army, which he alone was allowed to command, but his own little world where he alone could govern. 
Any instructions or orders or even suggestions from Washington were more often than not ignored, even if they came from the general's nominal superiors, men who, in his own view of the hierarchy, were not superior to him and therefore had no right to question him or give him orders. He had created a dangerously self-isolating little world, one of total social, political, and military separation from everyone and everything else, where no one dared dissent. The men around him were all in awe of him. Those who were not in awe of him tended not to last very long in his headquarters. Visitors who arrived at his headquarters at the Daiichi building and were deemed worthy of a meeting with him always got the performance. In the performance, he often practiced that morning in front of a mirror clad in his bathrobe, he spoke with great confidence and certainty about future events that most men, no matter how knowledgeable, approached with a degree of caution, aware of the tricks that history played. The performances were often quite dazzling, well rehearsed, but delivered as if they were impromptu. He was the most gifted of monologists. But there was an airless quality to it all. Everything was too finely controlled, too carefully calculated and orchestrated in a world where events could never be controlled and orchestrated, and where many of the forces at play were new and hostile and very different from the forces at play in the earlier century. Given the unofficial rules of the Daiichi, he talked, you listened, no one dared challenge his grandiose statements, his role as a kind of self-proclaimed prophet of what was happening in the world, of what Russia and China were doing and what was happening in America, a country he had largely lost touch with and never entirely understood. There was, sadly, one vital quality for any successful general that he lacked. He did not know how to listen, nor did he want to. Nothing had revealed that quite so clearly as the moment in 1948 when George Kennan had been sent out from Washington to work on issues of political reform and economic rehabilitation in Japan. At that moment, most senior commanders or high-ranking diplomats, especially those operating on the edge of the Soviet Union, would have been thrilled to have Kennan around for even a short period of time, even if they did not always agree with him. He was at the height of his own new fame. He was considered the leading expert in the government on the subject of the Soviet Union and its intentions. Of Kennan's intellect and clarity of mind there could be no doubt. That his knowledge of Russia, the Soviet Union, and China, their histories and their politics, was superb, there could also be no doubt. He might still be relatively young, just starting the middle part of his career, but he was obviously a towering figure, with the most practical kind of intellect. But Kennan could never get across the moat with MacArthur. He was too close to people MacArthur loathed. There was to be no give and take. In fact, Kennan was shocked by what he found in Tokyo. MacArthur, he noted, was so distant and full of mistrust toward the incumbent administration that Kennan's own job was like nothing more than that of an envoy charged with opening up communications and arranging the establishment of diplomatic relations with a hostile and suspicious foreign government. Harry Truman was the accidental president, but Douglas MacArthur was in no way the accidental general. Far more than most men, Douglas MacArthur was what he had been raised to be. It began with his father, Arthur MacArthur, a formidable figure in his own right, a heroic officer with the Union Army during the Civil War and later a major player during the Philippine insurrection. Even more important, the elder MacArthur was a towering mythical figure in the eyes of his son, that myth being created and orchestrated shrewdly and constantly by Pinky MacArthur, wife of Arthur and mother of Douglas. She was the principal architect, in the wake of her husband's death and his bitterness over the way his career had ended, of her son's career, his singular unwavering ambition and his almost unique self-absorption. Though much of the drive that Douglas MacArthur eventually exhibited came from his mother, Arthur MacArthur was himself 
hardly a shy or modest figure. He had a most unfortunate need to be right at all times. He was, in his own view, virtually without peer, not just in terms of his military skills, but also, hardly less important, in his political judgments. Arthur MacArthur, said his aide Colonel Enoch Crowder, was the most flamboyantly egotistical man I had ever seen, until I met his son. His career was both brilliant and, at times, extremely difficult. There were moments when it was meteoric and moments when it seemed to languish. At the time of his retirement, there was almost no army position of significance he had not filled, no rank he had not gained, no medal offered by his country that he had not won. He had ended his military life a three-star general, the highest rank possible then, a Congressional Medal of Honor winner, but fiercely disappointed with his career with the army, and with a political structure he had struggled against for years. By all rights, he should have been buried in Arlington National Cemetery, but he was so embittered politically, so alienated from the men running the country at the time of his death, that he refused to be buried there. Arthur MacArthur was, in the end, a great American patriot who had become, in some curious, twisted way, virtually anti-American. It was as if there were something dark in his soul, something far too focused on self in a profession where great sacrifices are made and risks taken for ideals and concepts much larger than self. His successes and rewards, and there were so many of them, were never enough. It was only what he did not attain that he could remember at the end. Of his son, too, many of the same things could also have been said. If he did not control it, if he did not have his way, he was, in the end, willing to destroy it. Many senior military officers charged with working in difficult situations with civilian authorities have come to dislike or at least to distrust politicians. The two cultures are vastly different, and often the best of our military men are good precisely because they cannot, like politicians, bend with events. In the case of Arthur MacArthur, however, it was far more than the normal wariness and distrust. It was nothing less than a pathology. No matter what any civilian wanted or who he was, Arthur MacArthur seemed compelled to resist. How Washington treated him was all that mattered. In his late years, he spoke constantly about the evils of politicians, and it was an attitude he passed on to his son. Douglas MacArthur, as he began his own career, had a doubly hard race to run. Not only would he have to match his father's remarkable accomplishments, but he would also have to gain vengeance for all the disappointments in his father's life, and to even the score with all who might have wounded or slighted him. That was, it would turn out, too much to ask of any man. The lives and careers of father and son stretched over more than an entire century in American life, a critical period in which the size of the country, as well as its military, economic, and political power, grew exponentially. Arthur MacArthur was born in 1845 and became a hero at 18 in the Civil War. Douglas was born in 1880, became an active commander in the three great wars of the next century, World War I, World War II, and Korea, and died in 1964, a full century after his father's first act of heroism. Both saw their careers end with similar political drama. Arthur MacArthur, then a two-star, was finally pulled back from the Philippine Islands, where he had commanded troops successfully, but tangled unnecessarily with civilian authorities. Half a century later, and some 105 years after his father's birth, Douglas MacArthur was relieved of his command in the Korean War by a President of the United States for constantly crossing proper military boundaries and becoming too political a player. Arthur MacArthur was the son of a prominent and properly ambitious judge in Milwaukee. When the Civil War broke out, the judge tried to get his son into West Point. He even had one of Wisconsin's senators take the boy to the White House to meet Abraham Lincoln. 
But all the slots were filled, and so the judge, using his private network of political connections, got his son a position as the regimental adjutant of the 24th Wisconsin Regiment. At 18, Arthur MacArthur was an officer, though at first not everyone in the regiment was thrilled to have a boy adjutant. He first came to public prominence in November 1863 at the Battle of Missionary Ridge near Chattanooga. The Confederates held the high ground there and had been chewing up a large Union force gathered beneath them at very little cost to themselves. A diversionary attack, ordered by the Union commanders, led to ever heavier casualties among the extremely vulnerable Union troops until, as if reacting in rage to the unspeakable losses they were suffering, the Union soldiers drove recklessly right up the hill in front of the well-dug-in Southerners and evicted them. They had been, it would turn out, led by the 24th Wisconsin, and the man, or rather the boy, carrying the regimental banner when they finally reached the top, perhaps the third or fourth soldier to pick it up after the others had been hit, Arthur MacArthur. General Phil Sheridan, the Union commander, thrilled by this surprise victory, allegedly said afterward that someone had better take good care of that lad with the banner, because he had just won the Congressional Medal of Honor. Though, in fact, Arthur MacArthur did not actually gain that medal for another twenty-seven years. He fought in thirteen separate battles on Sherman's march across Georgia and was wounded four times. He fought so well, in fact, that he was made a colonel at nineteen, the youngest soldier in the Union Army to reach that rank, becoming known as the Boy Colonel of the Civil War. He was brave, intelligent, and had a natural instinct for battle. After the war, he left the army, but civilian life soon bored him and he returned to the service, though he had to give up his wartime rank. He quickly made captain and then went without any additional promotion for the next twenty-three years. Those were hard years of little external reward, save perhaps the experience itself. The country was pushing west, and more often than not he commanded on the country's frontiers. The conditions were always primitive, and he operated in what were often largely lawless regions, or perhaps more accurately, regions where the only law was what he said it was. The civilian political presence was often marginal, the restraints on a commander therefore minimal. To the degree that there were restraints, they were imposed upon the men in the field by politicians back in Washington, men who were not only distant but were regarded as innocents, unaware of the real world where the army was doing the nation's dirty work. To the men in the field, the politicians they had to deal with were both compromised and compromising. Arthur MacArthur was exceptionally successful in this frontier incarnation and confident in his use of troops in battle. Though he had little formal education, he was surprisingly well-read and exceptionally confident of his intellectual abilities. His ability to operate without civilian challenge in those years only added to his existing arrogance, making him, as his son's biographer William Manchester noted, particularly contemptuous of civilian authority an attitude that was to get him into trouble in the Philippines, and that, passed on from father to son, would turn the MacArthur family, father, mother, and son, ever more hostile to almost all politicians, and yet, in a strange and bitterly ironic, almost unconscious way, ever more political. In 1889, Arthur finally made major and went to Washington as assistant adjutant general. In 1897, on the eve of the Spanish-American War, he became a lieutenant colonel. When the war began in 1898, he hoped to be promoted to full colonel and to command troops fighting the Spanish in Cuba, which was presumed to be the focal point of the confrontation between the United States, just beginning to feel its new economic muscle as the leading industrial power in the world, and Spain, a fading imperial power, one that had been in constant decline for much of a century. Instead of being promoted to colonel, Arthur was jumped two grades to brigadier general. Instead of commanding troops in Cuba, he was sent to the Philippines. William McKinley, 
an Ohio Republican with his own complex and conflicting feelings about America's onrushing new role as an imperial power in the Pacific, was president. He was as surprised as anyone to discover that not only was he dealing with the suppression of a Cuban insurrection, but that the United States' easy success there had led to a larger and more complicated additional step in the Pacific. He found himself facing the far more difficult task of imposing America's will on an indigenous uprising in Asia. There, the local indigenous leaders wanted one thing, the Spanish imperialists gone. At first, they welcomed American help, and then they found, it was part of the age, that the United States intended to do what was good for America, and only then for them as well. That is, create a new political order for them, albeit under U.S. rule and sovereignty. It was the nation's first real colonial experience, and it was not a happy one. The first shots between American troops and Filipino rebels may have been fired in February 1899, eleven months before the millennium, but in terms of American power and ambitions, the brutal counterinsurgency campaign the United States fought in the Philippines heralded much of what was to happen in the coming century. The Americans moved into the archipelago almost casually, more as an adjunct to events in Cuba than anything else. When the fighting in Cuba began, Admiral George Dewey, the commander of the Pacific Fleet, had sailed the American fleet into Manila Bay to destroy the antiquated Spanish one. What he found, in effect, was the feeble remains of the Spanish Empire. The Spanish colony of the Philippines, it would turn out, was there more or less for the taking. And so the United States took it. President McKinley did not particularly want the islands. He could not, he told one friend, have told where those darned islands were within 2,000 miles. But the pressure in the United States for some form of expansion, a continuation of that 19th century sense of an American manifest destiny, and an expression of the need to display to the rest of the world America's new economic muscle, had its own momentum. If the United States needed some sort of proof of its mounting strength in those years, then it could be gotten from colonial possessions. Two basic impulses in America, one of military and political restraint, the other more bloodthirsty and acquisitive, were not for the first time in conflict, and the more hawkish impulse seemed to be winning. As the Washington Post noted, a new consciousness seems to have come upon us the consciousness of strength, and with it a new appetite, the yearning to show our ambition, interest, land hunger, pride, the mere joy of fighting, whatever it may be, we are animated by a new sensation. The taste of empire is in the mouth of the people, even as the taste of blood in the jungle. It means an imperial policy. America began the Philippine adventure as the ally, indeed almost the partner of the rebels who were challenging the Spanish colonial regime and were fighting for their post-Spanish independence. The United States had assured them that Americans were non-colonial by their very nature. In time, the United States ended up fighting in a cruel and ugly war of suppression. Again, two very powerful American instincts were evident a missionary drive that demanded the United States assume colonial responsibility over the islands in order to civilize the natives as part of a Christian white man's burden, and at the same time racism of the most virulent kind, so that the guerrillas were called either niggers or goo-goos. The latter name came from the bark of a local tree that women used when they shampooed their hair. It was a term that eventually morphed into the more all-purpose word for Asians— gooks that American troops used to identify Asians from World War II right through Korea and Vietnam. To send in troops or not was the issue McKinley wrestled with, the forces around him always stronger than his own will. He himself appeared to come to the issue without strong convictions. In the end, he told one missionary group, in words that would have considerable resonance in future conflicts, he had sent the troops because he had no other acceptable choice. 
It had been a very hard decision, he said, and then he noted that he had knelt down in the White House to ask Almighty God for light and guidance. After all, he said, he could not give the archipelago back to the Spaniards. That would be cowardly and dishonorable. Nor could he open it up for two other interested colonial predators, France or Germany. And he certainly could not let the Filipinos, childlike as they were, govern themselves. Therefore his only choice was to take them for America, so Americans could educate the Filipinos and uplift and Christianize them, and by God's grace do the very best we could by them as our fellow men for whom Christ died. The war itself was very different from those altruistic words. The Filipinos seemed quite unaware of the favors the United States intended to bestow upon them. The Americans at first tended to underestimate the Filipino insurgents, who knew the country far better than they did, generally had the support of the people, and soon took up arms against the foreigners not as regular infantry but as guerrillas, and fought surprisingly well. The Americans had a slight superiority in weaponry, thanks to a new Norwegian-made rifle called the Krag Jorgensen, which had the advantage of a five-round clip and used smokeless powder. That meant it did not give out a small puff of smoke when fired, making it harder for an enemy rifleman to mark the gun. Underneath the starry flag, civilize them with a crag, went one of the songs sung by the American troops. What happened then was a forerunner of all too many battles in Asia still to come. Americans who were contemptuous of their adversaries at first because they were not white found themselves quite surprised and quite embittered by the degree of resistance to their will. After the initial shots were fired, one American major had called to his superior, Colonel Frederick Funston, Come on out here, Colonel. The ball has begun. Some ball. The war turned out to be infinitely harder and more brutal than anyone expected. Like Arthur MacArthur, many of the American troops had come right off the frontier and out of the Indian Wars. There, as here, the traditional hatred of an enemy was blended in with racial fears and hatreds. This country won't be pacified until the niggers are killed off like the Indians, one soldier told a reporter. The only good Filipino is a dead one, another said. Some of the American commanders were greatly irritated, as their lineal descendants would be sixty years later in Vietnam, because their adversaries rarely fought in the open or in daytime where the Americans could see them. They were sly. They fought at night, and they used ambushes. As the rebels took shelter in the indigenous population, the Americans turned with ever greater violence on that population, for there was to be no civilian neutrality in a war like this. What was supposed to be easy and to end quickly stretched on. Before it was over, some 112,000 American troops, 62,000 regulars, and another 50,000 volunteers were sent there. The violence not only escalated, but it gradually became more vicious. One American brigadier general, Jacob Hellroaring Jake Smith, told his subordinates, I want no prisoners. I wish you to kill and burn. The more you kill and burn, the better you will please me. I want all prisoners killed who are capable of bearing arms in actual hostilities against the United States. One of his subordinates asked Smith to set an age limit. Ten years, said Smith. Ten years? asked the subordinate. People of ten years old are able to bear arms against America? Yes, said Smith. The war went on for three and a half years, less popular by the day in America. The end was expedited by a daring raid and the capture of Aguinaldo, the rebel leader, by General Funston in 1901. In the end, 4,200 Americans died in the Philippines, and another 2,800 were wounded. Perhaps 20,000 Filipino soldiers died in the struggle, and as many as 250,000 civilians. If old Dewey had just sailed away after he smashed that Spanish fleet— what a lot of trouble he would have saved us, 
McKinley told a friend afterward. Major General Arthur MacArthur became the commander of the American forces in the Philippines in May 1900, replacing General Elwell Otis, whom he regarded with complete contempt. A locomotive bottom side up on the track, with its wheels revolving at full speed, was the way he described Otis. He was more aggressive than Otis, and while he also pushed for political reform, he was willing to use extreme force to destroy the guerrillas. There were bound to be tensions between him and Washington, given the absolute certitude in his mindset over what ought to be done, and the comparable ambivalence in Washington. McKinley did not want to be pulled down in an endless, draining, increasingly unpopular war. Thus, he did not want to leave everything to the military on location. He looked instead for some kind of political solution. In 1901, he finally decided to send a five-man commission to the islands to work out a political settlement, and he chose his friend, William Howard Taft, an extremely able Ohio lawyer and judge, to lead it. Taft wanted no part of the Philippines. What he really wanted was a seat on the Supreme Court. If, however, he turned down the first, he feared the second might never come his way. An immense man who weighed some 320 pounds, Taft was in no way enthusiastic about going to Manila. But, Mr. President, he said when they met, I am sorry we have got the Philippines. I don't want them, and I think you ought to have some man who is more in sympathy with the situation. You don't want them any less than I do, McKinley answered, according to Taft, and then insisted that what he needed was a man he trusted out there representing him. MacArthur, by then the military governor-general of the islands, was furious at this potential challenge to his absolute control, and he never gave Taft a chance. Instead of meeting Taft and the other commissioners when they first arrived in Manila, as protocol required, he sent a deputy to the dock. And, to make things worse, in the words of the diplomat historian Warren Zimmerman, he tried to humble the commissioners by keeping them waiting all day in the blistering heat, then receiving them like an Asian potentate. Even meeting with them represented a humiliation for him, he informed them. Neither Taft nor MacArthur had an easy job and the division of authority between the civilian and military side was never entirely clear. But MacArthur made it much worse with his disrespect for Taft, who was generally regarded as being able and fair-minded. It seemed not to bother MacArthur that in treating Taft with contempt, he was treating the president with contempt as well. His struggle was a triumph of ego over common sense. He was setting up himself, not Taft. For a great fall. Taft's mission was political, more than anything else to protect American future interests and to midwife some distant form of Filipino independence. He would sometimes use phrases like, the Philippines for the Filipinos, or on occasion, in the style of the times, refer to the Filipinos as little brown brothers. But the troops fighting under MacArthur did not think of their adversaries as potential siblings. They had a ballad that went, He may be a brother of William Howard Taft, but he ain't no brother of mine. There was as little informal contact as possible between the general and the lead commissioner. In order to communicate with MacArthur, Taft had to write him letters. Having dealt with some of the most able men in American politics over the years, Taft was underwhelmed by Arthur MacArthur's inflated ego and wrote home to figures of substance like Secretary of War Elihu Root on the qualities in the general that he did not admire, words that would have an odd resonance half a century later. Arthur MacArthur was lacking in a sense of humor, rather fond of profound generalizations on the psychological conditions of the people politely lacking in any great consideration for the views of anyone as to the real situation who is a civilian and who has been here only a comparatively short period of time. He was a man, Taft thought, quick to give lectures and slow to listen. Given that Taft not only bore the personal imprimatur of the President of the United States, but was a close personal friend as well, 
MacArthur's behavior was not merely petulant, it was short-sighted and wildly self-destructive. In the process of proving to Taft who was really important in this two-man civilian military struggle for power, MacArthur quite gratuitously offended the four most important Republican political figures of the era. McKinley, Root, Teddy Roosevelt, who became McKinley's running mate in 1900, succeeding him the next year when McKinley was assassinated, and Taft himself, who became Governor General of the Philippines in 1902 and then Secretary of War before winning the presidency in 1908. It took 13 months of MacArthur's constant resistance to Taft before he was recalled. The job in Manila would prove the high-water mark of his career. Eight years passed from the time he was recalled to the moment when Taft assumed the presidency, and when he did, MacArthur quickly resigned his military commission. But it had all been over long before that. Though he became a lieutenant general, then the highest rank in the army, he was never offered the post of army chief of staff, the job he wanted more than anything else. Despite his considerable accomplishments, Arthur MacArthur ended his career and life caught up in his own bitterness a constant rage that was like a self-inflicted virus. In those years, as William Manchester wrote, he planted a terrible seed of conflict between civilian and military authority in his own son. The seed took a long time to flower, a half-century, but in the end its fruit would be extraordinary. To anyone coming somewhat belatedly upon the story of Arthur MacArthur and how he mistreated Taft, and thus his president, and already knowing something of the story of Douglas MacArthur's collision with his president, Harry Truman, it would be an eerie kind of footnote to future events, history not so much repeating itself as preceding itself. Arthur MacArthur lived for three more years after he resigned in 1909. The real keeper of the flame, the person who kept the myth of him alive, was his widow, Pinky MacArthur. In her mind, it would be up to her son, young Douglas, to avenge the family honor. You must grow up to be a great man, she constantly told him, like your father. Or, she added, like Robert E. Lee. It would be his job not merely to live up to his father, but to exceed his accomplishments, making her the ultimate successful mother. When he was eventually named Army Chief of Staff, the job his father had been denied, she said, If only your father could see you now. Douglas, you're everything he wanted to be. Chapter 8 what an odd thing that a woman born in another century, 98 years before the start of the Korean War, a decade and a half dead by 1950, should have so profound an influence on a battle taking place in the middle of the 20th century. But there was no way of comprehending Douglas MacArthur without understanding not only his self-absorbed father, but his mother as well. For more than any figure of that era, including Franklin Roosevelt, who had his own domineering mother, Douglas MacArthur was a mama's boy. Congressional Medal of Honor winner he might be, and brave in the face of enemy fire he certainly was. Indeed, almost on occasion, suicidally so, but he was a mama's boy nonetheless. Of not many American military heroes could it be said that when they left home for West Point, their mothers uprooted themselves and moved to that small town on the Hudson. Pinky MacArthur took a room in the best local hotel, Craney's, in order to stand watch over Douglas for four full years at the academy, lest he fall below her expectations and slough off into mediocrity. West Point might have been the most rigidly demanding four-year institution in America, but Pinky MacArthur was there anyway, just in case the Academy's contemporary custodians slipped a bit or did not realize how remarkable a young man she had bequeathed them. Pinky MacArthur was not just the key architect of Douglas MacArthur's career, but more important, the molder of his psyche, 
the creator of the almost unique self-absorption that cloaked and on occasion diminished his equally great talent. What she had wrought, all sorts of other talented, devoted public men would struggle with and against for four decades. In contemporary parlance, she would have been known as a stage mother, that is, an immensely ambitious, driven woman who, lacking the outlets for her own ambitions, transferred them to her son and lived through his success. Her career, and she was a world-class careerist, was her son. As MacArthur rose, Pinky MacArthur rose too. As he conquered the varying challenges before him, so did she. As he was honored, so was she. He was raised not just to succeed, but to succeed at the expense of all other human qualities. To be successful, you simply could not afford to think of anyone else. If you did, you might be pulled down by them. In this way, his mother raised him to be the most self-absorbed and thus self-isolated of men. From the start, he was a young man apart in terms of pure relationships. His first wedding, though the weddings of West Point men are normally notable social occasions reflecting the fierce bonds between the groom and his classmates, was notable for the lack of friends and colleagues. Only one real friend attended. Years later he would end his career very much apart from other officers, save his own staff, one known for its sycophancy. He was a man with no capacity for genuine peer friendships, in no small part because in his own mind he had no peers. Pinky MacArthur quite deliberately sent him out not merely to avenge the wrongs done to his father, but to compete against him. She was raising a gifted, talented, cerebral man cut off from almost anyone else, a kind of military genius human monster, someone who was never to be wrong. Never. He was never to make a mistake, never to fail. He was a man who, for all his very considerable talents, was, in some terrible, unrecognized way, incomplete. Perhaps the greatest struggle, as the Korean War began, would not be that of MacArthur against Truman or MacArthur against the Chinese, but MacArthur against MacArthur. The competition between his better self, the side of him that was so truly intelligent, creative, and audacious, and the part of him that was so vainglorious, selfish, and arrogant. The writer Cole Kingseed, a professor of military history at West Point, once noted that a description of Oliver Cromwell, the 17th century Puritan general, was applicable to MacArthur as well in trying to decide whether he was a good man or an evil man. He was a great bad man. Much of that came from Pinky MacArthur. From her he learned the need to be perfect or seem perfect, to cover up any sign of weakness or frailty. Perhaps more than anything else, she left him unable to admit to error. From that need to be perfect came inevitably a certain paranoia. People, in his mind, were always out to get him. How could they? There was always a they, back at headquarters in France when he was younger, in Washington when he became more senior, have done this to him. He lived in a world where the only memories, his own and those of his staff members, were of his successes, of the perfection of his deeds. If things had gone wrong, they had gone wrong because of others, enemies, surely, not because of his own flaws. About the lack of preparation in the first American troops to enter combat in Korea, he would later write, How, I asked myself, could the United States have allowed such a deplorable situation to develop? I thought back to those days, only a short time before, when our country had been militarily more powerful than any nation on the face of the earth. But in the short space of five years, this power had been filtered away in a bankruptcy of positive and courageous leadership towards any long-range objectives. 
He did not, of course, mention that he had helped accelerate the forces of demobilization by announcing on his own that he needed fewer than half the troops in Japan originally ticketed for his command. Nor did he mention that the garrison duty soldiers who first went to Korea and were so ill-prepared had been under his direct command that he had rarely deigned to pay attention to them unless they were at intra-army football games, that, like the country itself, he had essentially been on a peacetime footing. Mary Pinckney Hardy was a southern belle, back when that mattered a great deal. The daughter of a Norfolk, Virginia cotton broker, she met Arthur MacArthur in New Orleans during Mardi Gras, and they were married in 1873, only eight years after the end of the bloodiest war in American history, when the passions and prejudices it generated were still at their height. Two of her brothers who had fought with the South refused to attend the wedding. Her married life was never easy. She had been born to relative luxury and status, a debutante of her era, but she signed on, for better or for worse, to a harsh life, moving from post to post, turned unwittingly into a pioneer woman, often in godforsaken parts of the West and Southwest where she would be greeted by marginal creature comforts. Given her privileged background, it was amazing that she stuck it out. William Manchester calls it a tribute to her courage and perhaps to the strength of social discipline then. Her first son, Arthur MacArthur III, entered the Navy and died relatively young in 1923. A second son, Malcolm, died of the measles at the age of five. Douglas was born in 1880 at Fort Dodge, Arkansas, which eventually became Little Rock. How much the death of her second son affected the emotional intensity Pinky MacArthur would focus on her third and last child, one can never know. But surely she had suffered no small amount of emotional damage, and there is no doubt that he was the one on whom she dispensed her very considerable energies. He was the last best hope. If his father, a national hero seventeen years before Douglas was born, was the beau ideal that he was to live up to, a constant, almost mythic presence, then his mother was his drill sergeant, reminding him of those deeds of his father's that were still to be matched. On the day that the Japanese Diet passed a Land Reform Act in his years as the unofficial ruler of Japan, MacArthur leaned far back in his chair as if looking up at heaven, though it was actually at a photo of his father, who had pushed unsuccessfully for land reform when he was in the Philippines, and said, How am I doing, Dad? Pinky MacArthur had wanted him to go to West Point, but surprisingly enough, despite the family's political connections, it had been hard for him to gain an appointment. Finally, she moved them to a district where the congressman was a friend of Douglas's grandfather. He still had problems getting in. When he flunked his first physical, thanks to curvature of his spine, she went out and found a doctor who would work on correcting it. When the congressman, overwhelmed by applicants with comparable connections, set up a special exam, she immediately hired a high school principal to tutor young Douglas. The night before the exam, he was nervous and anxious, barely able to sleep. She rose to the occasion, giving him her most rousing motivational speech. Doug, you'll win if you don't lose your nerve. You must believe in yourself, my son, or no one else will believe in you. Be confident, self-reliant, and even if you don't make it, you will know that you have done your best. Now go to it. There were thirteen young men taking the test. MacArthur scored 99.3. The next highest grade was 77.9. He excelled at West Point. He was first in his class, of course. That was to be expected. His grades were for many years the third highest ever recorded, and of the two men who had done better, one was Pinky's other hero, Robert E. Lee. Though her son had done brilliantly during World War I and was so acknowledged by his superiors, seven silver stars, and he almost won the Congressional Medal of Honor, 
was much recognized for his skilled leadership of the 42nd or Rainbow Division and had ended up its commander, the youngest division commander in World War I, it was a meteoric career that was never quite meteoric enough. Pinky MacArthur was always there to remind him that there was more to conquer, and just in case others were not aware of his superior abilities, she was always out there publicizing them. Her letters to his superiors were coy and manipulative, full of flattery of the recipients, reminding them not only of his deeds in France, but, of course, of his West Point grades as well, evidence of the old Southern Belle at work. When, during World War I, she felt that Douglas had been a colonel too long, she wrote Secretary of War Newton Baker, suggesting he be promoted to general. This officer is an instrument ready to hand for large things if you see fit to use him. He is a loyal and devoted officer, and I present his name for consideration, as I believe his advancement will serve, not only to benefit his own interest, but on a much broader scale, the interest of our beloved country in this great hour of her trial. Baker did not respond, but Pinky was not deterred. Eight months later she wrote him again. I am taking the liberty of sending you a few lines in continuation of the little heart-to-heart pen-and-ink chat I had with you from California with reference to my son Douglas and my heart's great wish that you might see your way clear to bestow upon him a star. Considering the fine work he has done with so much pride and enthusiasm and the prominence he has gained in actual fighting, I believe the entire army, with few exceptions, would applaud your selecting him as one of your generals. Baker quickly passed her on to General John J. Blackjack Pershing. Now she had Pershing in her sights, a man who had been a young captain in the Philippines when Arthur MacArthur, then a major general, had befriended him. Pershing soon received what she called a little heart-to-heart -heart letter, emboldened by the thought of old friendship for you and yours, and the knowledge of my late husband's great admiration for you. I know the Secretary of War and his family quite intimately, and the Secretary is deeply attached to Colonel MacArthur and knows him quite well. Nor, of course, did the letter-writing end when MacArthur finally made general in 1917. If anything, the process taught his mother that pressure worked, and when he had been a brigadier general for five years, far too long in her view, she began a new campaign to get him his second star, a campaign in which his first wife, Louise, also participated. Louise MacArthur hired a former Rainbow Division officer who was by then a well-connected lawyer in Washington to lobby for her. I don't care what it costs. Just go ahead and send the bill to me personally. Don't tell Douglas. The lobbyist arranged for a group of men who had been colonels in MacArthur's division in France in World War I to meet with the Secretary of War, John Weeks, who told them that MacArthur was too young. Too young, MacArthur later muttered when he heard what Weeks had said, why Genghis Khan commanded his hordes at thirteen, Napoleon his armies at twenty-six. When he was superintendent at West Point, his mother was his hostess. When her son married for the first time, an attractive divorcee, she did not approve. In fact, she immediately took to her bed exhibiting a frailty, never manifested before, but a warning signal that he had better attend to her first and his wife second. It was a move she would make again and again whenever he seemed to be slipping away from her control. She did not, of course, attend the wedding. To no one's surprise, MacArthur's first marriage did not last long, and by the time he was Army Chief of Staff, Pinky MacArthur was back in charge, serving as his official hostess, and he was returning home every day for lunch. His second marriage, the one that worked, did so in part because Pinky MacArthur hand-picked Jean Faircloth for him, and because the second Mrs. MacArthur, herself something of a southern belle, also revered and idolized him, cherishing her role as the general's lady, referring to him in public as the general, and calling him in private Sir Boss.
Pinky MacArthur taught above all else the importance of success, that it validated all the other sacrifices, most especially hers, and that success at a personal level could always be viewed as being good for the country. It was part of her mantra, there in all those obsequious letters she wrote to his superiors. The good of Douglas MacArthur and the good of the United States of America were one and the same thing. As her creation, he was different from other generals of his era, even the most egocentric, like George Patton. Whatever else, the army, with its great hardships in both peacetime and wartime, served to make the bonds of friendship unusually strong among those who had known one another when they were young and endured together through long and difficult and occasionally arid careers. But MacArthur had none of those bonds, none of those wonderful, enduring lifetime friendships. He went through his career as a man with an aura, but almost no real friends. In the army, the needs of self are always to be balanced with a sense of obligation, loyalty, and respect for the institution, and the need to observe orders. Loyalty works two ways. Not only to make those beneath you respectful of your orders, but to teach you what you owe to those who are your superiors. Here, Douglas MacArthur, like his father before him, failed a critical test. Chapter 9 MacArthur was still a towering national figure at the start of the Korean War, perhaps by then as much of a political figure as a military one, and a national icon, whether Washington liked it or not, the last active connection to both world wars. His performance as the commander in the Pacific during World War II had been judged as nothing less than brilliant. He had been somewhat behind the curve at the beginning of the war in respecting what the new possibilities were for carrier-propelled air power and for what the Japanese as soldiers and as pilots would be able to do. When the Japanese planes had struck so successfully against his own planes in the early days of the war, he was convinced, and it was a reflection of both personal and national racism, that their pilots must be white men. In the period before December 7th, he had talked far too confidently about what the Japanese could not do. He had, for example, told John Hersey, then a talented young writer for Time magazine, that if the Japanese entered the war, the British, Dutch, and Americans would be able to stop them with half the forces they had already allotted to the Pacific, and that it would be easy to bottle up the Japanese fleet. But he came to understand, relatively early in the war, one of the major truths about the Japanese as both a culture and a military force. That when they controlled the agenda and they were in command and everything was done according to their schedule, they were formidable and their rigid command structure seemingly unbeatable. Everything seemed to work as planned. Everyone followed the strictest orders faithfully. No mistakes were allowed. But if the tide of battle went the other way, if the Japanese lost the initiative, these very strengths worked against them. They became surprisingly inflexible, skilled in fighting an enemy that behaved only as the Japanese army itself would behave because theirs was so hierarchical and so authoritarian a society, with so little value placed on individual initiative, they were not nearly as imposing a force, and they lacked a critical quality required for the battlefield, an ability to respond to the unknown. As such, they quickly became militarily muscle-bound. Never let the Jap attack you. When the Japanese soldier has a coordinated plan of attack, he works smoothly, MacArthur told his officers. But, he added, when he is attacked, when he doesn't know what is coming, it isn't the same. He also quickly adapted to a new kind of warfare. If he had not understood the possibilities of air power in modern warfare and had been caught with his planes on the ground on Clark Field on December 8th, then he was a quick learner and soon rectified that. 
A skilled and quite forthright young air officer named George Kenny had stood up to him and his bullying chief of staff, Richard Sutherland, and then helped teach him what air power could do in this immense theater, a theater that was a vast ocean populated as it was by occasional islands, among them a certain number of Japanese strongpoints. Out of Kenny's quite practical knowledge of air power and MacArthur's originality of mind, they had jointly fashioned a war plan that stripped the Japanese of their strengths. MacArthur's dilemma at the start was obvious. His own ground forces were limited, and the Japanese were capable of fighting ferociously in defense on atolls where it would be hard to apply some of America's technological superiority. The shrewd answer to that dilemma was to avoid confronting the Japanese where they were strongest, and instead he and Kenny concentrated on striking at islands where they were weakest, thereupon creating airfields on other atolls, which in turn allowed them to strike even deeper into Japanese-held territory and slowly but surely cut off their lines of communication and starve their troops out. They did not so much attack the formidable enemy strongholds as ignore and isolate them. When the Japanese had more than 100,000 troops on Rabaul in the Solomons, just aching for a showdown, MacArthur avoided them. Starve Rabaul, the jungle, starvation, they're my allies. It was a military tour de force. John Gunther, one of the best-known journalists of that era, who had his own problems with the darker side of MacArthur, wrote of him in that campaign that MacArthur took more territory with less loss of life than any military commander since Darius the Great. But there was another side of him surfacing at the same time that was far less attractive. Even during World War I, there had been signs of the danger of his immense ego. But then he had been young and on the ascent, shrewd enough to button up the other side on most occasions, audacious as a commander and good with his troops, almost always up front with them. In World War II, it was different. He was famous by then. He had become politicized, and his ego was constantly in open conflict with his pure military needs. There were more enemies now, and not necessarily the enemy aggressor in the field, but civilian and military officials back in Washington. There was an ever greater need for credit, an addiction, really, to fame. In addition, there were fewer restraints on him. By the end of World War II, the part of him that was so talented was in an increasingly fragile balance with the part of him that could be so destructive. For he was a man who demanded the ultimate in loyalty from those beneath him, and yet to whom the sharing of credit was the most alien of concepts. He had contempt for those like Eisenhower who allowed their subordinate officers any measure of fame. All dispatches emanating from his headquarters were to begin with his name. Thus, the dateline for stories filed from the Pacific would always be MacArthur's Headquarters, implying a dispatch filed from a battlefield headquarters where one man alone made the decisions and did the fighting. All announcements of Pacific victories during the war were to be made in his name. William Manchester once studied the early dispatches from the theater and discovered that in 109 of the first 142 press communiques sent out in the first three months of the war, no other officer's name was mentioned. General Robert Eichelberger, one of MacArthur's senior army commanders, once told his own public information officer that he would rather have him place a live rattlesnake in his pocket than mention him prominently in dispatches. When Eichelberger, a talented, extremely aggressive field officer who commanded MacArthur's Eighth Army, was written about in the Saturday Evening Post and Life, both of them important magazines in that era, MacArthur was not pleased. He called Eichelberger in and told him, Do you realize I could reduce you to the grade of colonel tomorrow and send you home? Loyalty with him was a one-way street, and he was capable of being remarkably disloyal to the presidents he served and the senior military men back in Washington. 
Year by year, he had become the most political of men, constantly working on his connections to the Republican Party. Even in the midst of a great global war in 1944, MacArthur, fueled by a relentless ambition and deep personal hatred of Franklin Roosevelt, had seemed to align himself with the president's most bitter political enemies. Then, in 1948, he had been part of an attempt to gain the Republican presidential nomination, one that had failed badly, and in 1950, even as he commanded the troops in Korea, it was the general belief in the White House and among some of the Republican presidential candidates that he was thinking of a race in 1952, in the midst of the Korean War, that he still hungered for it. The conservative wing of the Republican Party thought he was one of them, that his politics were conservative, and that was probably more true than not, though he had proved to be a surprisingly liberal governor-general of Japan. On the Richter scale of American politics, he was, by the middle of the 20th century, far more conservative than liberal, his politics and his attitudes shaped by an entirely different era. But those who knew him well thought that in his politics, ideology was always quite secondary, that he lived more than anything else in the kingdom of self, and that his politics were the politics of self. Nothing had revealed how political he was, as well as his need to be a player on the national scene, more than his role in suppressing the bonus army in the early 1930s. The Great Depression had revealed the deepest chasms in American society, and a profound political, economic, and social alienation had taken place. MacArthur was the chief of staff of the Army, and he had aligned himself enthusiastically, not merely with the Hoover administration, but with the existing political economic order, then coming under fierce challenge on many fronts. That he took the administration's side in that crisis was not surprising, and was perhaps even unavoidable. But the way he thrust himself into the epicenter went well beyond the requirements of the job. It was a reflection of his need for fame and glory. The Bonus Army had arrived in Washington, a group of destitute World War I veterans, desperately seeking some kind of relief in the form of their bonus for service in the war. It was 1932, the very height of the Depression. It was a defining political moment for MacArthur, for no matter how famous and celebrated he eventually became as a general during World War II, the stigma of what he did then never entirely left him in the minds of many Americans who had come of age in those years. Millions of Americans were out of work then, and the Bonus Army, or Bonus Expeditionary Force, as the men in it called their movement, was a ragtag group of veterans who hoped that spring to lobby for a bill sponsored by Congressman Wright Patman of Texas. The bill would have given them each an immediate bonus, on average about $1,000 a man, which was very big money then. Service in World War I was supposed to be rewarded with a bonus of that size, either upon the death of the soldier or in 1945, some 27 years after the end of the war. Patman's bill was designed to expedite the process. Perhaps as many as 30,000 people, most of them veterans but also their wives and children, created an instant squatter's village, a pathetic little camp of cardboard shacks and tents in the capital, many of them settling in an area called the Anacostia Flats, just across the Anacostia River in the southern part of the city. Few of the men were particularly radical, although there were some radicals among them, not surprising in a time when more and more ordinary citizens were losing faith in the traditional, untempered capitalism of the era. Courtney Whitney, one of MacArthur's closest aides, and a man who often spoke for him, later wrote that the bonus marchers had a heavy percentage of criminals, men with prison records for such crimes as murder, manslaughter, rape, robbery, burglary, blackmail, and assault. To MacArthur, they were nothing but a dangerous anti-American rabble. 
The Veterans Administration, which kept close records, later reported that 94% of them were actual veterans, 67% of whom had served the United States overseas. Dwight Eisenhower, then a major and MacArthur's talented young aide, thought the marchers might be mistaken in what they were attempting, but felt there was a poignant quality to them and their demands. They were ragged, ill-fed, and felt themselves badly abused. As the political battles in Congress over Patman's bill heated up, the Bonus Army's numbers continued to swell. By summer, the ability of the local police to control them was questionable. Hoover, a man largely paralyzed by the Depression, was at the low ebb of his popularity and becoming increasingly nervous about the threat the marchers posed. That summer, Patman's bill was passed by the House only to be defeated by the Senate. Simultaneously, there were several minor skirmishes between bonus army members and the local police. Hoover felt it was time to get the veterans out of town and wanted the United States Army to take over the job. At a meeting with top civilian and military officials, including MacArthur, the bonus army leaders asked for permission, if the army were to enter their little encampment, to march out in proper formation and with some measure of dignity. Yes, my friend, of course, MacArthur answered. On July 28th, the situation came to a head after several scuffles with the marchers. The orders to end the protest came down from Hoover himself. Eisenhower, not wanting the army too closely associated with what was sure to be, even if carried out skillfully, an odious political act, tried to keep MacArthur somewhat in the background. A brigadier general named Perry Miles, a man of considerable competence, was to lead the troops. A young armored officer, a major named George Patton, Jr., would be in charge of the tanks, a warning of what could happen should the bonus army try to resist. Eisenhower was appalled when he realized that MacArthur intended to show up on location to lead the forces of suppression personally. Both he and MacArthur had arrived at their offices that morning in civvies. MacArthur promptly sent Eisenhower home to get his uniform and dispatched his own orderly to his quarters to get his, the one with all the decorations. Eisenhower argued valiantly that this would be a mistake, that a terrible stench would arise from it, and that it would eventually hurt the army in lobbying on the hill with Democrats. I told that dumb son of a bitch that he had no business going down there. I told him it was no place for a chief of staff, he later said. The chief of staff, who often spoke of himself in the third person, replied, MacArthur has decided to go into active command in the field. Then he added, Incipient revolution is in the air. Eisenhower suggested that if both of them had to visit the scene, they at least do so out of uniform. MacArthur vetoed the suggestion. So off they went in full uniform to meet the bonus army. Their orders from the secretary of the army were quite specific. Hoover wanted the marchers tamed, but he wanted no riot. The suppression of the protest should be as restrained as possible. The army troops were not to cross the river or go near the largest encampment of veterans on the other side of the river. Eisenhower later recounted how he had told MacArthur that there was a messenger there with specific orders from the president. I don't want to hear them, and I don't want to see them. Get him away, MacArthur answered. He had decided that if he did not receive them, then there would be no need to act on them, and thus no limits set on his movements. The river would be crossed, the encampment destroyed. The scene around them quickly turned ugly. Some of the veterans' pathetic little shacks were soon burning. Eisenhower, aware that there would be considerable press coverage of an event guaranteed to be filled with pathos, tried to get MacArthur out of there. This was, he believed, a civilian matter, ordered by civilians. Let them take the responsibility and the heat. Eisenhower might as well have ordered a moth to stay away from a flame. 
It was as if MacArthur needed to be at the center of the coverage. He deliberately held a late evening press conference where, having exceeded Hoover's orders and created a political crisis that would greatly help the Democratic candidate Franklin Roosevelt in the forthcoming election, he praised Hoover for being so steadfast. Had he waited another week, I believe the institutions of our government would have been threatened. In this way did MacArthur present Hoover with a fait accompli. The president could not dissent from what had seemingly been done under his orders. It was a devastating political moment for Hoover. No one understood that more clearly than Franklin Roosevelt, who believed that it would seal his election. For millions of ordinary Americans, who in hard times sympathized with the marchers, it was a defining moment. MacArthur became forever in their minds the kind of military man who abused the rights of ordinary people, a man who was never to be trusted politically and was too militaristic. In some ways, however, he got just what he thought he wanted, for his actions that day helped connect him ever more tightly to those on the right wing who saw the Bonus Army as part of a larger threat to capitalism. He had made himself the favorite general of a formidable, increasingly frustrated political constituency that resented almost every initiative taken during the New Deal. He had politicized himself more than any general ever should, cut himself off from those who politically were on the ascent and connected himself to those who were momentarily in decline. The byplay that day offered a fascinating insight into two army officers who would play central roles in America's future. Eisenhower, with his supple sense of political consequences, his innate political deftness, and his empathy for the difficulties of ordinary people, and MacArthur, with his statement that this was a radical moment threatening an entire economic order, and even more important, with his need to be center stage and to receive the full attention of the press, bedecked in full military uniform, medals and all. MacArthur's own sense of where the country was, and what it was, often seemed badly skewed, especially as he got older and the nation, driven by vast technological breakthroughs, changed at an accelerating rate. He was a distinctly 19th century man, more comfortable with those from an era that was passing than those from an era being fashioned by new political forces, transformed and democratized by dramatic economic changes and changes in communications. That MacArthur dissented from many of the political changes taking place in Washington was not surprising. But with him, everything was always more personal. It was as if the men who had arrived with the New Deal were not merely different from those who had preceded them, but enemies, usurpers, in no small part because his influence with them was less than it had been with their predecessors. His views of the two Democratic presidents under whom he subsequently served were nothing less than toxic. This was especially true of Roosevelt, who shrewd and cunning, managed to play the general with exceptional skill, much to the latter's irritation. The irritation of a classic user who finally runs into someone who is even better at it. Roosevelt's view of MacArthur was almost uniquely cynical. He was to be used, but not to be trusted. The president once told his aide Rexford Tugwell that Huey Long was one of the two most dangerous men in the country. Who was the other? asked Tugwell. Father Coughlin? Then a fiery, hate-spilling radio priest? Oh, no, Roosevelt answered. The other is Douglas MacArthur. During World War II, he and Roosevelt played the most complicated of games. Supremely gifted politician dealing with supremely gifted but deeply antagonistic general. Roosevelt once told the general... It was something MacArthur was fond of quoting, as if to show that he had no political ambitions. Douglas, I think you are our best general, but I believe you would be our worst politician. Roosevelt, aristocratic and infinitely devious, watched MacArthur like a hawk. Roosevelt understood him 
and his burning ambition for the presidency far better than MacArthur understood Roosevelt. The president never thought the general a serious political threat. He had too little connection to ordinary voters, but just in case, he kept copies of a report MacArthur had submitted just before the outbreak of World War II, in which he had insisted he could hold the Philippines and other key points in the Pacific because of the inability of our enemy to launch his air attacks on our islands, and documentation about the puzzling way MacArthur's command in the Philippines had been caught with its planes on the ground at Clark Field nine hours after his headquarters had learned of the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor, thus easy prey for the Japanese planes. Mutual trust was hardly at the core of the relationship. MacArthur, who always kept score, sensed that he had met his match and resented it bitterly. In April 1945, when Roosevelt died in office on the very eve of victory in Europe, much of the nation mourned, but Douglas MacArthur most demonstrably did not. Hearing the news, he turned to Bonnie Fellers, a staff officer, and said, So Roosevelt is dead, a man who would never tell the truth when a lie would serve him just as well. Outsiders being told what he said were shocked. It was hard to imagine any headquarters save this one where a commander would speak like that about a commander-in-chief who had just died. What MacArthur remembered about his dealings with Roosevelt was always negative. The grievances, not the successes, not the way Roosevelt had ordered his rescue when in early 1942 he seemed trapped in the Philippines as the Japanese took much of the rest of his command captive, or the fact that the president had come around to MacArthur's side in a crucial dispute with the Navy over the way to conduct the war in the Pacific and approach the Japanese main islands. What was important was not what Roosevelt had done for him, but rather what he had not done for him. Yet nothing had added to his own myth so much as the escape from the Philippines. It was a public relations triumph both for him and for the nation. Arriving in Australia, he had issued his famous I Shall Return statement. Washington had wanted to change it to We Shall Return, but the general was having none of it. This was to be the most personal of pledges and missions, and so it went out as he directed. During that dark hour when a hero was needed, he had been lionized for his escape, with the administration an active participant in that lionization. His own significant miscalculations at the start of the war, mistakes that might have ended the career of a lesser general, were covered up and instead the story became that he had heroically made it out, that MacArthur had lived to fight another day. No one had expressed that thought more clearly than William Wild Bill Donovan, a man of enormous influence in those days, a Wall Street lawyer with immense ambitions, who would in time head the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, and its successor, the CIA. General MacArthur, he said at the time, a symbol of our nation, outnumbered, outgunned, with the seas around him and the skies above him controlled by the enemy, fighting for freedom. The flattery got him nowhere. MacArthur allowed neither the OSS nor CIA into his command area in both World War II and Korea. In Europe during World War II, any number of talented young officers had come into their own under Eisenhower, combat and staff officers alike. But that was not true in MacArthur's command in the Pacific, where no other officer was allowed to make a name for himself, and where there would be little turnover in his staff from the beginning of the war to his departure from Tokyo. There should be newer blood around MacArthur, John Gunther wrote in November 1950, but he will not tolerate anybody near him being too big. I heard it said... None of MacArthur's men can risk being first-rate. The Baton Gang, they were called. The name itself reflected a kind of loyalty test. Were you there at the low point in his career? 
back in the Philippines with the Japanese closing in at the moment when he had been forced to leave for Australia? Not many men. Ned Almond, chief of staff in his Tokyo days, was a rare exception, managed to become part of his inner circle if they did not go back to that earlier defining moment. At the start of the Korean War, a disproportionate number of his top men had been with him since the late 1930s. It was the most exclusionary of groups. Anyone who was not an insider was suspect. Robert Sherwood, the distinguished author and playwright who represented Roosevelt in an unofficial way during the war, was appalled by the hostility he encountered in that headquarters, the rage against all other instruments of the war and against other theaters. Sherwood arrived there in 1944 and brought with him news of the Allied crossing of the Ramagan Bridge, a great moment in the drive against Germany. But when he told Charles Willoughby the news, Willoughby snapped at him, We don't give a damn out here about anything that happens in Europe. There was, Sherwood wrote the president, unmistakable evidence of an acute persecution complex at work. To hear some of the staff officers talk, one would think that the War Department, the State Department, and possibly the White House itself are under the domination of communists and British imperialists. MacArthur, Roosevelt always believed, was completely out of touch with domestic American politics, a prisoner of his dreams rather than the country's changing political and economic realities. MacArthur had believed back in 1936 that Alf Landon was going to beat Roosevelt and turned angrily on Eisenhower, his chief of staff, and a son of Kansas, who was sure that Landon, a Kansan, had no chance. Eisenhower showed MacArthur a letter from a friend of his in Abilene, suggesting that Landon might not even carry his own state. MacArthur categorized Eisenhower and another staff officer who also doubted Landon's success as fearful and small-minded people who are afraid to express judgments that are obvious from the evidence at hand. Landon carried two states, losing, among forty-six others, Kansas. By 1944, in the middle of the Pacific War, there was already talk of MacArthur running against Roosevelt. Some of the most passionate Roosevelt haters on the Republican right were pushing for him to consider the race. One of them, a Republican congressman from Nebraska, A.L. Miller, saw a MacArthur candidacy as the only hope to save the country and wrote him, I am convinced that unless the New Deal can be stopped this time out, our American way of life is forever doomed. Much that was in Miller's letters, there were several of them, would certainly have struck most political or military figures of the time as the work of a fringe ideologue, a man not to be encouraged. MacArthur, however, began an ongoing exchange with Miller. I do unreservedly agree with the complete wisdom and statesmanship of your comments, he wrote the congressman, referring darkly to the sinister drama of our present chaos and confusion. By chance, that happened to be the moment when the country was doing exceptionally well for a nation at war, and when ordinary people in all stations of life took on wartime sacrifices with great goodwill and determination. That did not stop the Miller-MacArthur letters from flying back and forth. This monarchy, the congressman wrote, which is being established in America will destroy the rights of common people. Back came MacArthur. Your description of conditions in the United States is a sobering one indeed, and it is calculated to arouse the thoughtful consideration of every true patriot. What damaged him was the pull of flattery. The need to be revered was too great for him to resist. That was the chink in his armor, and because of it he was sucked in. Miller, thrilled by the fact that a great patriot seemed to see things exactly the way he did, eventually made the letters public, to MacArthur's considerable embarrassment in the midst of a war. The general then said the letters were private, which was true, and under no condition were they intended to be critical of any political leader or any political philosophy, which, of course, was not. 
but they were damaging. Pressed by his friend and supporter, Senator Arthur Vandenberg, then still in his isolationist incarnation, MacArthur announced that he did not want his name put into nomination at the Republican convention. Vandenberg sensed that if the general's name were voted on, the results were going to be humiliating. But one delegate slipped through the net, and while Tom Dewey received 1,056 votes, MacArthur got one vote. Most assuredly, 1944 had not been a happy year for him politically. Just as certainly, the desire to run had not gone away. In May 1946, Eisenhower, then Army Chief of Staff, visited the General in Tokyo, and they talked of presidential politics. MacArthur pushed Eisenhower to run, and Ike matched that move by suggesting that MacArthur run. At that point, MacArthur professed himself too old for a presidential run. But Eisenhower, who understood MacArthur's singular ambition and vanity far better than MacArthur himself, returned to Washington and mentioned to Truman that he might have to face a MacArthur run in 1948. Indeed, with the war over and the democratization of Japan going exceptionally well, the general sent out word to his admirers in 1947 that, though he would not seek the Republican nomination, he would accept a draft if offered. It would be nothing less than his duty, he assured them. The truth was that he had surprisingly high hopes for a run in 1948, but he was badly out of touch with his native land. He had been away for more than a decade, and he was the kind of man who would have been out of touch with his fellow citizens even if he had not left the continental shores. The journey so many millions of Americans were then making into the middle class would soon have important political consequences for both parties, as former Democratic voters, becoming more affluent, began to think of themselves as independents and to vote more conservatively. But for the moment, the New Deal lines, based on elemental economic differences, still held in national elections. The people who were pushing MacArthur to run believed that the New Deal was merely the first step in what was a long and dangerous passage to communism. His support was strongest in the Midwest, especially in the region served by Colonel Robert McCormick, owner of the Chicago Tribune and the leading isolationist of the time. The General's most passionate enthusiasts were isolationists, Though MacArthur was not one himself, he was willing to dance with them. Nativists, racists, anti-Semites, and labor-haters. They were absolutely convinced that they were the truest representatives of what they called Americanism. MacArthur's good friend, Major General George Van Horn Mosley, who reflected their attitudes, wrote him on the eve of the 1948 campaign, there are a great many enemies within our gates who are afraid of you, members of the CIO, the communists, and the Jews, and such skunks as Walter Winchell, a half-gossip, half-political columnist, and Drew Pearson, a liberal columnist who had tangled with MacArthur earlier on. As a prominent essayist of the era John McCartan wrote in The American Mercury, it may not be his fault, but it is surely his misfortune that the worst elements on the political right, including its most blatant lunatic fringe, are whooping it up for MacArthur. Pushed by them to run in 1948, he answered in typical MacArthur prose. I would say with all humility that I would be recreant. Faithless to all my concepts of good citizenship were I to shrink because of the hazards and responsibilities involved from any accepting any public duty to which I might be called by the American people. Nobler than that, no man could be. The people propelling him into the 1948 race were rank political amateurs, filled with their own passion, sense of rectitude and anger. Everyone they knew agreed with them politically. Their worlds, both at the office and at their clubs, were places with few dissenting voices. 
They knew almost nothing about how to work the machinery of local politics. The test case for MacArthur's run was to be Wisconsin, where he had spent some time as a boy and where his family, as much as any military family can, had roots. It was in the Midwest heartland and safely within reach of the Chicago Tribune. Robert Wood, an old friend and the dedicated head of the isolationist America First Committee, was his principal supporter and advocate. Wood was sure that MacArthur would win at least 20 of Wisconsin's 27 delegates. Since he was a candidate in absentia, they expected to sell the idea that their patriot hero was too busy serving his country to run for the office he rightfully deserved. He would do well in Wisconsin, they believed, precisely because he was not able to campaign there. Wisconsin would then launch a larger campaign in absentia. But nothing went right, not even with former servicemen. MacArthur had never been known as a soldier's general, and not even the veterans, polls showed, were for him. In fact, those who had served under him tended to favor by a handsome margin a man who now was one of his personal bet noirs, Dwight Eisenhower. Wisconsin was supposed to launch the campaign, but it effectively ended it. Harold Stassen, the former governor of neighboring Minnesota, won it handily with 40% of the vote and 19 delegates. Thomas Dewey, who went on to win the nomination, got 24% and no delegates. MacArthur, on what was supposed to be fertile soil, won 36% and only eight delegates. The next day, Ambassador William Sebald, the ranking American diplomat in Tokyo, arrived at the Daiichi building for a meeting. MacArthur's chief of staff, Major General Paul Mueller, immediately held up a hand to warn Sebald off. The general is as low as a rug and very disappointed, he told Sebald, who decided to try his luck on another day. But even if the race for the nomination in 1948 had turned into a complete disaster, it had nonetheless proved one thing, which was that late in his career, Douglas MacArthur still hoped for the presidency. The relationship between the president and the general was doomed from the start. The general was disrespectful of the president, and the president, in turn, viscerally disliked and distrusted the general. And what to do with Mr. Prima Donna, brass hat, five-star MacArthur, the new president wrote in his diary back in 1945? He is worse than the Cabots and the Lodges. They at least talked to one another before they told God what to do. Mac tells God right off. It is a very great pity that we have stuffed shirts like that in key positions. I don't see why in hell Roosevelt didn't order Wainwright home from Corregidor in 1942 and let MacArthur be a martyr. We'd have a real general and a fighting man if we had Wainwright and not a play actor and a bunco man such as we have now. Don't see how a country can produce such men as Robert E. Lee, John J. Pershing, Eisenhower and Bradley, and at the same time can produce Custers, Pattons, and MacArthur's. In MacArthur's eyes, Truman's credentials could not have been less imposing. He was a working politician, which was bad enough, but even worse, a Democrat, a liberal Democrat, and he was the designated legatee of the hated Franklin Roosevelt. How could a man like that, a mere National Guard captain in World War I, and then a politician of marginal abilities, and thus self-evidently a much, much smaller figure, who had accomplished so little in life, be above MacArthur in the chain of command? It was, in his mind, an unanswerable question. Each man was to the other almost an alien being. Their backgrounds were so completely different, their concepts of loyalty and duty so totally at odds. Almost from the moment in April 1945 that Truman became president, there were problems between the two men. Senator Tom Connolly of Texas, head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, had even warned Truman against letting MacArthur accept the Japanese surrender. 
Truman wrote in his diary, Connolly said Doug would run against me in 48 if I built him up. I told Tom I didn't want to run in 48, and that Doug didn't bother me that way. The President and his senior military men believed that MacArthur had begun behaving badly almost as soon as the war in the Pacific ended. The first issue that divided them was that of troop levels. In those first months of peace, the President and his top people were trying to slow down the immediate post-war rush to downsize the Army, fighting the natural urge of American families to get the boys home and out of uniform. On the issue of troop levels, MacArthur, in their view, had grandstanded, announcing from Tokyo on September 17, 1945, that because the occupation of Japan was going so well, he would need only 200,000 troops, not anywhere near the half million originally ticketed for the job. That had played into the hands of the administration's domestic critics and had, the people in Washington believed, been done deliberately, at a time when they were besieged by ever-escalating pressures for demobilization. In the eyes of Bradley and Eisenhower, this was an example of the general at his absolute worst, never checking in, showing off politically, and putting himself and his own political interests ahead of extremely serious national security concerns. Any other senior officer pulling something like that would have been instantly relieved of his command or at least severely reprimanded. But no one was allowed to move against him. He was always to be treated differently. Even during the war, finalized Pentagon plans were automatically sent out as orders to all headquarters. Only to MacArthur were they sent out as a comment. No one, even back then, had wanted to incur his wrath. But Truman had been furious when he made the demob harder, and had seriously considered relieving him. Eben Ayers, one of the President's assistants, wrote in his diary at that time, The President sounded off about Mac and said he was going to do something about that fellow, who he said had been bawling things up. He said he was tired of fooling around. Even then, however, the consequences of a major confrontation were too serious. Still, it was an early sign of what would soon be a growing conflict between the two men. In the end, at Truman's request, George Marshall had ever so lightly slapped MacArthur's wrist, sending him a cable indicating that his announcement had made it harder to sustain the draft in peacetime and thus keep adequate American forces overseas. In the future, Marshall wrote, any such statement should be coordinated first with the War Department. But that incident had helped trigger the back-to-back -back invitations Truman proffered to MacArthur in September and again October 1945 to come home, consult with the President, be honored by a grateful nation, perhaps be given one more distinguished service cross, and then address a joint session of Congress. A request by a commander-in-chief, a man newly elevated to the presidency under tragic circumstances in wartime, was never actually a request, though it was masked as one. It was essentially an order. MacArthur nonetheless did not treat it as such and declined twice. Four-star general he might be, senior American officer he might be, but that was not something any officer should do. If the president summoned, you came. Thus he had been disrespectful to Truman from the start, acting as if they were equals, at best, and there were no chain of command. He was too busy in Tokyo, the general had said, and the dangers of leaving were too great because of the extraordinarily dangerous and inherently inflammable situation which exists here. Truman was livid. This was coming from a man who had only recently said he needed only half the allotted number of troops because things were going so well. MacArthur was very aware of what he was doing. He told one aide, and I intend to be the first man in our history to refuse to return home at a presidential request. I am going to tell them I have work to do and cannot spare the time. 
what MacArthur told his people privately was even more grandiose. If he left Japan right now, he insisted, tremors would run through that country as well as other parts of Asia, which would believe themselves abandoned. He also told some of his aides that he would return home on his own terms and when it best suited his own needs. It would perhaps be an emotional return tied to a Republican convention. When one friend suggested to MacArthur that now might be the right time to go, all the anger and paranoia flared. Don't think for a minute I will go now. At one point I might have done so, but the President, the State Department, and Marshall have all been attacking me. They might have won out, but the Reds came out against me and the Communists booed me, and that raised me to a pinnacle without which they might have licked me. Thanks to the Soviets, I am on top. I would like to pin a medal on their blank. The two men, president and general, could not have had more contrasting career curves. MacArthur was already a great national hero in those hard pre-World War II years when Truman was still going from failure to failure. In the early 1930s, when MacArthur had exceeded orders and crushed the Bonus Army, it would not have taken a great stretch of the imagination to envision Harry Truman, then at the low point in his own career, as one of its members. The high-water mark of his career at that point, his service in the American Expeditionary Force in France in World War I as a captain in the Missouri National Guard, seemed hardly a footnote compared to MacArthur's extraordinary exploits in that same war. And yet none of that should have mattered starting in 1945. One was president, and the other was a general. From the beginning, Truman was uneasy with the idea of a commander outside his reach. There was no doubt that he thought frequently of relieving MacArthur. But when someone suggested to Truman, after MacArthur had claimed he didn't need the allotted troops, that perhaps it was time to relieve him, the president answered, Wait a minute, wait a minute. That was MacArthur's great ace in the hole the fact that the political consequences of removing him were so great because he had a formidable political constituency, one quite deliberately fashioned. When John Foster Dulles returned to Washington from his meetings with MacArthur in those first grim days of the Korean War and conferred with Truman, he recommended a change of commanders. MacArthur, he said, seemed too old, and he was bothered by the way his attention span seemed to waver. But Truman already felt himself locked in. His hands were tied, he told Dulles, because MacArthur had been so active politically in the country for so long and had even been mentioned, the president noted, as a possible Republican presidential candidate. He could not be recalled, Truman added, without causing a tremendous reaction in the country, where MacArthur had been built up to heroic stature. It was a remarkable admission. The President of the United States was about to go to war in a distant land, his armed forces commanded by a general he not only disliked, but more important, distrusted, but whom he feared replacing for political reasons. MacArthur saw himself as a great surviving link to a magnificent American past. Only Washington and Lincoln were his peers. My major advisors, now, one founded the United States, the other saved it. If you go back into their lives, you can find all the answers, he once said. When he took over as the supreme commander in the Pacific, one of the first things he did was hang a portrait of Washington behind his desk. And then, when the war was done, according to Sidney Mashbeer, an intelligence officer, he saluted the portrait of Washington, saying, Sir, they weren't wearing red coats, but we whipped them just the same. His hatred of the capital and the men who presided there in those years was palpable. Fabian Bowers, his military secretary in Tokyo, and a man privy to his private thoughts as they came pouring out during monologues on rides in his car, thought MacArthur hated all presidents. 
Roosevelt, to him, was Rosenfeld, and Truman he would refer to as that Jew in the White House. Which Jew in the White House? the puzzled Bowers once asked. Truman, MacArthur answered. You can tell by his name. Look at his face. Then one day MacArthur disabused Bowers of the idea that he disliked every president. Hoover, he said, wasn't so bad. MacArthur was given to paranoia anyway, and like most paranoiacs, he quickly made more than his share of enemies. By the spring of 1949, both the State Department and Defense were working on a plan that would effectively diminish a good deal of his power in Japan. Dean Acheson was probably the driving force behind the plans. The idea was to split up the political and military jobs in Tokyo. MacArthur would eventually be brought home to great acclaim, and prominent non-ideological replacements would thereupon take up the two jobs, with Maxwell Taylor, a rising star of the army in World War II, slated to take over the military half. MacArthur, however, got wind of these developments, contacted his own powerful allies in Washington, and brought the plans to the attention of Omar Bradley the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, in what the latter called a scathing diatribe, the like of which I have seldom read. The tone of it surprised Bradley, who noted that he had never realized the deep distrust with which General MacArthur viewed our State Department in general, and Dean Acheson in particular. Indeed, noted Bradley, MacArthur must have viewed him as a traitor as well for selling out to State on this issue. Things never really got any better. Truman and MacArthur were almost never on the same track, with the same aims. They saw the war that they were about to fight in different contexts. They had, it would turn out, quite different ideas of what would constitute an acceptable victory and how much of the nation's resources ought to be committed to attaining it. Yet, Starting on June 25, 1950, their lives would be twined together as that of a general and a president rarely had been in American history. Truman would find his presidency severely damaged by his inability to control MacArthur, while the general would find his place in history severely damaged by his failure to respect and to take the full measure of the president. Chapter 10 The United States would go to war totally unprepared. The first American units thrown into battle were poorly armed, in terrible shape physically, and more often than not, poorly led. The mighty army that had stood victorious in two great theaters of war, Europe and Asia, just five years earlier, was a mere shell of itself. Militarily, America was a country trying to get by on the cheap, and in Korea it showed immediately. The blame for the poor condition of the army belonged to everyone. The president, who wanted to keep taxes down, pay off the debt from the last war, and keep the defense budget down to a bare-bones level. The Congress, which if anything wanted to cut the budget even more, and the theater commander, MacArthur, under whose aegis the troops had been so poorly trained, and who had only five years earlier said that he did not really need all the troops Washington had assigned him. But mostly it was Truman. The president has to take full responsibility in a matter like this. The army of this immensely prosperous country, rich now in a world that was still poor and war-ravaged, was threadbare. It had been on such short rations, so desperately underfinanced, that artillery units had not been able to practice adequately because there was no ammo. Armored groups had done a kind of faux training because they lacked gas for real maneuvers, and troops at famed bases like Fort Lewis were being told to use only two sheets of toilet paper each time they visited the latrine. There were so few spare parts for vehicles that some enlisted men went out and bought war surplus equipment at very low prices, using their own money in order to break it down for spare parts. 
If there was any upgrade in weaponry, it was almost exclusively in the planes and weapons being designed for the Air Force, not in the weapons employed by infantrymen. World War II had dragged a sleepy, isolationist nation to superpower status. Out of the reach of enemy bombs, the United States had become the great arsenal of democracy. Its awesome factories, their modernity, then the envy of the developed world, produced formidable weapons of war at a stunning rate. Many critics at the start of World War II had feared that Americans would not be good soldiers, that they had grown soft because of the nation's material successes. Worse, there was the question of whether because America was so democratic, its men would be able to stand up to soldiers from mighty totalitarian countries like Germany and Japan. But American troops had proved first-rate soldiers, and the country had produced an enviable army from a democratic society, built as much as anything else around the toughness, shrewdness, and skills of its non-commissioned officers, an army that reflected well on the democratic process, where the ability to think for yourself and accept responsibility were valuable assets. In the European theater, the mighty Wehrmacht had been matched by ordinary kids from ordinary American homes, coupled with the growing U.S. technological advantage. That, and the sheer ferocity of the Red Army assaulting the Germans on the Eastern Front, had doomed the Third Reich. In the Pacific, the Japanese had fought tenaciously, but again the combination of force, superior American technology, MacArthur's shrewd campaign designed to isolate rather than confront the enemy's strongest positions, and finally Japan's own limited resources had doomed their forces. But now, almost daily, there were stories of American units being driven back, of constant North Korean advances. Had Americans in this new post-war era too casually overestimated the ability of U.S. troops? Had they thought that the kind of fighting force the United States had produced by early 1944 was somehow a permanent condition? That America was ipso facto such a powerful, indeed superior nation, that it would always produce better weapons and tougher troops? Did America believe that other nations would know this and deal with it accordingly, always keeping their distance? Certainly there was a sense of that at the beginning of the Korean War, even among those senior military men who knew that the army was too small and not in very good shape. U.S. expectations of how well the army would fight greatly exceeded its abilities. The Americans had expected when the North Koreans crossed the border that whatever the army's multitude of flaws, it would not take much to end the incursion. As soon as they knew that they were fighting Americans, the war would turn around, and good news would replace bad news from the front. For it was not just Douglas MacArthur who thought that he could fight the North Koreans with a limited number of troops. It was much of the top military and political establishment, and regrettably altogether too many of the troops themselves. Much of that reflected a certain kind of racism, a belief in the superiority of Caucasians over Asians on the battlefield. This was a judgment from which the Japanese, with their victories at the very beginning of World War II, had been quickly exempted, their triumphs explained in American minds not because they were Asians, but because they were fanatics. These, however, were merely Koreans. How could Koreans defeat Americans? The answer for some of the commanders in those early days was very disturbing. In late July, Major General Bill Dean was reported missing and was eventually captured by the North Koreans after personally leading the defense of Taejeon. But a few days before his capture, Keyes Beach of the Chicago Daily News had run into him at a small airstrip. Let's face it, Dean told Beach, the enemy has something that our men don't have, and that's the willingness to die. Beach agreed with him. Himself a Marine veteran of World War II, Beach later wrote that the first American troops sent to Korea were spiritually, mentally, morally, and physically unprepared for war. 
ordinary troops, pulled from their very comfortable peacetime existences in Tokyo, many of them poor boys back home who now lived with servants and had undergone only the most minimal training, were rushed into combat and had spoken arrogantly of what a piece of cake it would be and how soon they would be back in Japan. And then almost overnight it had turned into a disaster of the first magnitude. The American forces had not been able to hold terrain. The North Korean spearhead units had been very good and were better armed than the Americans. Again and again the Americans had retreated. The war, by the end of July, was turning into a disaster even as the United States raced to get up to speed, to form new units bound for Korea, and to speed up the deliveries of aircraft, tanks, and bazookas that could stop a T-34 tank. In Korea itself, the first big surprise had been how well the North Korean troops fought in those first few days. The second had been how poorly the rocks had done. They had suffered what seemed like an almost complete collapse on most fronts. The next big surprise, for Americans anyway, was just how poorly the first American troops sent to the Korean mainland did during their initiation into battle. It was more than a surprise. It was nothing less than a shock. The first plan for the use of American troops, Operation Blue Hearts, drawn up by Major General Ned Almond, MacArthur's chief of staff and closest military associate, reflected a wildly optimistic view of how well American troops would fare. It featured MacArthur's preference for an immediate amphibious strike behind North Korean lines at a place called Incheon, and it was planned as if the North Korean assault was nothing more than the arrival of a few mosquitoes who could easily be swatted away. The landing was to take place on July 16th, barely two weeks after the moment when the first American troops made their awkward, clumsy landing on Korean soil. Given the pathetic condition of the American troops in Japan, it was completely undoable at a moment when mere survival was very much in doubt. But it reflected the almost supreme self-confidence of the Tokyo Command about what any American troops could accomplish against Korean troops. Blue Hearts was very quickly discarded, the troops too desperately needed for a much more immediate task keeping the North Koreans from running American forces right off the peninsula. That it had even been considered reflected how little attention the command had paid to the respective forces gathering in the two Koreas. Nor were any of the subsequent plans being put together in Tokyo much better. Much of the decision-making in those early days reflected the essential racism of the moment. Any experienced officer knew that for psychological reasons it was important for the first American troops to be at their best in their initial encounter with the North Korean troops, to fight well from strong positions, and to maximize their potential superiority in hardware. Yet, at a moment when shrewd planning was critical, it proved not just careless, but clueless. The headquarters sent the 24th Division, acknowledged by consensus to be the weakest and least well-prepared of the four divisions in Japan, into Korea first, because it was based at Kyushu, which was closest to the peninsula. Because it had been stationed farthest from Tokyo, on the southernmost island of Japan, the 24th had gotten the last pick of everything coming in country. Officers, men, and equipment. Its regimental and battalion officers, this would be a major problem with all units in the early months of the war, were largely second and even third rate. It was, said one of its platoon leaders, literally at the end of the supply line. Its equipment, an operations officer for the 34th Regiment said, was a national disgrace. A good deal of the ammo for its mortars was faulty. Its thirty caliber machine guns were worn down and not very accurate. It had the old 2.36 bazookas. Later, one of its officers would write that it was rather sad, almost criminal, that such understrength, ill-equipped, and poorly trained units were committed. 
the World War II veterans were gone. They had been replaced by troops who, as T. R. Fehrenbach, a commander of a company in Korea, noted, were fighting a war they did not understand. They knew neither their ally nor their enemy, and hated the country they were in. The men volunteering for the military in the period right after World War II had enlisted, in Fehrenbach's words, for every reason known to man except to fight. The army the United States sent to Korea in those early days was, Ned Almond thought, about 40% combat effective. That estimate, Clay Blair noted, was on the rosy side. Like most American units in Tokyo, instead of having three battalions to a regiment, the 24th Division had only two. Worse, the division commander, disrespectful of his enemy, initially sent in only two regiments, both of them badly under strength. A third was on maneuvers elsewhere in Japan, and instead of feeding all his troops into one area where they could concentrate their efforts and their fire, he broke them down into three smaller units and placed them so that they would almost instantly find themselves badly outnumbered, easily encircled, and incapable of holding off the massive Inmingun assault. Given the force they were up against, despite some moments of exceptional bravery, they were bound not only to fail, but to fail quickly, their battles all too often turning into routs something that greatly encouraged the North Koreans and discouraged other American units just then starting to arrive. None of this was by happenstance. It was the direct product of the great victory that had taken place five years earlier and the desire to disarm overnight. When Bob Eichelberger turned the 8th Army over to Walton Walker, he was all too aware of its weakness. It is already nothing but a supply organization with no combat soldiers, just a cadre. Whatever hard-won respect for an Asian army that had been gained while fighting against the Japanese during World War II had disappeared. Duty in Tokyo had been considered a very good deal, with all the pleasures of being a victor and living exceptionally well in a very poor Asian country, and little in the way of military responsibility. Newcomers arriving from the States were welcomed, told that Japan was a great place, that if you knew how to play the game, you could get laid easily and cheaply, and you could make a nice bit of change on the side dealing in the black market. Each G.I. was living much better than he ever had at home. Most had, in the vernacular of the time, a shack girl. In a devastated, impoverished, burned-out Japan, Everyone, even the lowest private, it sometimes seemed, could find a houseboy who took care of his uniforms and shined up his boots. The imbalance of personal power in Japan, of an American private or corporal who was momentarily rich, or at least richer than he had ever hoped to be back in Ohio or Tennessee, living among Japanese who were now all supplicants, seemed only to underline an innate American racism and prove that the white world was superior in all ways. The men of the white world won wars. The men of the non-white world shined their shoes, and the women of the non-white world became their girlfriends. In this army of easy occupation, soldiers did not necessarily show up for roll call on a Monday, and it was often the responsibility of the company clerks to work wonders to make sure that units still appeared combat effective. That these troops were not battle-ready was hardly a great secret. Major General Tony McAuliffe, who in 1945 had been the commander at Bastogne during the Battle of the Bulge, had been given the command of the troops in southern Japan in 1948, and he had hated every minute of it. Keyes Beach had visited him and asked him if he liked the duty. McAuliffe answered that he liked it fine, but they, the troops, don't like me. In fact, I'm just about the biggest son of a bitch in these parts. The only excuse for an army in peace or war is that it be ready to fight. This army here is no damn good. I'm turning the place upside down and seeing that all the men get out in the field on maneuvers. 
I want them to sleep on the ground and get their feet wet. His tour did not last long, and his spirit, as Beach added, was not contagious. These were the troops who first set foot in Korea so sure they would readily defeat the Inmingun. Colonel John Mike Michaelis, the first regimental commander to lead his troops well there, was appalled by the performance of most of them in those early months. He told Robert Pepper Martin from the Saturday Evening Post in early October, when they started out, they couldn't shoot. They didn't know their weapons. They had not had enough training in plain old-fashioned musketry. They'd spent a lot of time listening to lectures on the differences between communism and Americanism, and not enough time crawling on their bellies on maneuvers with live ammunition singing over them. They'd been nursed and coddled, told to drive safely, to buy war bonds, to give to the Red Cross, to avoid VD, to write home to mother, when someone ought to have been telling them how to clean a machine gun when it jams. They were, he added, so road-bound that they had almost lost the use of their legs. Send out a patrol on a scouting mission and they load up in a three-quarter ton truck and start riding down the highway. If troops like this were an all-too-accurate reflection of the mood of the country back home, then so were the North Korean troops a reflection of their country. Trying to make the jump overnight from an oppressed, colonized society to instant modernity by using their own crude replica of the Soviet model. They were tough, angry, battle-hardened, elite troops. They carried very little extra gear, were in much better physical shape than the Americans, and could live far better off the land than their American adversaries. Roy Appleman, the studious army historian, estimated that nearly one-third of them, and certainly most of their officers and NCOs, had fought with the Chinese communists in the difficult battles against the nationalists. In their mind, this war was an extension of the war that they had been a part of earlier, the war against the Japanese. They were exceptionally well, in fact, frighteningly well indoctrinated. There was an almost robotic quality to their certitude and the way that many of them, when captured, voiced their political beliefs. It exceeded even that of their Chinese communist colleagues, even some of those Chinese who were true believers. They came from peasant backgrounds, had hated the Japanese colonization of Korea, and believed that the Americans and their proxies in Seoul were agents of the past, not enablers of the future. The Americans were now the allies of the Japanese, as well as the old Korean ruling class, and thus this was a continuation of the struggle that had forced them to leave their native soil years earlier. The leadership of the South Korean army was, in their minds, a reflection of those Koreans who had fought alongside the Japanese, and in the upper-level ranks this was often true. The North Korean troops had trained hard and were extremely well-disciplined and motivated. They camouflaged themselves exceptionally well, stayed off the roads, and often moved over the harsh terrain by foot, as the Americans did not. Like the Chinese communists who had trained them and with whom they had fought, they tended to avoid all-out frontal battle. They preferred to make early contact, then slide along the flank of their adversaries, hitting the badly outnumbered South Koreans or Americans from the side or the rear. They also sent small parties ahead, disguised as peasants fleeing the Inmingun, to recon American positions and call in strikingly accurate artillery fire. They were absolutely sure in the beginning of whom they were fighting and why. They were fighting white foreigners, imperialists and capitalists, the children of Wall Street, and, of course, their puppet allies in the South. The Americans were not so sure, despite periodic lectures on the evils of communism, whom they were fighting, or, for that matter, why they were fighting them. They might be soldiers stationed in Japan, but they'd had no expectation of going to war, especially in a place called Korea. 
When word reached my unit that Sunday, a corporal in the 34th Infantry Regiment named Larry Barnett said, the reaction in my company was, where is Korea? The next, he added, was, let the gooks kill each other off. That was too bad, because the 34th and its sister regiment, the 21st, were slated to be the first units to fight in Korea. They were both part of the ill-fated 24th Division. The 24th was ordered to get to Korea as quickly as possible and move up the west side of the peninsula until it met up with the onrushing enemy. That appeared likely to happen near the village of Suwon, just south of Seoul. But then the 24th Division commander, Major General William Dean, made his critical mistake and, instead of concentrating his limited forces in one strong position where they might be able to maximize their firepower, unwisely decided to split his units. In this, his orders once again reflected the cavalier attitude of the American commanders toward their new enemy. The lead unit, the first to leave Japan and go into battle in Korea, was Task Force Smith, led by Lieutenant Colonel Brad Smith. Transport planes brought the men to Pusan, a port on the southeast end of the country. Because of bad weather and the limited number of planes available, the airlift took two days. The last of Smith's men landed in Pusan on the morning of July 2nd. On the evening of July 2nd, the men of Task Force Smith boarded a train, and they arrived at Tejan, a little more than halfway between Pusan and what was believed to be the front, on the morning of July 3rd. At Tejan, Lieutenant Colonel Smith met with Brigadier General John Church. Church was an elderly officer hardly known for his vitality who had been put in charge of the survey team sent to Korea by MacArthur to find out what was needed and where. Church's recon had not gone especially well in the face of the exceptionally well-coordinated, very cohesive North Korean attack and the massive, chaotic South Korean retreat. But even the fact that he himself had instantly moved his headquarters back from Suan to Taejeon, a distance of some ninety miles, because the In Mingun had been bearing down on him, had not diminished his personal cockiness. All they needed, Church told Smith, was a few G.I.s to make a stand, men who would not fear tanks. That would stiffen the spine of the rocks. He pointed at a map and told Smith to make his stand near Osan, just south of Suan. So Smith took his men and headed north by train toward Ansong. At the Ansong train station they were cheered by Koreans, which momentarily made them feel proud, for it showed they were the good guys, heroes come to rescue a scared people. Later one officer, Lieutenant William Wirick, decided that the Koreans— there were thousands and thousands fleeing south, were cheering not so much the appearance of the Americans, but the arrival of a train, which they quickly boarded for a trip south toward Pusan. At almost the same time, Major General Dean arrived in Taejeon and took command of American forces in Korea from church. He thereupon assigned the 34th Regiment to Pyeongtaek just south and west of Osan on the Seoul-Pusan Highway. With that, the 34th, its own resources limited, was split off from the men of the 21st Regiment, some ten miles away. Others thought keeping the American troops together and concentrating them about forty miles farther south, using the natural barrier of the Kum River, made more sense. But Dean believed that his mission was going to be, in his own words, short and easy, that the North Koreans would not be anxious to fight Americans. Because of that, he broke his force down into three groups, the fateful mistake. Back in Japan, the men of the 34th Regiment, shipping out for Korea, had been ordered to pack their summer dress uniforms for the victory parade that was soon to come in Seoul. Lieutenant Colonel Harold Red Ayers, who commanded a battalion from the 34th Infantry, had told his men, There are supposed to be North Korean soldiers north of us. These men are poorly trained. Only about half of them have weapons and will have no difficulty stopping them. 
The ordinary soldiers were equally cocky. They were on their way to fight some gooks in the language of the time, teach them a lesson or two, and then get back to the good life in Tokyo. Again, there was, thought Captain Fred Ladd, then an aide to Major General Ned Almond, a deep and pervasive racism that ran through the American army. A belief that gooks could not stand up to Americans. It was hard, he added, to tell whether it ran from top to bottom or bottom to top or both. He would, he noted, see almost exact manifestations of it again when he was a division advisor in Vietnam thirteen years later. As the 34th Regiment moved toward its positions at Pyeongtaek, it came across some rock engineers about to blow bridges. The Americans scolded the rocks for their lack of spirit and threw the explosives away. What was about to unfold as the Americans and the North Koreans rushed toward their initial meeting was an American disaster of the first magnitude, a textbook example of what happens when a nation, filled with the arrogance of power, meets a new reality. On July 4th, Smith took about 540 men, what was effectively an understrength battalion, more like two reinforced companies a few miles north of Osan. Most of their artillery support was still back at Pusan. They reached their positions about 3 a.m. on July 5th. It was raining, and they were all tired and cold. A little later the same morning, Sergeant Lauren Chambers, an assistant platoon leader, spotted eight T-34 tanks moving down the road from Suwan. His platoon leader, Lieutenant Philip Day, asked what they were. Those are T-34 tanks, sir, he replied, and I don't think they're going to be friendly to us. The tanks kept coming, followed by a long line of infantrymen and then an even more terrifying sight, another 25 North Korean tanks. When the lead edge of the enemy column, later estimated to be about six miles long, closed within a mile, the Americans started firing their mortars. There were a few hits, but the tanks kept coming. The Americans waited until the tanks were only about 700 yards away and then fired their recoilless rifles, which scored several hits, but again the tanks kept coming. Then the bazookas failed. At one point, Sergeant Chambers called on the phone for some 60-millimeter mortar fire. The answer came back that they would not reach that far. Well, what about the 81-millimeter mortars, he asked. They didn't come over with us, was the answer. He then asked for the 4.2 mortars. They couldn't fire, he was told. How about the artillery, he asked. There was no communication with it yet. What about the Air Force? The Air Force didn't know where Task Force Smith was. Well, Chambers finally said, what about a camera so he could at least take a picture of this? They were in grave danger of being surrounded, he warned. With that, the Americans began to fall back as quickly as they could, many simply fleeing, some throwing down their weapons, some even taking off their boots because they could move more quickly through the rice paddies barefoot. The 34th Regiment had established its headquarters not far from Smith's forward unit. Now the North Koreans were moving down on them. Dennis Warner, an Australian correspondent for both the London Telegraph and the Melbourne Herald had managed to attach himself to the 1st Battalion of the 34th Regiment near Pyeongtaek, the unit commanded by Red Ayres. He was there with Ayres on the morning of July 5th when Brigadier General George Barth, who was supposed to be the division artillery officer, arrived. As they had no artillery up front, Dean had put him in charge of the forward areas. Warner watched Barth get out of his jeep, turn to the reporters gathered there, and say, Well, boys, it's on. I've got the first shell out there for General MacArthur. Barth said he had given orders to fire when the North Koreans closed within 1,500 yards. The American officers, Warner remembered, all seemed exceptionally optimistic about what was going to happen next. 
Those commie bastards will turn and run when they find they're up against our boys, Ayers said. We'll be back in Seoul by the weekend. Warner wondered, like so many war correspondents before him in situations like this, whether to stay for the action still to come or race back and file a story that American troops were now engaged in battle with the North Koreans. He decided to stay around for the action. He watched a grim sight, an almost classic warning signal, an endless parade of peasants moving south on clogged roads, instant refugees fleeing the Inmingun. The sight of the peasants fleeing south was a telltale one for anyone who knew something about combat, a kind of straw in the wind. What disturbed Warner even more was the fact that the number of South Korean troops who were also fleeing far outnumbered the peasants. He started walking north with a few other correspondents, but they quickly ran into a South Korean cavalryman on what looked to Warner like a Shetland pony, shouting in Korean, Tanku! Tanku! Then Warner saw his first enemy tank, moving steadily and majestically forward. He immediately turned around and headed back to Ayers' headquarters. But Ayers seemed to doubt what Warner had just seen with his own eyes. We don't have any tanks, he said. Not ours. Theirs, Warner answered. The bridges around here wouldn't take a tank of that size, Ayers insisted. So back Warner went with a bazooka team sent by Ayers, perhaps to humor me. Soon... Two North Korean tanks showed up. The American bazooka men moved as close as they could and fired away, only to see their shells bounce off the tanks. At that point, word had still not reached Ayers' headquarters of the destruction of Task Force Smith. Only then did a few of the survivors begin to straggle in and report that most of the battalion had been lost. Soon thereafter, Warner wrote, Ayers and his men were on the run. Barth's headquarters also broke during the night, minutes before tanks burst through it. By dawn, July 6th, the tanks were in Pyeongtaek, five miles down the road. By breakfast they were in Songwon, and before the day was over, they had advanced to Chonan, thirty-six miles in thirty-six hours. By the end of the next day, with the American troops still in precipitous retreat, General Dean had dismissed Barth as his forward commander and fired one of his regimental commanders as well. It was a very bad beginning. Poorly prepared troops, poorly deployed, had barely slowed down the ferocious drive south of the North Koreans, at best by a few days. In the first week of combat, the North Koreans had virtually destroyed two American regiments. Some three thousand men were either killed, wounded, or missing in action, and enough weapons had been left behind to outfit one or two North Korean regiments. Those were terrible days. The mood in both Washington and Tokyo was increasingly grim. A fear grew that American troops in a limited war might not be able to hold and that pressure would gradually rise for the use of the atomic weapon. This was aptly caught in a New York Times editorial on July 16th. Our emotions, as we watch our outnumbered, outweaponed soldiers in Korea, must be a mingling of pity, sorrow, and admiration. This is the sacrifice we asked of them, justified only by the hope that what they are now doing will keep this war a small war, and that the death of a small number will prevent the slaughter of millions. The choice has been a terrible one. We cannot be cheerful about it or even serene. But we need not be hysterical. We need not accept a greater war and the collapse of civilization. Of the many American illusions that died in those first few weeks of the Korean War, perhaps the most important was the belief in the atomic bomb as the ultimate weapon, in effect the only weapon we needed. That was an idea that had taken serious root in the national security mentality immediately after World War II, in part because it was so formidable a weapon, and in part because it meant that the defense bill could be done on the cheap. Just a year earlier, Omar Bradley, 
Normally, a man of exceptional common sense had testified before the Congress that the day of the amphibious landing was essentially over. Frankly, the atomic bomb, properly delivered, almost precludes such a possibility as an amphibious invasion, he said. In those early painful defeats, the nation learned that its entire defense system was an illusion, that the bomb was the most limited kind of weapon in any kind of limited war, and that the great power stalemate with the Russians might produce on the peripheries of the two superpowers areas where it was harder to control indigenous tensions. There was also this new truth. The atomic weapon was so powerful and so awesome a weapon that it was, in many situations, morally abhorrent. It was the great, almost unusable weapon. It was the ultimate deterrent, awesome, really, for no nation would lightly strike against a member of the atomic club without a good deal of thought. But the early American monopoly of it, the quick, instantaneous way it had seemed to end the Pacific War, had created an illusion when it came to America's defense budget, that it could develop a military arsenal on the cheap with only one kind of arrow in it. If the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki had seemed to inaugurate a brand new chapter in the history of warfare, supposedly making all other weapons obsolete and creating a world where military power rested only with the richest, most technologically advanced nations, then the Korean battlefield defeats of early July 1950 shattered that belief. The world of the military had seemed to change completely back in August 1945, but now it was clear it might not have changed that much. As the country realized the limits of the atomic weapon, the popularity of both the Korean War and of the Truman administration began a steady decline. Perhaps not that many people would want to exchange this new, not-yet-rooted internationalism for the old isolationism, but that did not mean they liked the way things were going, nor the men in Washington who were in charge. If this was America's new international fate they were being confronted with, it was hardly a fate they would have chosen. July 1950 was one of the worst months in American military history. One long, ignominious retreat filled with terrible small battles and occasional moments of great gallantry by outnumbered and outgunned American units who were again and again overwhelmed by the sheer force, size, and skill of the North Korean assault. The American troops were invariably positioned too thinly at critical junctions, trying with limited numbers to slow down the North Koreans until other units by then gathering in the United States and ticketed for Korea could get there. It was an army trying to buy time in precious increments with the most precious coin of all, the lives of its young men. Back home, the country was just beginning to mobilize for this newest war. The manpower situation in Japan on the eve of the war had been so desperate that when the war broke out, soldiers in Japan who had been convicted of relatively serious crimes and were on their way back to stockades in the States in handcuffs were given an alternative. Fight in Korea and their records would be cleaned. If you had been an officer in an American division in Tokyo in the days before the Korean War broke out, a vast percentage of your time, said Lieutenant William West, an aide to Major General Hap Gay, the commander of the 1st Cav, was spent arranging for all too many of your men to get ready for their courts martial. In early July, MacArthur told the Joint Chiefs he needed 11 battalions simply to hold the line. There was a certain desperation to the way that need was translated back in America. Uncle Sam wants you, now or yesterday, for the Korean War. Marines who had fought in World War II and had gone happily back to their civilian lives were finding to their extreme displeasure that, though they had not volunteered for the Marine Reserves and thought themselves civilians, they were available nonetheless to the Corps, based on their old contracts with Uncle Sam. 
They were being rousted from their civilian incarnations for a second tour in less than a decade. In the meantime, draft calls were on the rise for the Army, since not many young men had rushed down to recruiting centers to volunteer, as they had back in December 1941 after Pearl Harbor. Men already in the service were herded into combat units and to Korea without much training. When the North Koreans struck, noted an officer named Captain Frank Munoz, who commanded a company in the early fighting, we turned the vacuum cleaner on. It sucked up men from everywhere, behind desks, out of hospitals, from depots. We filled up fast. At first there was talk of six weeks of combat training before the men were shipped out, but there turned out to be no time for that. Then there was talk of ten days of training once they arrived in Korea, but that too was discarded. Finally, there was talk of three days of special training once they got to Pusan, but there was no time for that either, as the North Koreans pushed closer and closer. So men arrived in the port directly from the States, drew their gear, and more often than not were immediately shipped up to combat positions, often without having zeroed in their rifles or calibrated and test-fired their mortars, and with the Cosmoline on their fifty caliber machine guns barely rubbed off. In the Pentagon, there was a growing nervousness about the effectiveness of the leadership, especially about Lieutenant General Walton Walker, the commander of the Eighth Army, which meant at that time the commander of all Americans, and soon all United Nations ground forces in Korea. So it was that in the terrible days of early August, the Army dispatched its ascending star, Lieutenant General Matthew Bunker Ridgway, as part of a special, high-level, three-man team to meet with MacArthur, listen to him, and go over his needs, while expressing Washington's own anxieties, especially about MacArthur's relationship with Chiang Kai-shek. While Averill Harriman, the leader of Ridgway's group was busy measuring MacArthur and trying to bridge the gap between him and the administration on the issue of Jiang and China. Ridgway's most important job was to inspect Walton Walker and his Korean command. Ridgway, who had last witnessed a headquarters in the heady final days of World War II, commanding airborne troops, the elite of the elite, was appalled by what he saw in Korea. All too many of Walker's key officers, he believed, were men who had not done well in that war and were being given one last opportunity to serve so that they could retire at a slightly higher rank and pay level. It was as if the people who had been in charge back in Washington and Tokyo were allowing tickets to be punched for old time's sake, not sending or demanding the best of a new generation of officers. Walker could not have agreed more, and was furious with the quality of men he had been getting, and the fact that so many of the better officers seemed to be siphoned off once they reached Asia, to serve in the headquarters in Tokyo, rather than in the field commanding troops in battle. Walker was a good and decent officer, Ridgway thought. Give him a tank unit and specific orders, and no one would be better. But nonetheless, he believed Walker was in way over his head in this assignment, and the Eighth Army staff around him was visibly weak and badly organized. The passivity of Walker's chief of staff shocked him. Some of the regimental commanders were older men lacking in combat experience. As for the fighting men themselves, they were not, he reported, by a very long shot up to the standards of their World War II predecessors. Just about everything in his report was negative. The troops all too often lacked infantry fundamentals and were not aggressive. They had become prisoners of their machinery, most particularly their vehicles, and thus of Korea's poor and limited system of roads. They did not counterattack. They did not dig in properly. Attempts at camouflage were careless, fields of fire poorly drawn up, communications between units weak. Ridgway was shocked. Here the United States was, sending young men out into combat in a way that greatly endangered them. That, to him, violated the most elemental tenet of an infantry commander's creed. 
Ridgeway felt strongly that Walker should be relieved, because in his estimation he lacked the larger command skills and the vision necessary to change things. Ridgeway was, however, wary of making that recommendation too forcefully. He was naturally uneasy about relieving an already desperately embattled commander, one whose troops were threatened with being pushed into the sea. Might such a move damage the already fragile morale of our fighting men, he wondered. He was no less uneasy about looking like an opportunist, someone critical of Walker because he wanted the command for himself. Not knowing the deep chasm that already existed between MacArthur and Walker, he worried about MacArthur's reaction if he suggested Walker's relief. Would MacArthur, always so sensitive to Washington, see him as a spear carrier for Truman or just another opportunist? He decided to talk with Harriman, who had been running difficult, sensitive, high-level missions since the 1930s. Harriman, like General Loris Norstad, an Air Force officer and the third member of their team, believed that Walker had to go, but was wary of broaching it at that moment unless, in their final talks, MacArthur opened the subject himself. Any discussion, Norstad believed, should be initiated by the commander. They were not to look like they had come out from Washington to attack his command. Better, Harriman suggested, for Ridgeway to discuss the Walker matter with senior officials in Washington, including the president himself, and then make the suggestion through proper channels. Ironically, as Clay Blair later pointed out, MacArthur himself had already lost confidence in Walker, was thinking of relieving him, and believed that Ridgeway was the best man for the job. Had Ridgeway actually replaced Walker at that moment, Blair wrote, events in Korea would very likely have taken a different and more favorable course for the American army. For Ridgeway would have been able to stand up to MacArthur as Walker never could, would have been far more independent of Tokyo than Walker, would have been far better connected back in Washington, and almost surely would have been more cautious in moving north after the 38th parallel was crossed. On their way back to Washington, Larry Norstad pushed Ridgeway on the subject of the 8th Army Command. I think you ought to be in command there. But Ridgeway, extremely sensitive to the idea that he might use his superior position and great Pentagon leverage to usurp another man's command, resisted. Please don't mention that. It will look as though I was coming over here looking for a job, and I'm not. There was one other thing that Ridgway noted, but he was reluctant to talk about it. Much as he was thrilled by a briefing MacArthur had given about his plans for an amphibious landing behind the enemy's lines at a place called Inchon, Ridgway was, after all, an airborne man, and he liked the idea of surprise assaults away from the main strength of the enemy. He worried about the difficulties that came from dealing with so senior an officer as MacArthur, so physically distanced from a cruel, bitter, and alien battlefield. In fact, the command was almost turned over to Ridgway at that moment. Harriman pushed hard for it. His recommendation was made to Truman, Lewis Johnson, the Secretary of Defense, Omar Bradley, the Chairman of the JCS, and Joe Collins, the Army Chief of Staff. It was an ideal move, everyone agreed, because it would put in play the Army's best younger commander and might have the side advantage, though no one ever actually said this, of lessening MacArthur's ability to act on his own. Ridgway was so forceful an officer that even someone as lofty as Douglas MacArthur would find it harder to do end runs around him. But Joe Collins had already ticketed Ridgway for promotion to Vice Chief of Staff in 1951 and feared that, in Korea, you might be so involved I couldn't get you out. It was a curious way to look at command in the only shooting war America was involved in. It undoubtedly reflected a deep-seated belief in Washington that this still might be only the preliminary round that the really big enemy strike might soon come in Europe. Among those who thought this was true was Ridgway himself. Chapter 11 
So Walton Walker would not be replaced at that moment, even though he had no important defenders either in Washington or Tokyo, where he was often out of the play on vital command decisions, and where MacArthur's people made fun of him in private. Walker was fighting, as his pilot Mike Lynch, who was also his great confidant, put it, a two-front war against the North Koreans and the Tokyo High Command. Walton Johnny Walker knew what was up. Knew that he was perilously close to being relieved. Yet there was one exceptional quality Ridgeway had sensed in him, whatever he believed were Walker's limitations, and that was his bulldog tenacity. The two generals had conferred as Walker's troops were being systematically pushed back to the Nakdong River. The great question in those gloomy days was whether they could hold in the Pusan perimeter at all, or might simply be pushed off the peninsula altogether. At their meeting, Ridgeway had asked Walker what he would do if he were driven back any farther. He would not be driven back any farther. Walker had answered. That's what you tell the troops, Ridgeway said. But what will you really do if you were driven from the Nakdong line, General? Walker had answered defiantly. I will not be driven from the Nakdong line. In at least one way, Walker was fortunate. He did not have much time to worry about what Washington or Tokyo thought of him. He was too busy each day, desperately moving troops around, trying to head off the latest North Korean advance. As such, he had little time for self-pity. Crisis followed crisis. Every division commander, every regimental commander, every company commander was short of troops. Each night in July, the Inmingun seemed ready to break through American lines at four or five different places. Walker's job was always to plug the next leak, to try to decide which of the many places was most important. Rarely had an American commander been dealt such a bad hand. That his troops were poorly prepared was partly his own fault, for he had been one of the commanders in Tokyo in those pre-June twenty-fifth days. But in the early days, they were also badly outnumbered by an enemy fighting on its own terrain. Walker's supply line was hopelessly long, extending all the way back to California. There were shortages of everything: troops, commanders, and sometimes, most important of all, ammunition. He was in hostile territory, a tank commander in predominantly mountainous country, and when it came to tanks, the other side had more and better ones than he did. Worse yet, even in his own command, he was to no small degree an outsider. MacArthur and his ever more powerful chief of staff, Ned Almond, viewed him with condescension, if not with open contempt. Sometimes it seemed to Walker that he was the last American in the Far East to hear of vital decisions. The entire Tokyo staff under MacArthur and Almond grasped the disrespect shown him by its two superiors, and, as so often happens, parroted their attitudes. Walker could not even get the field officers he wanted. Others back in Washington and Ridgeway on his trip out had complained about the poor quality of Walker's staff. But whenever a troop ship docked in Yokohama, Japan, before any officers could disembark, their records were screened by the Far East Command. The best officers would then be skimmed off by MacArthur's headquarters, and the others would be released to the Eighth Army. It was a pipeline, to be sure, but a corrupt one, for it was delivering talent to all the wrong places. Walker was not normally a man to complain. He had always accepted the whimsical nature of army decision making for what it was, but he would later complain to intimates about how headquarters made fun of the quality of his staff and commanders, but then refused to send him the rising stars he asked for. He wanted Slim Jim Gavin, a famed airborne commander in World War II and one of the most talented, charismatic younger officers in the army, and was angry to discover he could not get him. During World War II, George Marshall had been appalled by the relatively advanced age of many of his regimental commanders and had demanded younger, more vigorous men. He had wanted no regimental commander over the age of forty-five, but in Korea. 
in what would be an unusually taxing command physically because of the cruel climate and the nature of the war, it was the same old story. On the eve of the war, only one of nine regimental commanders, 37-year-old Mike Michaelis, met the martial test. Of the others, one was 55, one was 50, four were 49, and two were 47. Michaelis was far and away the best regimental commander in Korea in the beginning, and his 27th Regiment Wolfhounds were being used in almost every critical situation, much like a fire brigade. In those early days when the American units were, on occasion, surrounded by the North Koreans, Michaelis was so successful, some of his contemporaries thought, because he was an airborne officer, and airborne people were taught not to worry if they found themselves surrounded. That was, in a sense, their natural habitat, and they always expected to be resupplied from the air. Officers in other units, surrounded and cut off, had a tendency to panic and fall back too quickly, their unit discipline unraveling as they pulled back, all too often into well-prepared North Korean ambushes. Michaelis and his men worried first and foremost about unit integrity. The ability of his men to protect one another and use their weaponry to create protective fields of fire was considered more important than whether or not they were momentarily encircled. For Walker, the war was turning into a bitter culmination to a surprisingly rich military career in which, like many other gifted officers, he had defied his academic background and class standing. He had grown up in Belton in central Texas, one more of those boys, in an era when there was so much less choice, who had decided soldiering was his way of getting out of a small town and having a life with some greater measure of meaning. He had gone to a local military academy, and on graduation had wanted to go to West Point. But he was too young at fifteen, and had entered VMI instead. He had hardly been brilliant there. 52nd in a class of 92, but in June 1907 he managed to get a congressional appointment to West Point anyway, and he entered the academy with the class of 1911. But times in Texas were hard. His father wrote him a letter asking him to come home and assist in running the family dry goods store. In October he left West Point, then re-entered with the class of 1912. Again, he was more plodder than Comet. He graduated 71st in a class of 96, into a tiny army about to become larger because of World War I. In the years just before that war, he was part of the 19th Regiment, which spent a good deal of its time sparring with only marginal success against Pancho Villa during a series of skirmishes on the Mexican border. In World War I, as a young captain, Walker had led a machine gun company against the Germans and won two silver stars in the Meuse-Argonne fighting. It had jump-started what had seemed until then a rather ordinary career. Walker had been an intense, aggressive line officer. His superiors were impressed. They thought of him as a man who was never going to let them down. Not brilliant, but a damn good man, one you could always rely on. You could build a fine army with men like him. Class standing, what had seemed so important back at West Point, mattered so much less on the battlefield, where it was all about instinct and courage and a sense of duty. He was good with his peers, one of whom was named Leonard G. Giraud, himself the best friend of a rising young star of that era named Dwight Eisenhower. In 1925, Walker was picked to attend the Command and General Staff School at Fort Leavenworth, established after the war to help the Army choose which officers were destined to become generals and, if need be, to expedite their careers. In those days, no one talked about something called the Fast Track, but if there was one in a peacetime institution with a snail-like career pace, it began at Leavenworth. With him at Leavenworth were G. Giraud and Eisenhower, first in the class of 245 and just beginning to break out of the pack. Walker was 117th, but he was getting good assignments. 
In 1935, even as the Army was thinning out its officer ranks, Walker was admitted to the Army War College. Graduating in 1936, he received what seemed a very ordinary assignment, Executive Officer of the 5th Infantry Brigade at Vancouver Barracks in the state of Washington. In reality, he had lucked out because the commanding officer there was a young brigadier named George Catlett Marshall. The cerebral, austere Marshall, seemingly the quintessential staff officer, but quite possibly a superb combat officer as well, no one knew because he had not been given a chance, seemed to take to the intense, aggressive, obviously fearless walker. Out of that grew a genuine friendship, and in 1939, when Marshall, about to emerge as the single most important officer in the entire army, arrived in Washington to take up his job as head of war plans, he stayed for a time with the Walker family. That was both a plus and a minus. A plus for Walker's career, because he was something of a martial man, but a minus later when he arrived in Japan and Korea, because of MacArthur's phobic feelings about Marshall left over from World War II. Whatever else Johnny Walker was, he was not charismatic. He was about 5'5", five five, short and stubby. He's a little fat, isn't he? Someone once said to George Patton, under whom Walker had served with distinction in World War II. Yes, he is, Patton answered, but he's a fighting little son of a bitch. His chin was soft and round, his face and body in no way sculpted. He was always more than a little overweight, 165 pounds on a short frame. He looked, noted one British writer, all too much like the man from the Michelin Tire advertisements. If Hollywood had been doing the casting, it would have added several inches to his height, or, failing that, slimmed him down and broadened his shoulders. The Army, all things considered, prefers its generals to be tall, believing that helps command function, that taller is always better, but failing that, its generals should at least be feisty little gamecocks, out to even the score with all those bigger, taller men who had once made the mistake of lording it over them. In full battle rig, Walker looked nothing like a commander, more like someone just pulled from civilian life and destined to be the company misfit. What made his way even more difficult was that he was terrible with the press, distrusting and wary, even with reporters who rather liked him and sensed that he was operating in unusually difficult circumstances. On occasion, with a journalist he trusted, like Frank Gibney of Time, Walker would talk about how hard it was, about the poor quality of his troops, what they're giving me to fight. The rest of the time he kept his anger and his frustrations buttoned up. He had complete control of his ego, which his son, Sam Wilson Walker, who was awarded a silver star in Korea as a young officer, once noted was a damn good thing, because he served under two of the greatest egomaniacs the American Army ever produced, George Patton and Douglas MacArthur. He accepted the hand he was dealt, the battlefield as it was. He did not complain. In World War II, he had been first a division and then a corps commander in the Third Army under Patton. Georgie, in Walker's letters home to his wife, the only time he dared be sardonic about his famed superior. In fact, the job as a senior commander under Patton was the one Eisenhower had originally wanted. But when Eisenhower talented, gifted, charming, was pulled into the world of planning under Marshall, Walker had gotten the prized armored assignment. He had been a great Patton favorite, in no small part because of his aggressiveness. Of all the corps I have commanded, yours has always been the most eager to attack. Patton, who was never known to be excessive with compliments, once wrote Walker, he had been fearless and relentless in command, his tactics as audacious as those of his superior, but he cut no wide swath, nor did he try to create a cult of his own. He was smart enough to know that there was room for only one superstar in the world of George Smith Patton, Jr. 
when members of the press showed up looking to lionize him just a little as Patton's Patton, he invariably blew them off. Nonetheless, Eisenhower had rated him almost on a level with Matt Ridgway and lightning Joe Collins in the war, and when it ended, he was in line to get a major command in the Pacific. He had no illusions about himself. He was a good soldier who did his job, and he had excelled under a truly gifted superior. The Korean Post had originally been ticketed for John Hodge, but he had offended Syngman Rhee and other Koreans with his almost unique insensitivity to their condition and the Japanese occupation. Instead, Walker had arrived in Tokyo as 8th Army Commander in September 1948. Even before the Korean War began, he existed in Tokyo on a kind of sufferance. Because MacArthur and his top people considered the generals who had commanded in Europe, who had gotten the men and materiel they believed should have been ticketed for the Pacific, enemies, Walker had arrived with several invisible marks against him among the Bataan gang. First off, he was not a MacArthur man. Then he had fought in the wrong theater. Then he had the wrong friends, Marshall as a sponsor, Giraud and Eisenhower as pals. He had been one of the few military men invited to the wedding of Eisenhower's son, John, in 1947. In Tokyo, he never fit in and was never accepted. The old-timers in the inner circle knew that they need not take him seriously. This was especially true of MacArthur's new chief of staff, Major General Edward Almond, for whom World War II had been a distinct disappointment, and for whom this was undoubtedly the last major assignment. Almond was to be a major player in the Korean War, and his singularly unfortunate rivalry with Walker left an indelible stamp on what happened there. He, too, had not been a MacArthur man. If anything, he had been closer to Marshall, and late in his career he was trying to prove to the Pacific commander and the men around him that he was the ultimate MacArthur loyalist, like a convert to the Catholic Church, trying to show that he was more Catholic than the Pope. Almond was every bit as driven as Walker and far more of a gamesman. In addition, he was trying to make up for lost time. He had had, in the way military men talked about these things, a bad war in Europe. For in World War II he had commanded the 92nd Division, an all-black unit in a still segregated army, all of whose officers were white Southerners, because they were believed to know how to, as the Southern saying went, handle black. That had turned out to be one of the last great military manifestations of an archaic, feudal relationship in what was supposed to be a modern, egalitarian, democratic institution. Eleanor Roosevelt's running riflemen, the men of his division had been called sardonically in the army, after the then first lady who had a special interest in their welfare and performance— Treated as second-class citizens, more often than not by officers whom they saw as the bane of their existence back home, they had often performed as second-class soldiers. Almond, a Southerner born in December 1892, with all the traditional prejudices of both the region and the era, had ended the war even more racist than when he started. His command in Korea would later be marked by all kinds of gratuitous instances of racism on his personal part, as if he were some kind of political dinosaur in an army otherwise just beginning to integrate. Before World War II had started, he had ironically enough been a Marshall shortlist man, and the command of the 92nd had been a reflection of Marshall's faith in him that if anyone could take such a difficult assignment and make it work, it would be Ned Almond. He had started the war as a peer, at least in his own mind, of men like Bradley, Collins, Patton, and Ridgway, and felt quite bitter about his fate when the war was over, that he had been sabotaged by the luck of the draw. His ego had always been enormous, right up there, friends thought, with that of Patton. In truth, he had never really thought anyone else was a better commander. 
to believe that you are among the best of the best, and then have such a troubled command at so critical a professional moment, was a profound disappointment, and he was sure he had been cheated. Whatever happened in Tokyo or Korea, he once told MacArthur, would never bother him because he had already dealt with the worst situation that any commander in the army had ever had. He had commanded the 92nd Division. Supremely ambitious men in the army, graduates of West Point, or in Amund's case, VMI, are always measuring themselves against their contemporaries. Who gets to be bird colonel first? Who gets a battalion first? Who gets a star first? And, of course, who gets a division first? The others, his peers, had come of age in that epic war, gotten the great commands, performed as everyone expected, and become part of the collective memory of the nation's proud victory, while he had commanded troops who were part of a social experiment, one that had failed badly, and he was embittered by it. He did not see himself sharing any blame with his troops. In his mind, the fault was completely theirs. Almond was stoic, overly self-confident, absolutely fearless, a man who on occasion seemed to dare death to strike him, and in fact some of the men who served under him in Korea thought he had a death wish. There was, his friends believed, a certain deeply tragic quality to him by the time he arrived in the Tokyo headquarters. It was not just that his great hopes to be an important commander in World War II had crashed because of the nature of the command he had been given. It was something much more cruel that he sealed away deep inside himself. For in personal terms, he had paid a terrible price during World War II. There had been one horrendous day in 1944 when he learned in a letter from his wife that he had lost both his son and his son-in-law in combat. Young Ned, class of 43 at West Point, had been killed with the 45th Division in the Po Valley in Italy, and Thomas Galloway, class of 42 at West Point, a fighter pilot married to Almond's only daughter, had been missing over Normandy during the invasion and the letter represented the confirmation of his death. The news was especially hard for Almond because he had always pushed his son so hard, first to go to West Point and then to go into the infantry. When young Ned had arrived in the combat zone, Almond had written his son's commander saying, Don't make him a staff officer. Give him a rifle company. The night the letter had arrived, Bill McCaffrey, one of Almond's top staff officers, had asked if he wanted a sedative. McCaffrey had dealt with a situation like this once before, when Townsend Crittenberger, the son of McCaffrey's corps commander, Lieutenant General Willis Crittenberger, had been killed during the Rhine crossing. Crittenberger had closed himself off in his room for two days and let his subordinates run the unit. Perhaps, McCaffrey thought, Ned Almond would need some comparable break and perhaps something to help him sleep. No. No sedative, Almond had answered. And Bill? I'll command the division tomorrow. Under no circumstances was McCaffrey to tell Corps what had happened. He wanted no one monkeying with his division and no sympathy for himself. Ned Almond had ended that war as a two-star, when most of the men he thought of as peers had three or four stars. Yet even then, at the lowest point in his career, no one dealing with Almond would underestimate him. He was, like it or not, a force. Everything he did had to be done quickly and perfectly. For the men working under him, there was always one more order to obey, one more squad to be moved, and one more piece of paper to be typed, and typed perfectly, or it would have to be done again. Each soldier in each distant squad had to be perfectly placed, and each commander had to know every soldier's name, no matter how newly arrived the G.I. might be. Yet in 1945, that kind of drive and ambition had seemed almost pointless. The war was over, the army shrinking. Commands were few, and if an enemy aggressor threatened America, there was always the atomic bomb. 
What need was there for a used two-star who had already had his great chance? Though he was a man of Europe, in 1946 he had asked for an assignment to MacArthur's headquarters. The alternative was to serve as military attaché in Moscow, which held little attraction for him. The slot in Tokyo was as the G-1, or personnel chief, not normally a springboard to power, but in that pathetically weak headquarters he proved a standout from the moment he arrived, a man of unusual competence in a staff of second-rate hacks. It did not take long for MacArthur to understand that Almond, Europe or no, Marshall man or no, was more effective than anyone else around and also that he hungered for one last career boost. Almond was his for the taking, MacArthur realized, someone who could, even without baton, become a MacArthur man. In early 1949, when MacArthur's chief of staff, Paul Mueller, was rotated home, Almond, who had already made himself incalculably valuable to his commander, got the job. A combat command it was not, but perhaps one day that too would come. The real job of the chief of staff in the army is often to be the commander's son of a bitch. Everyone should go away feeling that the commander was a good guy who would make fair and favorable decisions on matters both large and infinitesimally small, if only he could be reached. Thus, a great chief of staff was there to say no to all the requests demanding things that MacArthur did not want to do or deal with, and make everyone feel that the more benign MacArthur would have approved them if only they could have gotten past the evil Almond. Almond was to be an important player in the months to come. The politics of command were very important as the war effort and the strategy unfolded, not just Tokyo against Washington, but the ferocious politics within the Tokyo command itself, the constant struggle to be the favored aide. And Amon turned out to be a vastly superior player of headquarters politics than Walton Walker was. In a way, the constant struggle between him and Walker was a miniature of a larger struggle that was always taking place, the United States Army against Douglas MacArthur's army. Of Almond's many nicknames, the Big A, Ned the Dread, probably the most important among high-level officers in Tokyo was that of Ned the Anointed, which meant that MacArthur's arm was always on his shoulder, and he was the commander's principal man, never to be challenged, as he never challenged his superior. It was assumed that he always spoke for MacArthur, or at least spoke for him often enough that you did not want to be the one who discovered when he wasn't speaking for him. Almond in time became MacArthur's MacArthur, the man who took MacArthur's vision of what was supposed to happen and brought it directly to Korea, where he employed it, whether it fitted the Korean reality or not. Almond was much shrewder and infinitely more political than Walton Walker. Walker was a representative of one American army, commanded by Omar Bradley back in Washington, and Almond had in his time in Tokyo quite deftly become the number two figure in the other American army, the more or less autonomous one commanded by Douglas MacArthur. He understood from the start that, given the lack of talent among his senior staff, viewed as a bunch of Humpty Dumpties by the rest of the army, MacArthur needed at least one high-level professional to make the headquarters work. The headquarters was a hothouse of political cronyism and sycophancy, at the center of which was the general himself. Some relatively senior staff members literally used the phrase, close to the throne, to designate one's standing with the general. Within a year of his arrival in Tokyo, Almond was the man closest to the throne. Almond was smart enough never to get caught up in any of the many cliques or to take one side against the other. Most important of all, he realized that a genuine connection to MacArthur could only be attained through complete devotion, loyalty, and obedience. MacArthur's enemies had to become his own enemies. Nothing could be held back. Nothing. 
and every move had to be the right one. No doubt of his about MacArthur's greatness could ever be revealed. He had to be a more perfect extension of MacArthur than MacArthur himself. He was ready for the test. He had, wrote J.D. Coleman, an officer and a historian who had served under him, an instinctive knack of ingratiation. By that, Coleman meant that in addition to playing back to his superior what his superior wanted to hear, he had a brilliant ability to anticipate what MacArthur wanted even before the general himself knew that he wanted it. One of the things that Bill McCaffrey had liked about Amund in his earlier incarnation was his irreverence, but he shed that with MacArthur. Once during World War II, he had been so blunt speaking with Willis Crittenberger, their corps commander, over the phone that McCaffrey had become fearful for his fate. McCaffrey had virtually grabbed the phone away from Almond because you simply could not speak to a superior that way. But this, McCaffrey thought, was a new Almond, a man who had fallen in love with his commander. If anything bothered some of those who served under him in Tokyo and later Korea, it was his total subservience to MacArthur, along with his gamesmanship, his cool condescension to his peers, and his harshness to those under him, except for a handful of special favorites, his boys as he was now MacArthur's boy. Even some of those boys and no one benefited more from his friendship than Jack Childs, who went from S-3 to regimental commander under him, knew how difficult and explosive he was. He could precipitate a crisis on a desert island with no one else around, Childs once said. Few neutral observers were fond of him. He was mean and vindictive and not very talented, one of the biggest sons of bitches I've ever met, in uniform or out, said Keyes Beach, who won the Pulitzer Prize for his Korean War reporting and was a reporter who generally liked military men. The problem with playing to MacArthur was that it was all or nothing, and you had to play to his entire team. Soon enough, Amon found himself swallowing some of his old opinions simply in order to accommodate the Bataan Gang. In the years before World War II, he had often complained to McCaffrey about an officer working as an attaché in Latin America named Charles Willoughby, whom he had quickly come to despise. A pompous, self-important fool, he had often said, always wrong on everything he reported, a judgment shared by many other professional officers. Now, overnight, Amund started defending Willoughby to others as brilliant. McCaffrey watched this rehabilitation process and just shook his head. Knowing Walker's vulnerability, Amund set out to diminish his influence further in Tokyo. Although Amund was a mere two-star, he was deft at implying to Walker, a three-star, that he was a de facto five-star, speaking for MacArthur and not for himself, in effect, wearing MacArthur's stars. The phone would ring in Walker's headquarters, and it would be Almond talking in a peremptory way. Walker did his best to hold his turf and occasionally would say, Is this Almond speaking, or Almond speaking for MacArthur? But it was a losing struggle. Walker had very little time on his own with MacArthur. He always had to go through Almond. Walker was aware that none of this would be happening without MacArthur's essential approval, and so he bore his frustrations as best he could. He never challenged Amund, never demanded a better hearing for his ideas, and never complained through back-channel sources to friends in Washington about the difficulty of his situation. Every day, in all kinds of ways, Walker's aide, Joe Tyner, believed, Ned Almond worked to make Walton Walker's life a kind of hell. Mostly he took it, but there were the rare occasions when Walker's anger at his treatment came through. Tyner remembered one occasion when Walker simply blew up. It was a year before the war started. There had been a dinner party at Almond's house. Just before dinner, Walker took a quick glance at the table and discovered that there was a snub built into the way the seating was done. Military protocol dictated that Walker be seated at the place of honor. 
Instead, Almond had given it to Lord Alvary Gascoigne, the British ambassador to Japan and a man MacArthur seemed to like. Walker had quickly grabbed Tyner. Get the car, he said. We're getting out of here. Tyner, realizing why his general was so angry and seeing the potential for a serious breach that could not be healed quickly, bought some time. General, I've already released the driver, he replied. Then he quickly found one of Almond's aides. He explained the problem with the seating and informed him that his general, a very angry general, was about to leave. The seating was immediately redone, and Walker stayed. He had won a tiny battle, albeit in a losing war. So it was that in those days, as America raced to build up its forces back home, Walker commanded an understrength army that was trying against great odds to slow down a formidable enemy force. As July turned into August, the battlefield began to change, to become one that favored Walker. The Inmingun were driving the Americans and their South Korean allies into a tiny corner of the country where, with a great deal less terrain to defend, their lines of communication and supply finally started to stabilize. The North Koreans were giving Walker, by dint of their victories, an ever more compact battlefield where he could more readily summon his strengths and exploit his superior military intelligence and American firepower. At the same time, the North Korean lines of communication and supply, hopelessly extended, were increasingly vulnerable to air attack, even as the Americans were pouring more aircraft into the battle. The relentless pounding from American air power was already taking its toll. Captured communist soldiers told of mounting shortages of equipment, ammunition and medical supplies, and experienced troops. Green troops were filling the slots not long ago held by veterans in some elite North Korean units. Day by day, there were still communist advances, but each victorious moment seemed increasingly pyrrhic in nature. More elite American and some other UN troops were now also on their way to what was known as the Pusan Perimeter. For the first time, if American troops stood and fought, they would know which units were on their flanks. The real battle, Johnny Walker was telling his commanders and his troops in those dark days, was one of trading distance for time, hoping to slow down the Inmingun until more American and Allied troops could arrive. The only question was, could his shaky, Understrength, exhausted forces hold out long enough on this new, shorter battlefield for fresher American troops from elite units to arrive, and until, though he did not talk about it, MacArthur made his daring strike, his great gamble at Inshan now scheduled for September 15th. In late July, as the last of his units crossed the Nakdong River and began to develop positions there, Walker told some of them, there will be no more retreating, withdrawal, or readjustment of the lines, or whatever you call it. There are no lines behind which we can retreat. There is not going to be a Dunkirk or Bataan. A retreat to the port of Pusan would be one of the greatest butcheries in history. We must fight to the end. We must fight as a team. If some of us die, we will die fighting together. Walker himself had been against Inshan as a landing spot. He thought it was too large a gamble and drained too many troops from his understrength defenders. His opposition in some ways sealed his fate with his superior. To be openly against Inshan was to be seen as disloyal to MacArthur and added to the latter's contempt for Walker. As much as anything else, it was the numbers that bothered Walker. For six crucial weeks, the mission might deprive his already depleted forces, trying desperately not to be driven off the peninsula, of two valuable American divisions, plus much of that supporting air and naval power. Unfortunately for Walker, Inchon was not merely a plan for a breathtaking amphibious landing. It was a test of faith and loyalty, which everyone who served under MacArthur had to take. 
there was no middle ground. Walker's position. He favored an amphibious landing at a spot not so far up the Korean shore was not good enough. His descent strengthened Ned Almond's position. Almond became the driving force within the command, organizing the planning for Incheon, fighting off when need be the Navy's senior commanders, including men expert on amphibious landings who had their own considerable doubts about such a dangerous landing in so spectacularly difficult a location. Few men pass a loyalty test with such flying colors as Almond did then with MacArthur or fail it as completely as Walton Walker did. With Inshan, Almond became ever closer to MacArthur, and would, in fact, to the surprise and anger of the Joint Chiefs, be handed something almost unheard of in the Army, command of the Inshan Amphibious Force, which allowed him to wear two hats, commander of Tenth Corps, the landing force at Inshan, and chief of staff of the Far East Command. Walker, the man whose command had just been split and a large slice of it given over to a sworn adversary, knew that in some way he had failed in his commander's eyes. I'm just a defeated Confederate general, he said. While the Inshan planning went on feverishly in Tokyo, the Pusan perimeter battlefield was turning out to be one of the bloodiest of this or any other war fought by Americans. It would rank right up there with the worst of Civil War battles and some of the terrible island-hopping campaigns in the Pacific. The pressure for victory was mounting on both sides as August began. The Americans rushed fresh forces to the contested, shrinking battlefield, and the North Koreans, aware that they had not, as Kim Il-sung had promised Stalin, gone all the way to Pusan in three weeks, felt the pressure to gain their final victory before the American build-up could take full effect. The American entry into the war had caught Kim by surprise, yet he still continued to overestimate the abilities of his own troops and underestimate the advantage superior weaponry would sooner or later give the Americans, and the hardships it would inflict on his troops. The battle slogans issued by the North Korean leadership to its commanders in the field reflected Kim's view that the war had reached a critical point. Solve the problem before August, and August is the month of victory, became the newest political slogans, and reflected a growing fear that the war might turn into a stalemate or a defeat. But Kim still remained optimistic. His Chinese peers, however, were far more worried. In their eyes, the Inmingun's drive south had, in the end, failed, and the tide of battle was about to turn. Kim was still talking victory, while the Chinese were increasingly sure that he had already been defeated. They were far more sophisticated about things like this and had been skeptical of Kim's leadership from the start. In their mind, not only had the North Korean drive already been stopped, but the Americans were growing stronger, rushing more and better troops into the country along with more equipment. They were about to take the offensive. If that happened, and they were sure it would, then it would involve them in some way. Part 4 the Politics of Two Continents Chapter 12 Even before the Korean War began, the Truman administration had been operating in something of a crisis mode over two main issues. The first, and less politically explosive, was what a considerable number of the administration's senior officials believed was a seriously inadequate defense budget, a feeling that America's recently inherited global responsibilities were far greater than the country's willingness to pay for them, and that there was a need to double that budget, at a minimum, and quite possibly triple it. So far, the president, a fiscal conservative, had stood against those increases. The other, far more volatile issue was the rapid deterioration of the bipartisan wartime political alliance, along with the decline of Jiang's China and, in time, the question of whether someone, 
in the phrase then being used, had managed to lose China, if a nation can be lost. The issue of China, whether the Democrats had lost it, would hang over not merely the Truman administration, but the Democratic Party for the next two political generations. It was one of the enduring myths of American politics in the 1950s and 1960s that politics stopped at the water's edge, as if the foreign policy of the United States were some kind of sacrosanct area, separated from and placed above the normal meanness and conflicting interests of domestic constituencies